Introductory Chapter to Democracy in America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Introductory Chapter. Amongst the novel objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, nothing struck me more forcibly than the general equality of conditions. I readily discovered the prodigious influence which this primary fact exercises on the whole course of society, by giving a certain direction to public opinion, and a certain tenor to the laws, by imparting new maxims to the governing powers, and peculiar habits to the governed. I speedily perceived that the influence of this fact extends far beyond the political character and the laws of the country, and that it has no less empire over civil society than over the government. It creates opinions, engenders sentiments, suggests the ordinary practices of life, and modifies whatever it does not produce. The more I advanced in the study of American society, the more I perceived that the equality of conditions is the fundamental fact from which all others seem to be derived, and the central point at which all my observations constantly terminated. I then turned my thoughts to our own hemisphere, where I imagined that I discerned something analogous to the spectacle which the new world presented to me. I observed that the equality of conditions is daily progressing towards those extreme limits which it seems to have reached in the United States, and that the democracy which governs the American communities appears to be rapidly rising into power in Europe. I hence conceived the idea of the book which is now before the reader. It is evident to all alike that the great democratic revolution is going on amongst us, but there are two opinions as to its nature and consequences. To some it appears to be a novel accident, which as such may still be checked. To others it seems irresistible, because it is the most uniform, the most ancient, and the most permanent tendency which is to be found in history. Let us recollect the situation of France seven hundred years ago, when the territory was divided amongst a small number of families, who were the owners of the soil and the rulers of the inhabitants. The right of governing descended with the family inheritance from generation to generation. Force was the only means by which men could act on men, and landed property was the sole source of power. Soon, however, the political power of the clergy was founded, and began to exert itself. The clergy opened its ranks to all classes, to the poor and the rich, the villain and the lord. Equality penetrated into the government through the church, and the being who as a serf must have vegetated in perpetual bondage took his place as a priest in the midst of nobles, and not infrequently above the heads of kings. The different relations of men became more complicated and more numerous as society gradually became more stable and more civilized. Thence the want of civil laws was felt, and the order of legal functionaries soon rose from the obscurity of the tribunals and their dusty chambers to appear at the court of the monarch, by the side of the feudal barons in their ermine and their mail. Whilst the kings were ruining themselves by their great enterprises, and the nobles exhausting their resources by private wars, the lower orders were enriching themselves by commerce. The influence of money began to be perceptible in state affairs. The transactions of business opened a new road to power, and the financier rose to a station of political influence in which he was at once flattered and despised. Gradually the spread of mental acquirements, and the increasing taste for literature and art opened chances of success to talent. Science became a means of government, intelligence led to social power, and the man of letters took a part in the affairs of the state. The value attached to the privileges of birth decreased in the exact proportion in which new paths were struck out to advancement. In the eleventh century, nobility was beyond all price. In the thirteenth, it might be purchased. It was conferred for the first time in 1270, and equality was thus introduced into the government by the aristocracy itself. In the course of these seven hundred years, it sometimes happened that in order to resist the authority of the crown, 
or to diminish the power of their rivals, the nobles granted a certain share of political rights to the people. Or, more frequently, the king permitted the lower orders to enjoy a degree of power with the intention of repressing the aristocracy. In France, the kings have always been the most active and the most constant of levellers. When they were strong and ambitious, they spared no pains to raise the people to the level of the nobles. When they were tempered or weak, they allowed the people to rise above themselves. Some assisted the democracy by their talents, others by their vices. Louis XI and Louis XIV reduced every rank beneath the throne to the same subjection. Louis XV descended, himself and all his court, into the dust. As soon as land was held on any other than a feudal tenure, and personal property began in its turn to confer influence and power, every improvement which was introduced in commerce or manufacture was a fresh element of the equality of conditions. Henceforward, every new discovery, every new want which it engendered, and every new desire which craved satisfaction, was a step towards the universal level. The taste for luxury, the love of war, the sway of fashion, and the most superficial as well as the deepest passions of the human heart cooperated to enrich the poor and to impoverish the rich. From the time when the exercise of the intellect became the source of strength and of wealth, it is impossible not to consider every addition to science, every fresh truth, and every new idea as a germ of power placed within the reach of the people. Poetry, eloquence, and memory, the grace of wit, the glow of imagination, the death of thought, and all the gifts which are bestowed by providence with an equal hand, turn to the advantage of the democracy, and even when they were in the possession of its adversaries, they still served its cause by throwing into relief the natural greatness of man. Its conquests spread, therefore, with those of civilization and knowledge, and literature became an arsenal where the poorest and the weakest could always find weapons to their hand. In perusing the pages of our history, we shall scarcely meet with a single great event in the lapse of seven hundred years which has not turned to the advantage of equality. The Crusades and the wars of the English decimated the nobles and divided their possessions. The erection of communities introduced an element of democratic liberty into the bosom of feudal monarchy. The invention of firearms equalized the villain and the noble on the field of battle. Printing opened the same resources to the minds of all classes. The post was organized so as to bring the same information to the door of the poor man's cottage and to the gate of the palace and Protestantism proclaimed that all men are alike able to find the road to heaven. The discovery of America offered a thousand new paths to fortune, and placed riches and power within the reach of the adventurers and the obscure. If we examine what has happened in France at intervals of fifty years, beginning with the eleventh century, we shall invariably perceive that a twofold revolution has taken place in the state of society. The noble has gone down on the social ladder, and the roturier has gone up. The one descends as the other rises. Every half-century brings them nearer to each other, and they will very shortly meet. Nor is this phenomenon at all peculiar to France. Whithersoever we turn our eyes, we shall witness the same continual revolution throughout the whole of Christendom. The various occurrences of national existence have everywhere turned to the advantage of democracy. All men have aided it by their exertions those who have intentionally labored in its cause, and those who have served it unwittingly, those who have fought for it, and those who have declared themselves its opponents, have all been driven along in the same track, have all labored to one end, some ignorantly and some unwillingly, all have been blind instruments in the hands of God. The gradual development of the equality of conditions is therefore a providential fact, and it possesses all the characteristics of a divine decree. It is universal, it is durable, it constantly eludes all human interference, and all events, as well as all men, contribute to its progress. Would it, then, be wise to imagine that a social impulse which dates from so far back can be checked by the efforts of a generation? Is it credible that the democracy which has annihilated the feudal system and vanquished kings will respect the citizen and the capitalist? 
Will it stop, now that it has grown so strong and its adversary so weak? None can say which way we are going, for all terms of comparison are wanting. The equality of conditions is more complete in the Christian countries of the present day than it has been at any time or in any part of the world, so that the extent of what already exists prevents us from foreseeing what may be yet to come. The whole book which is here offered to the public has been written under the impression of a kind of religious dread produced in the author's mind by the contemplation of so irresistible a revolution, which has advanced for centuries in spite of such amazing obstacles, and which is still proceeding in the midst of the ruins it has made. It is not necessary that God himself should speak in order to disclose to us the unquestionable signs of his will. We can discern them in the habitual course of nature, and in the invariable tendency of events. I know, without a special revelation, that the planets move in the orbits traced by the Creator's fingers. If the men of our time were led by attentive observation and by sincere reflection to acknowledge that the gradual and progressive development of social equality is at once the past and future of their history, this solitary truth would confer the sacred character of a divine decree upon the change. To attempt to check democracy would be, in that case, to resist the will of God, and the nations would then be constrained to make the best of the social lot awarded to them by providence. The Christian nations of our age seem to me to present a most alarming spectacle. The impulse which is bearing them along is so strong that it cannot be stopped, but it is not yet so rapid that it cannot be guided. Their fate is in their hands, yet a little while, and it may be so no longer. The first duty which is at this time imposed upon those who direct our affairs is to educate the democracy, to warm its faith, if that be possible, to purify its morals, to direct its energies, to substitute a knowledge of business for its inexperience, and an acquaintance with its true interests for its blind propensities, to adapt its government to time and place, and to modify it in compliance with the occurrences and the actors of the age. A new science of politics is indispensable to a new world. This, however, is what we think of least. Launched in the middle of a rapid stream, we obstinately fix our eyes on the ruins which may still be described upon the shore we have left, whilst the current sweeps us along and drives us backwards towards the gulf. In no country in Europe has the great social revolution which I have been describing made such rapid progress as in France, but it has always been borne on by chance. The heads of the state have never had any forethought for its exigencies, and its victories have been obtained without their consent or without their knowledge. The most powerful, the most intelligent, and the most moral classes of the nation have never attempted to connect themselves with it in order to guide it. The people has consequently been abandoned to its wild propensities, and it has grown up like those outcasts who receive their education in the public streets, and who are unacquainted with aught but the vices and wretchedness of society. The existence of a democracy was seemingly unknown, when on a sudden it took possession of the supreme power. Everything was then submitted to its caprices. It was worshipped as the idol of strength, until, when it was enfeebled by its own excesses, the legislator conceived the rash project of annihilating its power, instead of instructing it and correcting its vices. No attempt was made to fit it to govern, but all were bent on excluding it from the government. The consequence of this has been that the democratic revolution has been effected only in the material parts of society, without that concomitant change in laws, ideas, customs, and manners which was necessary to render such a revolution beneficial. We have gotten a democracy, but without the conditions which lessen its vices and render its natural advantages more prominent, and although we already perceive the evils it brings, we are ignorant of the benefits it may confer. While the power of the crown, supported by the aristocracy, peaceably governed the nations of Europe, society possessed, in the midst of its wretchedness, several different advantages which can now scarcely be appreciated or conceived. 
the power of a part of his subjects was an insurmountable barrier to the tyranny of the prince, and the monarch, who felt the almost divine character which he enjoyed in the eyes of the multitude, derived a motive for the just use of his power from the respect which he inspired. High as they were placed above the people, the nobles could not but take that calm and benevolent interest in its faith which the shepherd feels towards his flock. And without acknowledging the poor as their equals, they watched over the destiny of those whose welfare providence had entrusted to their care. The people, never having conceived the idea of a social condition different from its own, and entertaining no expectation of ever ranking with its chiefs, received benefits from them without discussing their rights. It grew attached to them when they were clement and just, and it submitted without resistance or civility to their exactions as to the inevitable visitations of the arm of God. Custom and the manners of the time had moreover created a species of law in the midst of violence and established certain limits to oppression. As the noble never suspected that any one would attempt to deprive him of the privileges which he believed to be legitimate, and as the serf looked upon his own inferiority as a consequence of the immutable order of nature, it is easy to imagine that a mutual exchange of goodwill took place between two classes so differently gifted by fate. Inequality and wretchedness were then to be found in society, but the souls of neither rank of men were degraded. Men are not corrupted by the exercise of power or debased by the habit of obedience, but by the exercise of a power which they believe to be illegal, and by obedience to a rule which they consider to be usurped and oppressive. On one side was wealth, strength, and leisure, accompanied by the refinements of luxury, the elegance of taste, the pleasures of wit, and the religion of art. On the other was labor and a rude ignorance. But in the midst of this coarse and ignorant multitude it was not uncommon to meet with energetic passions, generous sentiments, profound religious convictions, and independent virtues. The body of a state thus organized might boast of its stability, its power, and above all of its glory. But the scene is now changed, and gradually the two ranks mingle. The divisions which once severed mankind are lowered, property is divided, power is held in common, the light of intelligence spreads, and the capacities of all classes are equally cultivated. The state becomes democratic, and the empire of democracy is slowly and peaceably introduced into the institutions and the manners of the nation. I can conceive a society in which all men would profess an equal attachment and respect for the laws of which they are the common authors, in which the authority of the state will be respected as necessary, though not as divine, and the loyalty of the subject to its chief magistrate would not be a passion, but a quiet and rational persuasion. Every individual being in the possession of rights which he is sure to retain, a kind of manly reliance and reciprocal courtesy would arise between all classes, alike removed from pride and meanness. The people, well acquainted with its true interests, would allow that in order to profit by the advantages of society, it is necessary to satisfy its demands. In this state of things, the voluntary association of the citizens might supply the individual exertions of the nobles, and the community would be alike protected from anarchy and from repression. I admit that, in a democratic state thus constituted, society will not be stationary, but the impulses of the social body may be regulated and directed forwards. If there be less splendor than in the halls of an aristocracy, the contrast of misery will be less frequent also. The pleasures of enjoyment may be less excessive, but those of comfort will be more general. The sciences may be less perfectly cultivated, but ignorance will be less common. The impetuosity of the feelings will be repressed, and the habits of the nation softened. There will be more vices and fewer crimes. In the absence of enthusiasm and of an ardent faith, great sacrifices may be obtained from the members of a commonwealth by an appeal to their understandings and their experience. Each individual will feel the same necessity for uniting with his fellow citizens to protect his own weakness, and, as he knows that if they are to assist he must cooperate, he will readily perceive that his personal interest is identified with the interest of the community. 
the nation, taken as a whole, will be less brilliant, less glorious, and perhaps less strong, but the majority of the citizens will enjoy a greater degree of prosperity, and the people will remain quiet, not because it despairs of amelioration, but because it is conscious of the advantages of its condition. If all the consequences of this state of things were not good or useful, society would at least have appropriated all such as were useful and good, and having once and for ever renounced the social advantages of aristocracy, mankind would enter into possession of all the benefits which democracy can afford. But here it may be asked what we have adopted in the place of those institutions, those ideas, and those customs of our forefathers which we have abandoned. The spell of royalty is broken, but it has not been succeeded by the majesty of the laws. The people has learned to despise all authority, but fear now extorts a larger tribute of obedience than that which was formerly paid by reverence and by love. I perceive that we have destroyed those independent beings which were able to cope with tyranny single-handed, but it is the government that has inherited the privileges of which families corporations and individuals have been deprived. The weakness of the whole community has therefore succeeded that influence of a small body of citizens which, if it was sometimes oppressive, was often conservative. The division of property has lessened the distance which separated the rich from the poor, but it would seem that the nearer they draw to each other, the greater is their mutual hatred, and the more vehement the envy and the dread with which they resist each other's claims to power. The notion of right is alike insensible to both classes, and force affords to both the only argument for the present, and the only guarantee for the future. The poor man retains the prejudices of his forefathers without their faith, and their ignorance without their virtues. He has adopted the doctrine of self-interest as the rule of his actions, without understanding the science which controls it, and his egotism is no less blind than his devotedness was formerly. If society is tranquil, it is not because it relies upon its strength and its well-being, but because it knows its weakness and its infirmities. A single effort may cost it its life. Everybody feels the evil, but no one has courage or energy enough to seek the cure. The desires, the regret, the sorrows, and the joys of the time produce nothing that is visible or permanent, like the passions of old men which terminate in impotence. We have, then, abandoned whatever advantages the old state of things afforded, without receiving any compensation from our present condition. We have destroyed an aristocracy, and we seem inclined to survey its ruins with complacency, and to fix our abode in the midst of them. The phenomena which the intellectual world presents are not less deplorable. The democracy of France, checked in its course or abandoned to its lawless passions, has overthrown whatever crossed its path, and has shaken all that it has not destroyed. Its empire on society has not been gradually introduced or peaceably established, but it has constantly advanced in the midst of a disorder and the agitation of a conflict. In the heat of the struggle, each partisan is hurried beyond the limits of his opinions by the opinions and the excesses of his opponents, until he loses sight of the end of his exertions, and holds a language which disguises his real sentiments or secret instincts. Hence arises the strange confusion which we are witnessing. I cannot recall to my mind a passage in history more worthy of sorrow and of pity than the scenes which are happening under our eyes. It is as if the natural bond which unites the opinions of man to his tastes and his actions to his principles was now broken. The sympathy which has always been acknowledged between the feelings and the ideas of mankind appears to be dissolved, and all the laws of moral analogy to be abolished. Zealous Christians may be found amongst us whose minds are nurtured in the love and knowledge of a future life and who readily espouse the cause of human liberty as the source of all moral greatness. Christianity, which has declared that all men are equal in the sight of God, will not refuse to acknowledge that all citizens are equal in the eye of the law. But, by a singular concourse of events, religion is entangled in those institutions which democracy assails, and it is not unfrequently brought to reject the equality it loves, 
and to curse that cause of liberty as a foe which it might hallow by its alliance. By the side of these religious men I discern others whose looks are turned to the earth more than to heaven. They are the partisans of liberty, not only as the source of the noblest virtues, but more especially as the root of all solid advantages, and they sincerely desire to extend its sway, and to impart its blessings to mankind. It is natural that they should hasten to invoke the assistance of religion, for they must know that liberty cannot be established without morality, nor morality without faith. But they have seen religion in the ranks of their adversaries, and they inquire no further. Some of them attack it openly, and the remainder are afraid to defend it. In former ages, slavery has been advocated by the venal and slavish-minded, whilst the independent and the warm-hearted were struggling without hope to save the liberties of mankind. But men of high and generous characters are now to be met with, whose opinions are at variance with their inclinations, and who praise that servility which they have themselves never known. Others, on the contrary, speak in the name of liberty as if they were able to feel its sanctity and its majesty, and loudly claim for humanity those rights which they have always disowned. There are virtuous and peaceful individuals whose pure morality, quiet habits, affluence, and talents fit them to be the leaders of the surrounding population. Their love of their country is sincere, and they are prepared to make the greatest sacrifices to its welfare, but they confound the abuses of civilization with its benefits, and the idea of evil is inseparable in their minds from that of novelty. Not far from this class is another party, whose object is to materialize mankind, to hit upon what is expedient without heeding what is just, to acquire knowledge without faith, and prosperity apart from virtue. Assuming the title of the champions of modern civilization, and placing themselves in a station which they usurp with insolence, and from which they are driven by their own unworthiness. Where are we, then? The religionists are the enemies of liberty, and the friends of liberty attack religion. The high-minded and the noble advocate subjection, and the meanest and most servile minds preach independence. Honest and enlightened citizens are opposed to all progress, whilst men without patriotism and without principles are the apostles of civilization and of intelligence. Has such been the fate of the centuries which have preceded our own? And has man always inhabited a world like the present, where nothing is linked together, where virtue is without genius and genius without honor, where the love of order is confounded with a taste for oppression and the holy rights of freedom with a contempt of law, where the light thrown by conscience on human actions is dim, and where nothing seems to be any longer forbidden or allowed, honorable or shameful, false or true. I cannot, however, believe that the Creator made man to leave him in an endless struggle with the intellectual miseries which surround us. God destines a calmer and a more certain future to the communities of Europe. I am unacquainted with his designs, but I shall not cease to believe in them because I cannot fathom them, and I had rather mistrust my own capacity than his justice. There is a country in the world where the great revolution which I am speaking of seems nearly to have reached its natural limits. It has been effected with ease and simplicity. Say, rather, that this country has attained the consequences of the democratic revolution which we are undergoing without having experienced the revolution itself. The emigrants who fixed themselves on the shores of America in the beginning of the seventeenth century severed the democratic principle from all the principles which repressed it in the old communities of Europe, and transplanted it unalloyed to the new world. It has there been allowed to spread in perfect freedom, and to put forth its consequences in the laws by influencing the manners of the country. It appears to me beyond a doubt that sooner or later we shall arrive, like the Americans, at an almost complete equality of conditions. But I do not conclude from this that we shall ever be necessarily led to draw the same political consequences which the Americans have derived from a similar social organization. I am far from supposing that they have chosen the only form of government which a democracy may adopt. 
where the identity of the efficient cause of laws and manners in the two countries is sufficient to account for the immense interest we have in becoming acquainted with its effects in each of them. It is not, then, merely to satisfy a legitimate curiosity that I have examined America. My wish has been to find instruction by which we may ourselves profit. Whoever should imagine that I have intended to write a panegyric will perceive that such was not my design, nor has it been my object to advocate any form of government in particular, for I am of opinion that absolute excellence is rarely to be found in any legislation. I have not even affected to discuss whether the social revolution, which I believe to be irresistible, is advantageous or prejudicial to mankind. I have acknowledged this revolution as a fact already accomplished, or on the eve of its accomplishment, and I have selected the nation from amongst those which have undergone it, in which its development has been the most peaceful and the most complete, in order to discern its natural consequences." and, if it be possible, to distinguish the means by which it may be rendered profitable. I confess that in America I saw more than America. I sought the image of democracy itself, with its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions, in order to learn what we have to fear or to hope from its progress. In the first part of this work I have attempted to show the tendency given to the laws by the democracy of America, which is abandoned almost without restraint to its instinctive propensities, and to exhibit the course it prescribes to the government and the influence it exercises on affairs. I have sought to discover the evils and the advantages which it produces. I have examined the precautions used by the Americans to direct it, as well as those which they have not adopted, and I have undertaken to point out the causes which enable it to govern society. I do not know whether I have succeeded in making known what I saw in America, but I am certain that such has been my sincere desire, and that I have never, knowingly, moulded facts to ideas, instead of ideas to facts. Whenever a point could be established by the aid of written documents, I have had recourse to the original text, and to the most authentic and approved works. I have cited my authorities in the notes, and anyone may refer to them. Whenever an opinion, a political custom, a remark on the manners of the country was concerned, I endeavoured to consult the most enlightened man I met with. If the point in question was important or doubtful, I was not satisfied with one testimony, but I formed my opinion on the evidence of several witnesses. Here the reader must necessarily believe me upon my word. I could frequently have quoted names which are either known to him, or which deserve to be so, in proof of what I advance but I have carefully abstained from this practice. A stranger frequently hears important truths at the fireside of his host, which the latter would perhaps conceal from the ear of friendship. He consoles himself with his guest for the silence to which he is restricted, and the shortness of the traveller's stay takes away all fear of his indiscretion. I carefully noted every conversation of this nature as soon as it occurred, but these notes will never leave my writing-case." I had rather injure the success of my statements than add my name to the list of those strangers who repay the generous hospitality they have received by subsequent chagrin and annoyance. I am aware that, notwithstanding my care, nothing will be easier than to criticize this book if anyone ever chooses to criticize it. Those readers who may examine it closely will discover the fundamental idea which connects the several parts together but the diversity of the subjects I have had to treat is exceedingly great, and it will not be difficult to oppose an isolated fact to the body of facts which I quote, or an isolated idea to the body of ideas I put forth. I hope to be read in the spirit which has guided my labors, and that my book may be judged by the general impression it leaves, as I have formed my own judgment not on any single reason, but upon the mass of evidence." It must not be forgotten that the author who wishes to be understood is obliged to push all his ideas to their utmost theoretical consequences, and often to the verge of what is false or impracticable. For if it be necessary sometimes to quit the rules of logic in active life, such is not the case in discourse, and a man finds that almost as many difficulties spring from inconsistency of language as usually arise from inconsistency of conduct." I conclude by pointing out myself what many readers will consider the principal defect of the work. 
This book is written to favor no particular views, and in composing it I have entertained no designs of serving or attacking any party. I have undertaken not to see differently, but to look further than parties, and whilst they are busy for the morrow, I have turned my thoughts to the future. End of Introductory Chapter Chapter 1 of Democracy in America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Democracy in America, Volume 1 by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 1 Exterior Form of North America. Chapter Summary. North America divided into two vast regions, one inclining towards the pole, the other towards the equator. Valley of the Mississippi. Traces of the revolutions of the globe. Shore of the Atlantic Ocean where the English colonies were founded. Differences in the appearance of North and of South America at the time of their discovery. Forests of North America. Prairies. Wandering tribes of natives their outward appearance, manners, and language, traces of an unknown people. Exterior Form of North America North America presents in its external form certain general features which it is easy to discriminate at the first glance. A sort of methodical order seems to have regulated the separation of land and water, mountains and valleys. A simple but grand arrangement is discoverable amidst the confusion of objects and the prodigious variety of scenes. This continent is divided, almost equally, into two vast regions, one of which is bounded on the north by the Arctic Pole and by the two great oceans on the east and west. It stretches towards the south, forming a triangle whose irregular sides meet at length below the great lakes of Canada. The second region begins where the other terminates, and includes all the remainder of the continent. The one slopes gently towards the pole, the other towards the equator. The territory comprehended in the first region descends towards the north with so imperceptible a slope that it may almost be said to form a level plain. Within the bounds of this immense tract of country there are neither high mountains nor deep valleys. Streams meander through it irregularly. Great rivers mix their currents, separate and meet again, disperse and form vast marshes, losing all trace of their channels in the labyrinth of waters they have themselves created, and thus at length, after innumerable windings, fall into the polar seas. The great lakes which bound this first region are not walled in, like most of those in the old world, between hills and rocks. Their banks are flat, and rise but a few feet above the level of their waters, each of them thus forming a vast bowl filled to the brim. The slightest change in the structure of the globe would cause their waters to rush either towards the pole or to the tropical sea. The second region is more varied on its surface, and better suited for the habitation of man two long chains of mountains divided from one extreme to the other. The Allegheny Ridge takes the form of the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. The other is parallel with the Pacific. The space which lies between these two chains of mountains contains 1,341,649 square miles. Its surface is therefore about six times as great as that of France. This vast territory, however, forms a single valley, one side of which descends gradually from the rounded summits of the Alleghenies, while the other rises in an uninterrupted course towards the tops of the Rocky Mountains. At the bottom of the valley flows an immense river, into which the various streams issuing from the mountains fall from all parts. In memory of their native land, the French formerly called this river the St. Louis. The Indians, in their pompous language, have named it 
the father of waters, or the Mississippi. The Mississippi takes its source above the limit of the two great regions of which I have spoken, not far from the highest point of the tableland where they unite. Near the same spot rises another river, which empties itself into the polar seas. The course of the Mississippi is at first dubious. It winds several times towards the north, from whence it rose, and at length, after having been delayed in lakes and marshes, it flows slowly onwards to the south, sometimes quietly gliding along the argillaceous bed which nature has assigned to it, sometimes swollen by storms, the Mississippi waters 2,500 miles in its course. At the distance of 1,364 miles from its mouth, this river attains an average depth of 15 feet, and it is navigated by vessels of 300 tons burden for a course of nearly 500 miles. Fifty-seven large navigable rivers contribute to swell the waters of the Mississippi. Amongst others, the Missouri, which traverses a space of 2,500 miles, the Arkansas, of 1,300 miles, the Red River, 1,000 miles, four of whose courses from 800 to 1,000 miles in length, viz. the Illinois, the St. Peters, the St. Francis, and the Mongona besides a countless multitude of rivulets which unite from all parts the tributary streams. The valley which is watered by the Mississippi seems formed to be the bed of this mighty river, which, like a god of antiquity, dispenses both good and evil in its course. On the shores of the stream nature displays an inexhaustible fertility. In proportion as you recede from its banks, the powers of vegetation languish, the soil becomes poor, and the plants that survive have a sickly growth. Nowhere have the great convulsions of the globe left more evident traces than in the valley of the Mississippi. The whole aspect of the country shows the powerful effects of water, both by its fertility and by its barrenness. The waters of the primeval ocean accumulated enormous beds of vegetable mould in the valley, which they levelled as they retired. Upon the right shore of the river are seen immense plains, as smooth as if the husbandman had passed over them with his roller. As you approach the mountains, the soil becomes more and more unequal and sterile. The ground is, as it were, pierced in a thousand places by primitive rocks, which appear like the bones of a skeleton whose flesh is partly consumed. The surface of the earth is covered with a granite sand and huge, irregular masses of stone, among which a few plants force their growth, and give the appearance of a green field covered with the ruins of a vast edifice. These stones and this sand discover, on examination, a perfect analogy with those which compose the arid and broken summits of the Rocky Mountains. The flood of waters which washed the soil to the bottom of the valley afterwards carried away portions of the rocks themselves, and these, dashed and bruised against the neighboring cliffs, were left scattered like wrecks at their feet. The valley of the Mississippi is, upon the whole, the most magnificent dwelling-place prepared by God for man's abode, and yet it may be said that at present it is but a mighty desert. On the eastern side of the Alleghanies, between the base of these mountains and the Atlantic Ocean, there lies a long ridge of rocks and sand, which the sea appears to have left behind as it retired. The mean breadth of this territory does not exceed one hundred miles, but it is about 900 miles in length. This part of the American continent has a soil which offers every obstacle to the husbandman, and its vegetation is scanty and unvaried. Upon this inhospitable coast, the first united efforts of human industry were made. The tongue of arid land was the cradle of those English colonies which were destined one day to become the United States of America. The center of power still remains here, whilst in the backwoods the true elements of the great people to whom the future control of the continent belongs are gathering almost in secrecy together. 
when the Europeans first landed on the shores of the West Indies, and afterwards on the coast of South America, they thought themselves transported into those fabulous regions of which poets had sung. The sea sparkled with phosphoric light, and the extraordinary transparency of its waters discovered to the view of the navigator all that had hitherto been hidden in the deep abyss. Here and there appeared little islands perfumed with odoriferous plants, and resembling baskets of flowers floating on the tranquil surface of the ocean. Every object which met the sight in this enchanting region seemed prepared to satisfy the wants or contribute to the pleasures of man. Almost all the trees were loaded with nourishing fruits, and those which were useless as food delighted the eye by the brilliancy and variety of their colors. In groves of fragrant lemon trees, wild figs, flowering myrtles, acacias, and oleanders, which were hung with festoons of various climbing plants, covered with flowers, a multitude of birds unknown in Europe displayed their bright plumage, glittering with purple and azure, and mingled their warbling with the harmony of a world teeming with life and motion. Underneath this brilliant exterior, death was concealed, but the air of these climates had so enervating an influence that man, absorbed by present enjoyment, was rendered regardless of the future. North America appeared under a very different aspect. There everything was grave, serious, and solemn. It seemed created to be the domain of intelligence, as the south was that of sensual delight. A turbulent and foggy ocean washed its shores. It was girt round by a belt of granite rocks, or by white tracts of sand. The foliage of its woods was dark and gloomy, for they were composed of firs, larches, evergreen oaks, wild olive trees, and laurels. Beyond this outer belt lay the thick shades of the central forest, where the largest trees which are produced in the two hemispheres grow side by side. The plain, the catalpa, the sugar marple, and the Virginian poplar mingled their branches with those of the oak, the beech, and the lime. In these, as in the forests of the old world, destruction was perpetually going on. The ruins of vegetation were heaped upon each other, but there was no laboring hand to remove them, and their decay was not rapid enough to make room for the continual work of reproduction. Climbing plants, grasses, and other herbs forced their way through the mass of dying trees. They crept along their bending trunks, found nourishment in their dusty cavities, and a passage beneath the lifeless bark. Thus decay gave its assistance to life, and their respective productions were mingled together. The deaths of these forests were gloomy and obscure, and a thousand rivulets, undirected in their course by human industry, preserved in them a constant moisture. It was rare to meet with flowers, wild fruits, or birds beneath their shades. The fall of a tree overthrown by age, the rushing torrent of a cataract, the lowing of the buffalo, and the howling of the wind were the only sounds which broke the silence of nature. To the east of the great river the woods almost disappeared. In their set were seen prairies of immense extent. Whether nature in her infinite variety had denied the germs of trees to these fertile plains, or whether they had once been covered with forests, subsequently destroyed by the hand of man, is a question which neither tradition nor scientific research has been able to resolve. These immense deserts were not, however, devoid of human inhabitants. Some wandering tribes had been for ages scattered among the forest shades or the green pastures of the prairie. From the mouth of the St. Lawrence to the delta of the Mississippi, and from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, these savages possessed certain points of resemblance which bore witness of their common origin, but at the same time they differed from all other known races of men. They were neither white like the Europeans, nor yellow like most of the Asiatics, nor black like the Negroes. Their skin was reddish-brown, their hair long and shining, their lips thin, and their cheekbones very prominent. 
The languages spoken by the North American tribes are various as far as regarded their words, but they were subject to the same grammatical rules. These rules differed in several points from such as had been observed to govern the origin of language. The idiom of the Americans seemed to be the product of new combinations, and bespoke an effort of the understanding of which the Indians of our days would be incapable. The social state of these tribes differed also in many respects from all that was seen in the old world. They seemed to have multiplied freely in the midst of their deserts, without coming in contact with other races more civilized than their own. Accordingly, they exhibited none of those indistinct, incoherent notions of right and wrong, none of that deep corruption of manners which is usually joined with ignorance and rudeness among nations which, after advancing to civilization, have relapsed into a state of barbarism. The Indian was indebted to no one but himself. His virtues, his vices, and his prejudices were his own work. He had grown up in the wild independence of his nature. If, in polished countries, the lowest of the people are rude and uncivil, it is not merely because they are poor and ignorant, but that, being so, they are in daily contact with rich and enlightened men. The sight of their own hard lot and of their weakness, which is daily contrasted with the happiness and power of some of their fellow creatures, excites in their hearts at the same time the sentiments of anger and of fear. The consciousness of their inferiority and of their dependence irritates while it humiliates them. This state of mind displays itself in their manners and language. They are at once insolent and servile. The truth of this is easily proved by observation. The people are more rude in aristocratic countries than elsewhere, in opulent cities than in rural districts. In those places where the rich and powerful are assembled together, the weak and the indigent feel themselves oppressed by their inferior condition. Unable to perceive a single chance of regaining their equality, they gave up to despair and allowed themselves to fall below the dignity of human nature. This unfortunate effect of the disparity of conditions is not observable in savage life. The Indians, although they are ignorant and poor, are equal and free. At the period when Europeans first came among them, the natives of North America were ignorant of the value of riches, and indifferent to the enjoyments which civilized man procures to himself by their means. Nevertheless, there was nothing coarse in their demeanor. They practiced an habitual reserve and a kind of aristocratic politeness. Mild and hospitable when at peace, though merciless in war beyond any known degree of human ferocity, the Indian would expose himself to die of hunger in order to succor the stranger who asked admittance by night at the door of his hut. Yet he could tear in pieces with his hands the still quivering limbs of his prisoner. The famous republics of antiquity never gave examples of more unshaken courage, more haughty spirits, or more intractable love of independence than were hidden in former times among the wild forests of the New World. The Europeans produced no great impression when they landed upon the shores of North America. Their presence engendered neither envy nor fear. What influence could they possess over such men as we have described? The Indian could live without wants, suffer without complaint, and pour out his death song at the stake. Like all the other members of the great human family, these savages believed in the existence of a better world, and adored under different names God, the creator of the universe. Their notions on the great intellectual truths were in general simple and philosophical. Although we have here traced the character of a primitive people, yet it cannot be doubted that another people, more civilized and more advanced in all respects, had preceded it in the same regions. An obscure tradition which prevailed among the Indians to the north of the Atlantic informs us that these very tribes formerly dwelt on the west side of the Mississippi. Along the banks of the Ohio and throughout the Central Valley there are frequently found at this day tumuli raised by the hands of man. On exploring these heaps of earth to their center, it is usual to meet with human bones, strange instruments, arms and utensils of all kinds, 
made of metal, or destined for purposes unknown to the present race. The Indians of our time are unable to give any information relative to the history of this unknown people. Neither did those who lived three hundred years ago, when America was first discovered, leave any accounts from which even a hypothesis could be formed. Tradition, that perishable yet ever renewed monument of the pristine world, throws no light upon the subject. It is an undoubted fact, however, that in this part of the globe thousands of our fellow beings had lived. When they came hither, what was their origin, their destiny, their history, and how they perished, no one can tell. How strange does it appear that nations have existed, and afterwards so completely disappeared from the earth, that the remembrance of their very names is effaced, their languages are lost, their glory is vanished like a sound without an echo, though perhaps there is not one which has not left behind it some tomb in memory of its passage. The most durable monument of human labor is that which recalls the wretchedness and nothingness of man. Although the vast country which we have been describing was inhabited by many indigenous tribes, it may justly be said at the time of its discovery by Europeans to have formed one great desert the Indians occupied without possessing it. It is by agricultural labor that man appropriates the soil, and the early inhabitants of North America lived by the produce of the chase. Their implacable prejudices, their uncontrolled passions, their vices, and still more perhaps their savage virtues, consigned them to inevitable destruction." The ruin of these nations began from the day when Europeans landed on their shores. It has proceeded ever since, and we are now witnessing the completion of it. They seem to have been placed by Providence amidst the riches of the new world to enjoy them for a season, and then surrender them. Those coasts, so admirably adapted for commerce and industry, those wide and deep rivers, that inexhaustible valley of the Mississippi, the whole continent, in short, seemed prepared to be the abode of a great nation, yet unborn. In that land the great experiment was to be made, by civilized man, of the attempt to construct society upon a new basis, and it was there, for the first time, that theories hitherto unknown, or deemed impracticable, were to exhibit a spectacle for which the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Tiley. Democracy in America. Volume 1 by Alex de Tocqueville Translated by Henry Reeve Chapter 2 Part 1 Chapter 2 Origin of the Anglo-Americans Part 1 Chapter Summary Utility of Knowing the Origin of Nations in order to understand their social condition and their laws, America, the only country in which the starting point of a great people has been clearly observable, in what respects all who emigrated to British America were similar, in what they differed, remark applicable to all Europeans who established themselves on the shores of the New World, Colonization of Virginia, Colonization of New England, Original Character of the First Inhabitants of New England, Their Arrival, Their First Laws, Their Social Contract, Penal Code Borrowed from the Hebrew Legislation, Religious Fervor, 
republican spirit, intimate union of the spirit of religion with the spirit of liberty, origin of the Anglo-Americans and its importance in relation to their future condition. After the birth of a human being, his early years are obscurely spent in the toils or pleasures of childhood. As he grows up, the world receives him when his manhood begins, and he enters into contact with his fellows. He is then studied for the first time, and it is imagined that the germ of the vices and the virtues of his mature years is then formed. This, if I am not mistaken, is a great error. We must begin higher up. We must watch the infant in its mother's arms. We must see the first images which the external world casts upon the dark mirror of his mind. The first occurrences which he witnesses. We must hear the first words which awaken the sleeping powers of thought and stand by his earliest efforts if we would understand the prejudices, the habits, and the passions which will rule his life. The entire man is, so to speak, to be seen in the cradle of the child. The growth of nations presents something analogous to this. They all bear some marks of their origin, and the circumstances which accompanied their birth and contributed to their rise affect the whole term of their being. If we were able to go back to the elements of states, and to examine the oldest monuments of their history, I doubt not that we should discover the primal cause of the prejudices, the habits, the ruling passions, and, in short, of all that constitutes what is called the national character we should then find the explanation of certain customs which now seem at variance with the prevailing manners of such laws as conflict with established principles and of such incoherent opinions as are here and there to be met with in society like those fragments of broken chains which we sometimes see hanging from the vault of an edifice and supporting nothing this might explain the destinies of certain nations which seem borne on by an unknown force to ends of which they themselves are ignorant but hitherto facts have been wanting to researches of this kind the spirit of inquiry has only come upon communities in their latter days and when they at length contemplated their origin, time had already obscured it, or ignorance and pride adorned it with truth-concealing fables. America is the only country in which it has been possible to witness the natural and tranquil growth of society, and where the influences exercised on the future condition of states by their origin is clearly distinguishable. At the period when the peoples of Europe landed in the New World, their national characteristics were already completely formed. Each of them had a physiognomy of its own, and as they had already attained that stage of civilization at which men are led to study themselves, they have transmitted to us a faithful picture of their opinions, their manners, and their laws. The men of the 16th century are almost as well known to us as our contemporaries. America, consequently, exhibits in the broad light of day the phenomena which the ignorance or rudeness of earlier ages conceals from our researches. Near enough to the time when the states of America were founded, to be accurately acquainted with their elements, and sufficiently removed from that period to judge of some of their results, the men of our own day seem destined 
to see further than their predecessors into the series of human events. Providence has given us a torch which our forefathers did not possess, and has allowed us to discern fundamental causes in the history of the world which the obscurity of the past concealed from them. If we carefully examine the social and political state of America, after having studied its history, we shall remain perfectly convinced that not an opinion, not a custom, not a law, I may even say not an event, is upon record which the origin of that people will not explain. The readers of this book will find the germ of all that is to follow in the present chapter and the key to almost the whole work. The emigrants who came at different periods to occupy the territory now covered by the American Union differed from each other in many respects. Their aim was not the same, and they governed themselves on different principles. These men had, however, certain features in common, and they were all placed in an analogous situation. The tie of language is perhaps the strongest and the most durable that can unite mankind. All the emigrants spoke the same tongue. They were all offsets from the same people. Born in a country which had been agitated for centuries by the struggles of faction, and in which all parties had been obliged in their turn to place themselves under the protection of the laws. Their political education had been perfected in this rude school, and they were more conversant with the notions of right and the principles of true freedom than the greater part of their European contemporaries. At the period of their first emigrations, the parish system, that fruitful germ of free institutions, was deeply rooted in the habits of the English, and with it the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people had been introduced into the bosom of the monarchy of the House of Tudor. The religious quarrels which have agitated the Christian world were then rife. England had plunged into the new order of things with headlong vehemence. The character of its inhabitants, which had always been sedate and reflective, became argumentative and austere. General information had been increased by intellectual debate, and the mind had received a deeper cultivation. Whilst religion was the topic of discussion, the morals of the people were reformed. All these national features are more or less discoverable in the physiognomy of those adventurers who came to seek a new home on the opposite shores of the Atlantic. Another remark, to which we shall hereafter have occasion to recur, is applicable not only to the English, but to the French, the Spaniards, and all the Europeans who successively established themselves in the New World. All these European colonies contain the elements, if not the development, of a complete democracy. Two causes led to this result. It may safely be advanced that on leaving the mother country, the emigrants had in general no notion of superiority over one another. The happy and the powerful do not go into exile, and there are no surer guarantees of equality among men than poverty and misfortune. It happened, however, on several occasions, that persons of rank were driven to America by political and religious quarrels. Laws were made to establish a gradation of ranks, but it was too soon found that the soil of America 
was opposed to a territorial aristocracy. To bring that refractory land into cultivation, the constant and interested exertions of the owner himself were necessary, and when the ground was prepared, its produce was found to be insufficient to enrich a master and a farmer at the same time. The land was then naturally broken up into small portions which the proprietor cultivated for himself. Land is the basis of an aristocracy, which clings to the soil that supports it, for it is not by privileges alone, nor by birth, but by landed property, handed down from generation to generation, that an aristocracy is constituted. A nation may present immense fortunes and extreme wretchedness, but unless those fortunes are territorial, there is no aristocracy, but simply the class of the rich and that of the poor. All the British colonies had, then, a great degree of similarity at the epoch of their settlement. All of them, from their first beginning, seemed destined to witness the growth, not of the aristocratic liberty of their mother country, but of the freedom of the middle and lower orders, of which the history of the world had, as yet, furnished no complete example. In this general uniformity, several striking differences were, however, discernible, which it is necessary to point out. Two branches may be distinguished in the Anglo-American family, which have hitherto grown up without entirely commingling, the one in the south, the other in the north. Virginia received the first English colony. The emigrants took possession of it in 1607. The idea that mines of gold and silver are the sources of national wealth was at that time singularly prevalent in Europe. A fatal delusion, which has done more to impoverish the nations which adopted it, and has cost more lives in America than the united influence of war and bad laws. The men sent to Virginia were seekers of gold, adventurers, without resources, and without character whose turbulent and restless spirit endangered the infant colony and rendered its progress uncertain. The artisans and agriculturalists arrived afterwards, and, although they were a more moral and orderly race of men, they were in no wise above the level of the inferior classes in England. No lofty conceptions no intellectual system directed the foundation of these new settlements. The colony was scarcely established when slavery was introduced, and this was the main circumstance which has exercised so prodigious an influence on the character, the laws, and all the future prospects of the South. Slavery, as we shall afterwards show, dishonors labor, it introduces idleness into society, and with idleness, ignorance and pride, luxury and distress. It enervates the powers of the mind, and benumbs the activity of man. The influence of slavery, united to the English character, explains the manners and the social condition of the southern states. In the north, the same English foundation was modified by the most opposite shades of character, and here I may be allowed to enter into some details. The two or three main ideas which constitute the basis of the social theory of the United States were first combined in the northern English colonies 
more generally denominated the states of New England. The principles of New England spread at first to the neighboring states. They then passed successively to the more distant ones, and at length they imbued the whole confederation. They now extend their influence beyond its limits over the whole American world. The civilization of New England has been like a beacon lit upon a hill, which, after it has diffused its warmth around, tinges the distant horizon with its glow. The foundation of New England was a novel spectacle, and all the circumstances attending it were singular and original. The large majority of colonies have been first inhabited either by men without education and without resources, driven by their poverty and their misconduct from the land which gave them birth, or by speculators and adventurers greedy of gain. Some settlements cannot even boast so honorable an origin. St. Domingo was founded by buccaneers, and the criminal courts of England originally supplied the population of Australia. The settlers who established themselves on the shores of New England all belonged to the more independent classes of their native country. Their union on the soil of America at once presented the singular phenomenon of a society containing neither lords nor common people, neither rich nor poor. These men possessed, in proportion to their number, a greater mass of intelligence than is to be found in any European nation of our own time. All, without a single exception, had received a good education, and many of them were known in Europe for their talents and their acquirements. The other colonies had been founded by adventurers without family. The emigrants of New England brought with them the best elements of order and morality. They landed in the desert, accompanied by their wives and children. But what most especially distinguished them was the aim of their undertaking. They had not been obliged by necessity to leave their country. The social position they abandoned was one to be regretted, and their means of subsistence were certain. Nor did they cross the Atlantic to improve their situation or to increase their wealth. The call which summoned them from the comforts of their homes was purely intellectual, and in facing the inevitable sufferings of exile their object was the triumph of an idea. The emigrants, or as they deservedly styled themselves, the pilgrims, belonged to that English sect the austerity of whose principles had acquired for them the name of Puritans. Puritanism was not merely a religious doctrine, but it corresponded in many points with the most absolute democratic and republican theories. It was this tendency which had aroused its most dangerous adversaries. Persecuted by the government of the mother country, and disgusted by the habits of a society opposed to the rigor of their own principles, the Puritans went forth to seek some rude and unfrequented part of the world, where they could live according to their own opinions and worship God in freedom. A few quotations will throw more light upon the spirit of these pious adventurers than all we can say of them. Nathaniel Morton, the historian of the first years of the settlement, thus opens his subject. Quote, Gentle reader, I have for some length of time looked upon it as a duty incumbent, especially on the immediate successors 
of those that have had so large experience of those many memorable and signal demonstrations of God's goodness vis-à-vis -vis the first beginners of this plantation in New England to commit to writing his gracious dispensations on that behalf having so many inducements thereunto not only otherwise but so plentifully in the sacred scriptures that so what we have seen and what our fathers have told us we may not hide from our children showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord that especially the seed of Abraham his servant and the children of Jacob his chosen may remember his marvelous works in the beginning and progress of the planting of New England his wonders and the judgments of his mouth how that God brought a vine into this wilderness that he cast out the heathen and planted it that he made room for it and caused it to take deep root and filled the land and not only so but also that he hath guided his people by his strength to his holy habitation and planted them in the mountains of his inheritance in respect of precious gospel enjoyments and that as especially God may have the glory of all unto whom it is most due so also some rays of glory may reach the names of those blessed saints that were the main instruments and in the beginning of this happy enterprise End quote. It is impossible to read this opening paragraph without an involuntary feeling of religious awe. It breathes the very savor of gospel antiquity. The sincerity of the author heightens his power of language. The band, which to his eyes was a mere party of adventurers gone forth to seek their fortune beyond seas, appears to the reader as the germ of a great nation wafted by providence to a predestined shore the author thus continues his narrative of the departure of the first pilgrims begin quote, so they left that goodly and pleasant city of Leyden which had been their resting place for above eleven years but they knew that they were pilgrims and strangers here below and looked not much on these things but lifted up their eyes to heaven their dearest country where God hath prepared for them a city and therein quieted their spirits when they came to Delft's haven they found the ship and all things ready and such of their friends as could not come with them followed after them and sundry came from Amsterdam to see them ship and to take their leaves of them one night was spent with little sleep with the most but with friendly entertainment and christian discourse and other real expressions of true christian love the next day they went on board and their friends with them where truly doleful was the sight of that sad and mournful parting to hear what sighs and sobs and prayers did sound amongst them what tears did gush from every eye and pithy speeches pierced each other's hearts that sundry of the dutch strangers that stood on the quay as spectators could not refrain from tears but the tide which stays for no man calling them away that they were thus loth to depart their reverend pastor falling down on his knees, and they all with him, with watery cheeks, commenced them with most fervent prayers unto the Lord and his blessing, and then with mutual embraces and many tears they took their leaves, one of another, which proved to be the last leave to many of them. End quote. The emigrants were about 150 in number including the women and the children 
Their object was to plant a colony on the shores of the Hudson, but after having been driven about for some time in the Atlantic Ocean, they were forced to land on that arid coast of New England, which is now the town of Plymouth. The rock is still shown on which the pilgrims disembark. It must not be imagined that the piety of the Puritans was of a merely speculative kind, or that it took no cognizance of the course of worldly affairs. Puritanism, as I have already remarked, was scarcely less a political than a religious doctrine. No sooner had the emigrants landed on the barren coast described by Nathaniel Morton than it was their first care to constitute a society by passing the following act. Quote, in the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, etc., etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof do enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. End quote. This happened in 1620 and from that time forwards the emigration went on. The religious and political passions which ravaged the British Empire during the whole reign of Charles I drove fresh crowds of sectarians every year to the shores of America. In England the stronghold of Puritanism was in the middle classes, and it was from the middle classes that the majority of the emigrants came. The population of New England increased rapidly, and whilst the hierarchy of rank despotically claimed the inhabitants of the mother country, the colony continued to present the novel spectacle of a community homogeneous in all its parts, a democracy more perfect than any which antiquity had dreamt of, started in full size and panoply from the midst of an ancient feudal society. End of recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox. dot org. Recording by Jim Tiley. Democracy in America, Volume One, by Alex de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve Chapter 2, Part 2 Chapter 2 Origin of the Anglo-Americans Part 1 The English government was not dissatisfied with the emigration which removed the elements of fresh discord and of further revolutions. On the contrary, everything was done to encourage it and great exertions were made 
to mitigate the hardships of those who sought a shelter from the rigor of their country's laws on the soil of America. It seemed as if New England was a region given up to the dreams of fancy and the unrestrained experiments of innovators. The English colonies, begin parentheses, and this is one of the main causes of their prosperity, end parentheses, have always enjoyed more internal freedom and more political independence than the colonies of other nations. But this principle of liberty was nowhere more extensively applied than in the states of New England. It was generally allowed at that period that the territories of the New World belonged to that European nation which had been the first to discover them. Nearly the whole coast of North America thus became a British possession towards the end of the 16th century. The means used by the English government to people these new domains were of several kinds. The king sometimes appointed a governor of his own choice, who ruled a portion of the New World in the name and under the immediate orders of the crown. This is the colonial system adopted by other countries of Europe. Sometimes grants of certain tracts were made by the crown to an individual or to a company, in which case all the civil and political power fell into the hands of one or more persons who, under the inspection and control of the crown, sold the lands and governed the inhabitants. Lastly, a third system consisted in allowing a certain number of emigrants to constitute a political society under the protection of the mother country and to govern themselves in whatever was not contrary to her laws. This mode of colonization, so remarkably favorable to liberty, was only adopted in New England. In 1628, a charter of this kind was granted by Charles I to the emigrants who went to form the colony of Massachusetts. But, in general, charters were not given to the colonies of New England till they had acquired a certain existence. Plymouth, Providence, New Haven, the state of Connecticut, and that of Rhode Island, were founded without the cooperation and almost without the knowledge of the mother country. The new settlers did not derive their incorporation from the seat of the empire, although they did not deny its supremacy. They constituted a society of their own accord, and it was not till thirty or forty years afterwards, under Charles the Second, that their existence was legally recognized by a royal charter. This frequently renders it difficult to detect the link which connected the emigrants with the land of their forefathers in studying the earliest historical and legislative records of New England. They exercised the rights of sovereignty, they named their magistrates, concluded peace or declared war, made police regulations, and enacted laws as if their allegiance was due only to God. Nothing can be more curious and, at the same time, more instructive than the legislation of that period. It is there that the solution of the great social problem which the United States now present to the world is to be found. Amongst these documents, we shall notice, as especially characteristic, the code of laws promulgated by the little state of Connecticut in 1650. The legislators of Connecticut begin with the penal laws, and, strange to say, they borrow their provisions from the text of Holy Writ. Quote, Whosoever shall worship any other god than the Lord, end quote, says the preamble of the code, quote, shall surely be put to death, end quote. 
This is followed by ten or twelve enactments of the same kind, copied verbatim from the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Blasphemy, sorcery, adultery, and rape were punished with death. An outrage offered by a son to his parents was to be expiated by the same penalty. The legislation of a rude and half-civilized people was thus applied to an enlightened and moral community. The consequence was that the punishment of death was never more frequently prescribed by the statute, and never more rarely enforced towards the guilty. The chief care of the legislators in this body of penal laws was the maintenance of orderly conduct and good morals in the community. They constantly invaded the domain of conscience, and there was scarcely a sin which was not subject to magisterial censure. The reader is aware of the rigor with which these laws punished rape and adultery. Intercourse between unmarried persons was likewise severely repressed. The judge was empowered to inflict a pecuniary penalty, a whipping, or marriage, on the misdemeanants, and if the records of the old courts of New Haven may be believed, prosecutions of this kind were not unfrequent. We find a sentence bearing the date 1st of May, 1660, inflicting a fine and reprimand on a young woman who was accused of using improper language and of allowing herself to be kissed. The Code of 1650 abounds in preventive measures. It punishes idleness and drunkenness with severity. Innkeepers are forbidden to furnish more than a certain quantity of liquor to each consumer, and simple lying, whenever it may be injurious, is checked by a fine or a flogging. In other places, the legislator, entirely forgetting the great principles of religious toleration which he had himself upheld in Europe, renders attendance on divine service compulsory, and goes so far as to visit with severe punishment, and even with death, the Christians who chose to worship God according to a ritual differing from his own. Sometimes, indeed, the zeal of his enactments induces him to descend to the most frivolous particulars. Thus, a law is to be found in the same code which prohibits the use of tobacco. It must not be forgotten that these fantastical and vexatious laws were not imposed by authority, but that they were freely voted by all the persons interested, and that the manners of the community were even more austere and more puritanical than the laws. In 1649, a solemn association was formed in Boston to check the worldly luxury of long hair. These errors are no doubt discreditable to human reason. They attest the inferiority of our nature, which is incapable of laying firm hold upon what is true and just, and is often reduced to the alternative of two excesses. In strict connection with this penal legislation, which bears such striking marks of a narrow sectarian spirit, and of those religious passions which had been warmed by persecution and were still fermenting among the people. A body of political laws is to be found, which, though written two hundred years ago, is still ahead of the liberties of our age. 
The general principles, which are the groundwork of modern constitutions, principles which were imperfectly known in Europe, and not completely triumphant even in Great Britain in the seventeenth century, were all recognized and determined by the laws of New England. The intervention of the people in public affairs, the free voting of taxes, the responsibility of authorities, personal liberty, and trial by jury, were all positively established without discussion. From these fruitful principles, consequences have been derived, and applications have been made, such as no nation in Europe has yet ventured to attempt. In Connecticut, the electoral body consisted, from its origin, of the whole number of citizens, and this is readily to be understood when we recollect that this people enjoyed an almost perfect equality of fortune, and a still greater uniformity of opinions. In Connecticut, at this period, all the executive functionaries were elected, including the governor of the state. The citizens above the age of sixteen were obliged to bear arms. They formed a national militia, which appointed its own officers, and was to hold itself at all times in readiness to march for the defense of the country. In the laws of Connecticut, as well in all of those of New England, we find the germ and gradual development of that township independence which is the life and mainspring of American liberty at the present day. The political existence of the majority of the nations of Europe commenced in the superior ranks of society and was gradually and imperfectly communicated to the different members of the social body. In America, on the other hand, it may be said that the township was organized before the county, the county before the state, the state before the union. In New England, townships were completely and definitively constituted as early as 1650. The independence of the township was the nucleus round which the local interests, passions, rights, and duties collected and clung. It gave scope to the activity of a real political life most thoroughly democratic and republican. The colonies still recognized the supremacy of the mother country. Monarchy was still the law of the state, but the republic was already established in every township. The towns named their own magistrates of every kind, raided themselves, and levied their own taxes. In the parish of New England, the law of representation was not adopted, but the affairs of the community were discussed, as at Athens, in the marketplace, by a general assembly of the citizens. In studying the laws which were promulgated at this first era of the American republics, it is impossible not to be struck by the remarkable acquaintance with which the science of government and the advanced theory of legislation which they display. The ideas there formed of the duties of society towards its members are evidently much loftier and more comprehensive than those of the European legislators at that time. Obligations were there imposed, which were elsewhere slighted. In the states of New England, from the first, the condition of the poor was provided for. Strict measures were taken 
for the maintenance of roads, and surveyors were appointed to attend to them. Registers were established in every parish, in which the results of public deliberations and the births, deaths, and marriages of the citizens were entered. Clerks were directed to keep these registers. Officers were charged with the administration of vacant inheritances and with the arbitration of litigated landmarks, and many others were created whose chief functions were the maintenance of public order in the community. The law enters into a thousand useful provisions for a number of social wants which are at present very inadequately felt in France. But it is by the attention it pays to public education that the original character of American civilization is at once placed in the clearest light. Quote, it being, end quote, says the law, quote, one chief project of Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scripture by persuading from the use of tongues to the end that learning may not be buried in the graves of our forefathers in church and commonwealth the Lord assisting our endeavors. End quote. Here follow clauses establishing schools in every township and obliging the inhabitants, under pain of heavy fines, to support them. Schools of a superior kind were founded in the same manner in the more populous districts. The municipal authorities were bound to enforce the sending of children to school by their parents. They were empowered to inflict fines upon all who refused compliance, and in case of continued resistance, society assumed the place of the parent, took possession of the child, and deprived the father of those natural rights which he used to so bad a purpose. The reader will undoubtedly have remarked the preamble of these enactments. In America, religion is the road to knowledge and the observance of the divine laws leads man to civil freedom. If, after having cast a rapid glance over the state of American society in 1650, we turn to the condition of Europe, and more especially to that of the continent, at the same period, we cannot fail to be struck with astonishment on the continent of Europe, at the beginning of the 17th century, absolute monarchy had everywhere triumphed over the ruins of the oligarchical and feudal liberties of the Middle Ages. Never were the notions of right more completely confounded than in the midst of the splendor and literature of Europe. Never was there less political activity among the people. Never were the principles of true freedom less widely circulated. And at that very time, those principles, which were scorned or unknown by the nations of Europe, were proclaimed in the deserts of the New World, and were accepted as the future creed of a great people. The boldest theories of the human reason were put into practice by a community so humble that not a statesman condescended to attend it, and a legislation without a precedent was produced offhand by the imagination of the citizens. In the bosom of this obscure democracy, which had as yet brought forth neither generals, nor philosophers, nor authors. A man might stand up in the face of a free people and pronounce the following fine definition of liberty. 
quote, nor would I have you to mistake in the point of your own liberty. There is a liberty of a corrupt nature, which is effected both by men and beasts to do what they list, and this liberty is inconsistent with authority, impatient of all restraint. By this liberty, quote, sumus omnis deterioris, end quote, Quote, "'Tis the grand enemy of truth and peace, and all the ordinances of God are bent against it. But there is a civil, a moral, a federal liberty, which is the proper end and object of authority. It is a liberty for that only which is just and good. For this liberty you are to stand with the hazard of your very lives, and whatsoever crosses it is not authority, but a distemper thereof. This liberty is maintained in a way of subjection to authority, and the authority set over you will, in all administrations for your good, be quietly submitted unto by all, but such as have a disposition to shake off the yoke and lose their true liberty by their murmuring at the honor and power of authority. End quote. The remarks I have made will suffice to display the character of Anglo-American civilization in its true light. It is the result, begin parentheses, and this should be constantly present to the mind of two distinct elements, in parentheses, which in other places have been in frequent hostility, but which in America have been admirably incorporated and combined with one another. I allude to the spirit of religion and the spirit of liberty. The settlers of New England were at the same time ardent sectarians and daring innovators. Narrow as the limits of some of their religious opinions were, they were entirely free from political prejudices. Hence arose two tendencies, distinct but not opposite, which are constantly discernible in the manners as well as in the laws of the country. It might be imagined that men who sacrificed their friends, their family, and their native land to a religious conviction were absorbed in the pursuit of the intellectual advantages which they purchased at so dear a rate. The energy, however, with which they strove for the acquirement of wealth, moral enjoyment, and the comforts as well as liberties of the world is scarcely inferior to that which they devoted themselves to heaven. Political principles and all human laws and institutions were molded and altered at their pleasure. The barriers of the society in which they were born were broken down before them. The old principles which had governed the world for ages were no more. A path without a turn and a field without an horizon were open to the exploring and ardent curiosity of man. But at the limits of the political world he checks his researches. He discreetly lays aside the use of his most formidable faculties. He no longer consents to doubt or to innovate, but carefully abstaining from raising the curtains of the sanctuary, he yields with submissive respect to truths which he will not discuss. Thus, in the moral world, everything is classed, adapted, decided, and foreseen. In the political world, Everything is agitated, uncertain, and disputed. 
in the one is a passive, though a voluntary obedience, in the other an independence scornful of experience and jealous of authority. These two tendencies, apparently so discrepant, are far from conflicting. They advance together and mutually support each other. Religion perceives that civil liberty affords a noble exercise to the faculties of man, and that the political world is a field prepared by the Creator for the efforts of the intelligence. Contended with the freedom and the power which it enjoys in its own sphere, and with the place which it occupies, the empire of religion is never more surely established than when it reigns in the hearts of men unsupported by aught beside its native strength. Religion is no less the companion of liberty in all its battles and triumphs, the cradle of its infancy, and the divine source of its claims. The safeguard of morality is religion, and morality is the best security of law and the surest pledge of freedom. Reasons of certain anomalies which the laws and customs of the Anglo-Americans present. Remains of aristocratic institutions in the midst of a complete democracy. Why? Distinction carefully to be drawn between what is of puritanical and what is of English origin. The reader is cautioned not to draw too general or too absolute an inference from what has been said. The social condition, the religion, and the manners of the first emigrants undoubtedly exercised an immense influence on the destiny of their new country. Nevertheless, they were not in a situation to found a state of things solely dependent on themselves. No man can entirely shake off the influence of the past, and the settlers, intentionally or involuntarily, mingled habits and notions derived from their education and from the traditions of their country with those habits and notions which were exclusively their own. To form a judgment on the Anglo-Americans of the present day, it is therefore necessary to distinguish what is of puritanical and what is of English origin. Laws and customs are frequently to be met with in the United States which contrast strongly with all that surrounds them. These laws seem to be drawn up in a spirit contrary to the prevailing tenor of the American legislation, and these customs are no less opposed to the tone of society. If the English colonies had been founded in an age of darkness, or if their origin was already lost in the lapse of years, the problem would be insoluble. I shall quote a single example to illustrate what I advance. The civil and criminal procedure of the Americans has only two means of action, committal and bail. The first measure taken by the magistrate is to exact security from the defendant or, in the case of refusal, to incarcerate him. The ground of the accusation and the importance of the charges against him are then discussed. It is evident that a legislation of this kind is hostile to the poor man and favorable only to the rich. The poor man has not always a security to produce, even in a civil cause and if he is obliged 
to wait for justice in prison, he is speedily reduced to distress. The wealthy individual, on the contrary, always escapes imprisonment in civil causes, nay, more, he may readily elude the punishment which awaits him for a delinquency by breaking his bail, so that all the penalties of the law are, for him, reducible to fines. Nothing can be more aristocratic than this system of legislation. Yet in America it is the poor who make the law, and they usually reserve the greatest social advantages to themselves. The explanation of the phenomenon is to be found in England. The laws of which I speak are English, and the Americans have retained them, however repugnant they may be to the tenor of their legislation and the mass of their ideas. Next to its habits, the thing which a nation is least apt to change is its civil legislation. Civil laws are only familiarly known to legal men, whose direct interest is to maintain them as they are, whether good or bad, simply because they themselves are conversant with them. The body of the nation is scarcely acquainted with them, it merely perceives their action in particular cases, but it has some difficulty in seizing their tendency and obeys them without premeditation. I have quoted one instance where it would have been easy to adduce a great number of others. The surface of American society is, if I may use the expression, covered with a layer of democracy, from beneath which the old aristocratic colors sometimes peep. Chapter 3 Democracy in America, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 3. Social Conditions of the Anglo-Americans. Chapter Summary. A social condition is commonly the result of circumstances, sometimes of laws, oftener still of these two causes united. But wherever it exists, it may justly be considered as the source of almost all the laws, the usages, and the ideas which regulate the conduct of nations. Whatever it does not produce, it modifies. It is therefore necessary, if we would become acquainted with the legislation and the manners of a nation, to begin by the study of its social condition. The striking characteristic of the social condition of the Anglo-Americans in its essential democracy. The first emigrants of New England. Their equality. Aristocratic laws introduced in the South. The period of the Revolution. Change in the law of descent. Effects produced by this change. Democracy carried to its utmost limits in the new states of the West. Equality of education. Many important observations suggest themselves upon the social condition of the Anglo-Americans, but there is one which takes precedence of all the rest. The social condition of the Americans is eminently democratic. This was its character at the foundation of the colonies, and is still more strongly marked at the present day. I have stated in the preceding chapter that great equality existed among the emigrants who settled on the shores of New England. The germ of aristocracy was never planted in that part of the Union. 
The only influence which obtained there was that of intellect. The people were used to reverence certain names as the emblems of knowledge and virtue. Some of their fellow citizens acquired a power over the rest which might truly have been called aristocratic, if it had been capable of transmission from father to son. This was the state of things to the east of the Hudson. To the southwest of that river, and in the direction of the Floridas, the case was different. In most of the states situated to the southwest of the Hudson, some great English proprietors had settled, who had imported with them aristocratic principles and the English law of descent. I have explained the reasons why it was impossible ever to establish a powerful aristocracy in America. These reasons existed with less force to the southwest of the Hudson. In the south, one man, aided by slaves, could cultivate a great extent of country. It was therefore common to see rich landed proprietors. But their influence was not altogether aristocratic, as that term is understood in Europe, since they possessed no privileges. And the cultivation of their estates being carried on by slaves, they had no tenants depending on them, and consequently no patronage. Still, the great proprietors south of the Hudson constituted a superior class, having ideas and tastes of its own, and forming the center of political action. This kind of aristocracy sympathized with the body of the people, whose passions and interests it easily embraced. But it was too weak and too short-lived to excite either love or hatred for itself. This was the class which headed the insurrection in the South, and furnished the best leaders of the American Revolution. At the period of which we are now speaking, society was shaken to its center. The people, in whose name the struggle had taken place, conceived the desire of exercising the authority which it had acquired. Its democratic tendencies were awakened, and having thrown off the yoke of the mother country, it aspired to independence of every kind. The influence of individuals gradually ceased to be felt, and custom and law united together to produce the same result. But the law of descent was the last step to equality. I am surprised that ancient and modern jurists have not attributed to this law a greater influence on human affairs. It is true that these laws belong to civil affairs, but they ought nevertheless to be placed at the head of all political institutions. For, whilst political laws are only the symbol of a nation's condition, they exercise an incredible influence upon its social state. They have, moreover, a sure and uniform manner of operating upon society, affecting, as it were, generations yet unborn. Through their means, man acquires a kind of preternatural power over the future lot of his fellow creatures. When the legislator has regulated the law of inheritance, he may rest from his labor. The machine once put in motion will go on for ages, and advance, as if self-guided, towards a given point. When framed in a particular manner, this law unites, draws together, and vests property and power in a few hands. Its tendency is clearly aristocratic. On opposite principles its action is still more rapid. It divides, distributes, and disperses both property and power. Alarmed by the rapidity of its progress, those who despair of arresting its motion endeavor to obstruct it by difficulties and impediments. They vainly seek to counteract its effect by contrary efforts, but it gradually reduces or destroys every obstacle until by its incessant activity the bulwarks of the influence of wealth are ground down to the fine and shifting sand which is the basis of democracy. When the law of inheritance permits, still more when it decrees, the equal division of a father's property amongst all his children, its effects are of two kinds. It is important to distinguish them from each other, although they tend to the same end. In virtue of the law of partible inheritance, the death of every proprietor brings about a kind of revolution in property. Not only do his possessions change hands, but their very nature is altered. 
since they are parceled into shares which become smaller and smaller at each division. This is the direct, and as it were, the physical effect of the law. It follows, then, that in countries where equality of inheritance is established by law, property, and especially landed property, must have a tendency to perpetual diminution. The effects, however, of such legislation would only be perceptible after a lapse of time if the law was abandoned to its own working. For supposing the family to consist of two children, and in a country peopled as France is, the average number is not above three, these children, sharing amongst them the fortune of both parents, would not be poorer than their father or mother. But the law of equal division exercises its influence not merely upon the property itself, but it affects the minds of the heirs, and brings their passions into play. These indirect consequences tend powerfully to the destruction of large fortunes, and especially of large domains. Among nations whose law of descent is founded upon the right of primogeniture, landed estates often pass from generation to generation without undergoing division, the consequence of which is that family feeling is to a certain degree incorporated with the estate. The family represents the estate, the estate the family, whose name, together with its origin, its glory, its power and its virtues, is thus perpetuated in an imperishable memorial of the past and a sure pledge of the future. When the equal partition of property is established by law, the intimate connection is destroyed between family feeling and the preservation of the paternal estate. The property ceases to represent the family, for as it must inevitably be divided after one or two generations, it has evidently a constant tendency to diminish, and must in the end be completely dispersed. The sons of the great landed proprietor, if they are few in number, or if fortune befriends them, may indeed entertain the hope of being as wealthy as their father, but not that of possessing the same property as he did. The riches must necessarily be composed of elements different from his. Now, from the moment that you divest the landowner of that interest in the preservation of his estate, which he derives from association, from tradition, and from family pride, you may be certain that sooner or later he will dispose of it. For there is a strong pecuniary interest in favor of selling, as floating capital produces higher interest than real property, and is more readily available to gratify the passions of the moment. Great landed estates which have once been divided never come together again, for the small proprietor draws from his land a better revenue in proportion than the large owner does from his, and of course he sells it at a higher rate. The calculations of gain, therefore, which decide the rich man to sell his domain, will still more powerfully influence him against buying small estates to unite them into a large one. What is called family pride is often founded upon an illusion of self-love. A man wishes to perpetuate and immortalize himself, as it were, in his great-grandchildren. Where the esprit de famille ceases to act, individual selfishness comes into play. When the idea of family becomes vague, indeterminate, and uncertain, a man thinks of his present convenience. He provides for the establishment of his succeeding generation, and no more. Either a man gives up the idea of perpetuating his family, or at any rate he seeks to accomplish it by other means than that of a landed estate. Thus not only does the law of partible inheritance render it difficult for families to preserve their ancestral domains entire, but it deprives them of the inclination to attempt it, and compels them in some measure to cooperate with the law in their own extinction. The law of equal distribution proceeds by two methods. By acting upon things, it acts upon persons. By influencing persons, it affects things. By these means the law succeeds in striking at the root of landed property, and dispersing rapidly both families and fortunes. 
Most certainly it is not for us Frenchmen of the nineteenth century, who daily witness the political and social changes which the law of partition is bringing to pass, to question its influence. It is perpetually conspicuous in our country, overthrowing the walls of our dwellings and removing the landmarks of our fields. But although it has produced great effects in France, much still remains for it to do. Our recollections, opinions, and habits present powerful obstacles to its progress. In the United States it has nearly completed its work of destruction, and there we can best study its results. The English laws concerning the transmission of property were abolished in almost all the states at the time of the Revolution. The law of entail was so modified as not to interrupt the free circulation of property. The first generation having passed away, estates began to be parcelled out, and the change became more and more rapid with the progress of time. At this moment, after a lapse of a little more than sixty years, the aspect of society is totally altered. The families of the great landed proprietors are almost all commingled with the general mass. In the state of New York, which formerly contained many of these, there are but two who still keep their heads above the stream, and they must shortly disappear. The sons of these opulent citizens are become merchants, lawyers, or physicians. Most of them have lapsed into obscurity. The last trace of hereditary ranks and distinctions is destroyed. The law of partition has reduced all to one level. I do not mean that there is any deficiency of wealthy individuals in the United States. I know of no country, indeed, where the love of money has taken stronger hold on the affections of men, and where the profounder contempt is expressed for the theory of the permanent equality of property. But wealth circulates with inconceivable rapidity, and experience shows that it is rare to find two succeeding generations in the full enjoyment of it. This picture, which may perhaps be thought to be overcharged, still gives a very imperfect idea of what is taking place in the new states of the West and Southwest. At the end of the last century, a few bold adventurers began to penetrate into the valleys of the Mississippi, and the mass of the population very soon began to move in that direction. Communities unheard of, till then, were seen to emerge from the wilds. States whose names were not in existence a few years before claimed their place in the American Union, and in the western settlements we may behold democracy arrived at its utmost extreme. In these states, founded offhand and, as it were, by chance, the inhabitants are but of yesterday. Scarcely known to one another, the nearest neighbors are ignorant of each other's history. In this part of the American continent, therefore, the population has not experienced the influence of great names and great wealth, nor even that of the natural aristocracy of knowledge and virtue. None are there to wield that respectable power which men willingly grant to the remembrance of a life spent in doing good before their eyes. The new states of the West are already inhabited, but society has no existence among them. It is not only the fortunes of men which are equal in America, even their requirements partake in some degree of the same uniformity. I do not believe that there is a country in the world where, in proportion to the population, there are so few uninstructed and at the same time so few learned individuals. Primary instruction is within the reach of everybody. Superior instruction is scarcely to be obtained by any. This is not surprising. It is in fact the necessary consequence of what we have advanced above. Almost all the Americans are in easy circumstances, and can therefore obtain the first elements of human knowledge. In America there are comparatively few who are rich enough to live without a profession. Every profession requires an apprenticeship which limits the time of instruction to the early years of life. At fifteen they enter upon their calling, and thus their education ends at the age when ours begins. Whatever is done afterwards is with a view to some special and lucrative object. A science is taken up as a matter of business, and the only branch of it which is attended to is such as admits of an immediate practical application. 
in america most of the rich men were formerly poor most of those who now enjoy leisure were absorbed in business during their youth the consequence of which is that when they might have had a taste for study they had no time for it and when time is at their disposal they have no longer the inclination there is no class then in america in which the taste for intellectual pleasures is transmitted with hereditary fortune and leisure and by which the labors of the intellect are held in honor accordingly there is an equal want of desire and the power of application to these objects a middle standard is fixed in america for human knowledge all approach as near to it as they can some as they rise others as they descend of course an immense multitude of persons are to be found who entertain the same number of ideas on religion history science political economy legislation and government the gifts of intellect proceed directly from god and men cannot prevent their unequal distribution but in consequence of the state of things which we have here represented it happens that although the capacities of men are widely different as the creator has doubtless intended they should be they are submitted to the same method of treatment in america the aristocratic element has always been feeble from its birth and if at the present day it is not actually destroyed it is at any rate so completely disabled that we can scarcely assign to it any degree of influence in the course of affairs the democratic principle on the contrary has gained so much strength by time by events and by legislation as to have become not only predominant but all-powerful there is no family or corporate authority and it is rare to find even the influence of individual character enjoy any durability america then exhibits in her social state a most extraordinary phenomenon men are there seen on a greater equality in point of fortune and intellect or in other words more equal in their strength than in any other country of the world or in any age of which history has preserved the remembrance political consequences of the social condition of the anglo-americans the political consequences of such a social condition as this are easily deducible it is impossible to believe that equality will not eventually find its way into the political world as it does everywhere else to conceive of men remaining forever unequal upon one single point yet equal on all others is impossible they must come in the end to be equal upon all now i know of only two methods of establishing equality in the political world every citizen must be put in possession of his rights or rights must be granted to no one for nations which are arrived at the same stage of social existence as the anglo-americans it is therefore very difficult to discover a medium between the sovereignty of all and the absolute power of one man and it would be vain to deny that the social condition which i have been describing is equally liable to each of these consequences there is in fact a manly and lawful passion for equality which excites men to wish all to be powerful and honored this passion tends to elevate the humble to the rank of the great but there exists also in the human heart a depraved taste for equality which impels the weak to attempt to lower the powerful to their own level and reduces men to prefer equality in slavery to inequality with freedom not that those nations whose social condition is democratic naturally despise liberty on the contrary they have an instinctive love of it but liberty is not the chief and constant object of their desires equality is their idol they make rapid and sudden efforts to obtain liberty and if they miss their aim resign themselves to their disappointment but nothing can satisfy them except equality and rather than lose it they resolve to perish on the other hand in a state where the citizens are nearly on an equality it becomes difficult for them to preserve their independence against the aggressions of power no one among them being strong enough to engage in the struggle with advantage nothing but a general combination can protect their liberty and such a union is not always to be found 
From the same social position, then, nations may derive one or the other of two great political results. These results are extremely different from each other, but they may both proceed from the same cause. The Anglo-Americans are the first nations who, having been exposed to this formidable alternative, have been happy enough to escape the dominion of absolute power. They have been allowed by their circumstances, their origin, their intelligence, Democracy in America, Chapter 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Section 5. Chapter 4. The Principle of the Sovereignty of the People in America. Whenever the political laws of the United States are to be discussed, it is with the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people that we must begin. The principle of the sovereignty of the people, which is to be found more or less at the bottom of almost all human institutions, generally remains concealed from view. It is obeyed without being recognized, or if for a moment it be brought to light, it is hastily cast back into the gloom of the sanctuary. The will of the nation is one of those expressions which have been most profusely abused by the wily and the despotic of every age. To the eyes of some it has been represented by the venal suffrages of a few of the satellites of power, to others by the votes of a timid or an interested minority, and some have even discovered it in the silence of a people, on the supposition that the fact of submission established the right of command. In America the principle of the sovereignty of the people is not either barren or concealed, as it is with some other nations. It is recognized by the customs and proclaimed by the laws, it spreads freely and arrives without impediment at its remote consequences. If there be a country in the world where the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people can be fairly appreciated, where it can be studied in its application to the affairs of society, and where its dangers and its advantages may be foreseen, that country is assuredly America. I have already observed that, from their origin, the sovereignty of the people was the fundamental principle of the greater number of British colonies in America. It was far, however, from then exercising as much influence on the government of society as it now does. Two obstacles, the one external, the other internal, checked its invasive progress. It could not ostensibly disclose itself in the laws of the colonies which were still constrained to obey the mother country. It was therefore obliged to spread secretly, and to gain ground in the provincial assemblies, and especially in the townships. American society was not yet prepared to adopt it with all its consequences. The intelligence of New England and the wealth of the country to the south of the Hudson, as I have shown in the preceding chapter, long exercised a sort of aristocratic influence, which tended to retain the exercise of social authority in the hands of a few. The public functionaries were not universally elected, and the citizens were not all of them electors. The electoral franchise was everywhere placed within certain limits and made dependent on a certain qualification, which was exceedingly low in the North and more considerable in the South. The American Revolution broke out, and the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people, which had been nurtured in the townships and municipalities, took possession of the state. Every class was enlisted in its cause, battles were fought, and victories obtained for it, until it became the law of laws. A no less rapid change was effected in the interior of society, where the law of descent completed the abolition of local influences. At the very time when this consequence of the laws and of the revolution was apparent to every eye, victory was irrevocably pronounced in favor of the democratic cause. All power was, in fact, in its hands, and resistance was no longer possible. 
the higher orders submitted without a murmur and without a struggle to an evil which was thenceforth inevitable the ordinary fact of falling powers awaited them each of their several members followed his own interests and as it was impossible to wring the power from the hands of a people which they did not detest sufficiently to brave their only aim was to secure its good will at any price the most democratic laws were consequently voted by the very men whose interests they impaired and thus altogether the higher classes did not excite the passions of the people against their order they accelerated the triumph of the new state of things so that by a singular change the democratic impulse was found to be most irresistible in the very states where the aristocracy had the firmest hold the state of maryland which had been founded by men of rank was the first to proclaim universal suffrage and to introduce the most democratic forms into the conduct of its government when a nation modifies the elective qualification it may be easily foreseen that sooner or later that qualification will be entirely abolished there is no more invariable rule in the history of society the further electoral rights are extended the greater is the need of extending them for after each concession the strength of democracy increases and its demands increase with its strength the ambition of those who are below the appointed rate is irritated in exact proportion to the great number of those who are above it the exception at last becomes the rule concession follows concession and no stop can be made short of universal suffrage at the present day the principle of the sovereignty of the people has acquired in the united states all the practical development which the imagination can conceive it is unencumbered by those fictions which have been thrown over it in other countries and it appears in every possible form according to the exigency of the occasion sometimes the laws are made by the people in a body as at athens and sometimes its representatives chosen by universal suffrage transact business in its name and almost under its immediate control in some countries a power exists which though it is in degree foreign to the social body directs it and forces it to pursue a certain track in others the ruling force is divided being partly within and partly without the ranks of the people but nothing of the kind is to be seen in the united states there society governs itself for itself all power centers in its bosom and scarcely an individual is to be met with who would venture to conceive or still less to express the idea of seeking it elsewhere the nation participates in the making of its laws by the choice of its legislators and in the execution of them by the choice of the agents of the executive government it may almost be said to govern itself so feeble and so restricted is the share left to the administration This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 5. Necessity of Examining the Conditions of the States, Part 1. Necessity of Examining the Condition of the States Before That of the Union at Large. It is proposed to examine in the following chapter what is the form of government established in America on the principle of the sovereignty of the people, what are its resources, its hindrances, its advantages, and its dangers. The first difficulty which presents itself arises from the complex nature of the Constitution of the United States, which consists of two distinct social structures, connected and, as it were, encased one within the other two governments completely separate and almost independent the one fulfilling the ordinary duties and responding to the daily and indefinite calls of a community the other circumscribed within certain limits and only exercising an exceptional authority over the general interests of the country in short there are twenty-four small sovereign nations whose agglomeration constitutes the body of the union 
To examine the Union before we have studied the States would be to adopt a method filled with obstacles. The form of the federal government of the United States was the last which was adopted, and it is in fact nothing more than a modification or a summary of those republican principles which were current in the whole community before it existed, and independently of its existence. Moreover, the federal government is, as I have just observed, the exception. The government of the states is the rule. The author who shall attempt to exhibit the picture as a whole before he had explained its details would necessarily fall into obscurity and repetition. The great political principles which govern American society at this day undoubtedly took their origin and their growth in the state. It is therefore necessary to become acquainted with the state in order to possess a clue to the remainder. The states which at present compose the American Union all present the same features, as far as regards the external aspect of their institutions. Their political or administrative existence is centered in three focuses of action, which may not inaptly be compared to the different nervous centers which convey motion to the human body. The township is the lowest in order, then the county, and last the state and I propose to devote the following chapter to the examination of these three divisions. The American System of Townships and Municipal Bodies Why the author begins the examination of the political institutions with the township, its existence in all nations, difficulty of establishing and preserving municipal independence, its importance, why the author has selected the township system of New England as the main topic of his discussion. It is not undesignedly that I begin this subject with the township. The village or township is the only association which is so perfectly natural that wherever a number of men are collected it seems to constitute itself. The town, or tithing, as the smallest division of a community, must necessarily exist in all nations, whatever their laws and customs may be. If man makes monarchies and establishes republics, the first association of mankind seems constituted by the hand of God. But although the existence of the township is coeval with that of men, its liberties are not the less rarely respected and easily destroyed. A nation is always able to establish great political assemblies because it habitually contains a certain number of individuals fitted by their talents, if not by their habits, for the direction of affairs. The township is, on the contrary, composed of coarser materials, which are less easily fashioned by the legislature. The difficulties which attend the consolidation of its independence rather augment than diminish with the increasing enlightenment of the people. A highly civilized community spurns the attempts of a local independence is disgusted at its numerous blunders, and is apt to despair of success before the experiment is completed. Again, no immunities are so ill-protected from the encroachments of the supreme power as those of municipal bodies in general. They are unable to struggle, single-handed, against a strong or an enterprising government, and they cannot defend their cause with success unless it be identified with the customs of the nation and supported by public opinion. Thus, until the independence of townships is amalgamated with the manners of a people, it is easily destroyed, and it is only after a long existence in the laws that it can be thus amalgamated. Municipal freedom is not the fruit of human device. It is rarely created, but it is, as it were, secretly and spontaneously engendered in the midst of a semi-barbarous state of society. The constant action of the laws and the national habits, peculiar circumstances, and above all, time, may consolidate it. But there is certainly no nation on the continent of Europe which has experienced its advantages. Nevertheless, local assemblies of citizens constitute the strength of free nations. Town meetings are to liberty what primary schools are to science. They bring it within the people's reach. They teach men how to use and how to enjoy it. A nation may establish a system of free government, but without the spirit of municipal institutions it cannot have the spirit of liberty. 
the transient passions and the interests of an hour or the chance of circumstances may have created the external forms of independence but the despotic tendency which has been repelled will sooner or later inevitably reappear on the surface in order to explain to the reader the general principles on which the political organization of the counties and townships of the united states rests i have thought it expedient to choose one of the states of new england as an example to examine the mechanism of its constitution and then to cast a general glance over the country the township and the county are not organized in the same manner in every part of the union it is however easy to perceive that the same principles have guided the formation of both of them throughout the union i am inclined to believe that these principles have been carried further in new england than elsewhere and consequently that they offer greater facilities to the observations of a stranger the institutions of new england form a complete and regular whole they have received the sanction of time they have the support of the laws and the still stronger support of the manners of the community over which they exercise the most prodigious influence they consequently deserve our attention on every account limits of the township the township of new england is a division which stands between the commune and the canton of france and which corresponds in general to the english tithing or town its average population is from two to three thousand so that on the one hand the interests of its inhabitants are not likely to conflict and on the other men capable of conducting its affairs are always to be found among its citizens authorities of the township in new england the people the source of all power here is elsewhere manages its own affairs no corporation the greater part of the authority vested in the hands of the selectmen how the selectmen act town meeting enumeration of the public officers of the township obligatory and remunerated functions in the township as well as everywhere else the people is the only source of power but in no stage of government does the body of citizens exercise a more immediate influence in america the people is a master whose exigencies demand obedience to the utmost limits of possibility in new england the majority acts by representatives in the conduct of the public business of the state but if such an arrangement be necessary in general affairs in the townships where the legislative and administrative actions of the government is in more immediate contact with the subject the system of representation is not adopted there is no corporation but the body of electors after having designated its magistrates directs them in everything that exceeds the simple and ordinary executive business of the state this state of things is so contrary to our ideas and so different from our customs that it is necessary for me to adduce some examples to explain it thoroughly the public duties in the township are extremely numerous and minutely divided as we shall see further on but the larger proportion of administrative power is vested in the hands of a small number of individuals called the selectmen the general laws of the state impose a certain number of obligations on the selectmen which they may fulfill without the authorization of the body they represent but which they can only neglect on their own responsibility the laws of the state obliges them for instance to draw up the list of electors in their townships and if they omit this part of their functions they are guilty of a misdemeanor in all the affairs however which are determined by the town meeting the selectmen are the organs of the popular mandate as in france the mayor executes the degree of the municipal council they usually act upon their own responsibility and merely put in practice principles which have been previously recognized by the majority but if any change is to be introduced in the existing state of things or if they wish to undertake any new enterprise they are obliged to refer to the source of their power if for instance a school is to be established the selectmen convoke the whole body of the electors on a certain day at an appointed place they explain the urgency of the case they give their opinion on the means of satisfying it on the probable expense 
and the site which seems to be most favorable. The meeting is consulted on these several points. It adopts the principle, marks out the site, votes the rate, and confides the execution of its resolution to the selectmen. The selectmen have alone the right of calling a town meeting, but they may be requested to do so. If ten citizens are desirous of submitting a new project to the assent of the township, they may demand a general convocation of the inhabitants. The selectmen are obliged to comply, but they have only the right of presiding at the meeting. The selectmen are elected every year in the month of April or May. The town meeting chooses at the same time a number of other municipal magistrates, who are entrusted with important administrative functions. The assessors rate the township, the collectors receive the rate. A constable is appointed to keep the peace, to watch the streets, and to forward the execution of the laws. The town clerk records all the town votes, orders, grants, births, deaths, and marriages. The treasurer keeps the funds. The overseer of the poor performs the difficult task of superintending the action of the poor laws. Committee men are appointed to attend to the schools and to public instruction, and the road surveyors, who take care of the greater and lesser thoroughfares of the township, complete the list of the principal functionaries. They are, however, still further subdivided, and amongst the municipal officers are to be found parish commissioners who audit the expenses of public worship, different classes of inspectors, some of whom are to direct the citizens in case of fire, tithing men, listers, haywards, chimney viewers, fence viewers to maintain the bounds of property, timber measurers, and sealers of weights and measures. There are nineteen principal officers in a township. Every inhabitant is constrained, on the pain of being fined, to undertake these different functions, which, however, are almost all paid, in order that the poorer citizens may be able to give up their time without loss. In general, the American system is not to grant a fixed salary to its functionaries. Every service has its price, and they are remunerated in proportion to what they have done. Existence of the Township Every one the best judge of his own interest, corollary of the principle of the sovereignty of the people, application of those doctrines in the townships of America, the township of New England is sovereign in all that concerns itself alone, subject to the state in all other matters, bond of the township and the state, in France the government lends its agent to the commune, in America the reverse occurs. I have already observed that the principle of the sovereignty of the people governs the whole political system of the Anglo-Americans. Every page of this book will afford new instances of the same doctrine. In the nations by which the sovereignty of the people is recognized, every individual possesses an equal share of power, and participates alike in the government of the state. Every individual is, therefore, supposed to be as well informed, and virtuous, and as strong as any of his fellow citizens. He obeys the government, not because he is inferior to the authorities which conduct it, or that he is less capable than his neighbor of governing himself, but because he acknowledges the utility of an association with his fellow men, and because he knows that no such association can exist without a regulating force. If he be a subject in all that concerns the mutual relations of citizens, he is free and responsible to God alone for all that concerns himself. Hence arises the maxim that every one is the best and the sole judge of his own private interest, and that society has no right to control a man's actions, unless they are prejudicial to the common weal, or unless the common weal demands his cooperation. This doctrine is universally admitted in the United States. I shall hereafter examine the general influence which it exercises on the ordinary actions of life. I am now speaking of the nature of municipal bodies. The township, taken as a whole, and in relation to the government of the country, may be looked upon as an individual to whom the theory I have just alluded to is applied. 
Municipal independence is therefore a natural consequence of the principle of the sovereignty of the people in the United States. All the American republics recognize it more or less, but circumstances have peculiarly favored its growth in New England. In this part of the Union the impulsion of political activity was given in the townships, and it may almost be said that each of them originally formed an independent nation. When the kings of England asserted their supremacy, they were contented to assume the central power of the state. The townships of New England remained as they were before, and although they are now subject to the state, they were at first scarcely dependent upon it. It is important to remember that they have not been invested with privileges, but that they have, on the contrary, forfeited a portion of their independence to the state. The townships are only subordinate to the state in those interests which I shall term social, as they are common to all the citizens. They are independent in all that concerns themselves, and amongst the inhabitants of New England I believe that not a man is to be found who would acknowledge that the state has any right to interfere in their local interests. The towns of New England buy and sell, sue or are sued, augment or diminish their rates without the slightest opposition on the part of the administrative authority of the state. They are bound, however, to comply with the demands of the community. If the state is in need of money, a town can neither give nor withhold the supplies. If the state projects a road, the township cannot refuse to let it cross its territory. If a police regulation is made by the state, it must be enforced by the town. A uniform system of instruction is organized all over the country, and every town is bound to establish the schools which the law ordains. In speaking of the administration of the United States, I shall have occasion to point out the means by which the townships are compelled to obey in these different cases. I here merely show the existence of the obligation. Strict as this obligation is, the government of the state imposes it in principle only, and in its performance the township resumes all its independent rights. Thus taxes are voted by the state, but they are levied and collected by the township. The existence of a school is obligatory, but the township bills, pays, and superintends it. In France the state collector receives the local imposts. In America the town collector receives the taxes of the state. Thus the French government lends its agents to the commune. In America the township is the agent of the government. This fact alone shows the extent of the differences which exist between the two nations. Public Spirit of the Townships of New England How the Township of New England Wins the Affection of Its Inhabitants Difficulty of Creating Local Public Spirit in Europe The Rights and Duties of the American Township Favorable to It Characteristics of Home in the United States Manifestations of Public Spirit in New England its happy effects. In America not only do municipal bodies exist, but they are kept alive and supported by public spirit. The township of New England possesses two advantages which infallibly secure the attentive interest of mankind, namely independence and authority. Its sphere is indeed small and limited, but within that sphere its action is unrestrained, and its independence gives it a real importance which its extent and population may not always ensure. It is to be remembered that the affections of men generally lie on the side of authority. Patriotism is not durable in a conquered nation. The New Englander is attached to his township not only because he was born in it, but because it constitutes a social body of which he is a member and whose government claims and deserves the exercise of his sagacity. In Europe the absence of local public spirit is a frequent subject of regret to those who are in power. Everyone agrees that there is no surer guarantee of order and tranquillity, and yet nothing is more difficult to create. If the municipal bodies were made powerful and independent, the authorities of the nation might be disunited and the peace of the country endangered. Yet without power and independence, a town may contain good subjects, but it can have no active citizens. Another important fact is that the township of New England is so constituted as to excite the warmest of human affections, without arousing the ambitious passions of the heart of man. 
the officers of the country are not elected, and their authority is very limited. Even the state is only a second-rate community whose tranquil and obscure administration offers no inducement sufficient to draw men away from the circle of their interests into the turmoil of public affairs. The federal government confers power and honor on the men who conduct it, but these individuals can never be very numerous. The high station of the presidency can only be reached at an advanced period of life, and the other federal functionaries are generally men who have been favored by fortune or distinguished in some other career. Such cannot be the permanent aim of the ambitious. But the township serves as a center for the desire of public esteem, the want of exciting interests, and the taste for authority and popularity in the midst of the ordinary relations of life and the passions which commonly embroil society change their character when they find events so near the domestic hearth and the family circle. In the American states, power has been disseminated with admirable skill for the purpose of interesting the greatest possible number of persons in the common wheel. Independently of the electors who are from time to time called into action, the body politic is divided into innumerable functionaries and officers, who all, in their several spheres, represent the same powerful whole in whose name they act. The local administration thus affords an unfailing source of profit and interest to a vast number of individuals. The American system, which divides the local authority among so many citizens, does not scruple to multiply the functions of the town officers. For in the United States it is believed, and with truth, that patriotism is a kind of devotion which is strengthened by ritual observance. In this manner, the activity of the township is continually perceptible. It is daily manifested in the fulfillment of a duty or the exercise of a right, and a constant, though gentle, motion is thus kept up in society which animates without disturbing it. The American attaches himself to his home as the mountaineer clings to his hills, because the characteristic features of his country are there more distinctly marked than elsewhere. The existence of the townships of New England is in general a happy one. Their government is suited to their taste, and chosen by themselves. In the midst of the profound peace and general comfort which reign in America, the commotions of municipal discord are infrequent. The conduct of local business is easy. The political education of the people has long been complete. Say, rather, that it was complete when the people first set foot upon the soil. In New England, no tradition exists of a distinction of ranks. No portion of the community is tempted to oppress the remainder, and the abuses which may injure isolated individuals are forgotten in the general contentment which prevails. If the government is defective, and it would no doubt be easy to point out its deficiencies, the fact that it really emanates from those it governs, and that it acts, either ill or well, casts the protecting spell of a parental pride over its faults. No term of comparison disturbs the satisfaction of the citizen. England formerly governed the mass of the colonies, but the people was always sovereign in the township, where its rule is not only an ancient, but a primitive state. The native of New England is attached to his township because it is independent and free. His cooperation in its affairs ensures his attachment to its interests. The well-being it affords him secures his affection, and its welfare is the aim of his ambition and of his future exertions. He takes a part in every occurrence in the place, he practices the art of government in the small sphere within his reach. He accustoms himself to those forms which alone can ensure the steady progress of liberty. He imbibes their spirit. He acquires a taste for order, comprehends the union or the balance of powers, and collects clear practical notions on the nature of his duties and the extent of his rights. THE COUNTIES OF NEW ENGLAND the division of the counties in America has considerable analogy with that of the arrondissement of France. The limits of the counties are arbitrarily laid down, and the various districts which they contain have no necessary connection, no common tradition or natural sympathy. Their object is simply to facilitate the administration of justice. 
the extent of the township was too small to contain a system of judicial institutions. Each county has, however, a court of justice, a sheriff to execute its decrees, and a prison for criminals. There are certain wants which are felt alike by all the townships of a county. It is therefore natural that they should be satisfied by a central authority. In the state of Massachusetts, this authority is vested in the hands of several magistrates, who are appointed by the governor of the state, with the advice of his council. The officers of the county have only a limited and occasional authority, which is applicable to certain predetermined cases. The state and the township possess all the power requisite to conduct public business. The budget of the county is drawn up by its officers, and is voted by the legislature, but there is no assembly which directly or indirectly represents the county. It has, therefore, properly speaking, no political existence. Administration in New England Administration not perceived in America. Why? The Europeans believe that liberty is promoted by depriving the social authority of some of its rights the Americans by dividing its exercise. Almost all the administration confined to the township and divided amongst the town officers. No trace of an administrative body to be perceived, either in the township or above it. The reason of this. How it happens that the administration of the state is uniform. Who is empowered to enforce the obedience of the township and the county to the law? The introduction of judicial power into the administration consequence of the extension of the elective principle to all functionaries, the justice of the peace in New England, by whom appointed, county officer, ensures the administration of the townships, court of sessions, its actions, right of inspection and indictment disseminated like the other administrative functions, informers encouraged by the division of fines. Nothing is more striking to a European traveler in the United States than the absence of what we term the government, or the administration. Written laws exist in America, and one sees that they are daily executed, but although everything is in motion, the hand which gives the impulse to the social machine can nowhere be discovered. Nevertheless, as all peoples are obliged to have recourse to certain grammatical forms which are the foundation of human language, in order to express their thoughts, so all communities are obliged to secure their existence by submitting to a certain dose of authority, without which they fall prey to anarchy. This authority may be distributed in several ways, but it must always exist somewhere. There are two methods of diminishing the force of authority in a nation. The first is to weaken the supreme power in its very principle, by forbidding or preventing society from acting in its own defense under certain circumstances. To weaken authority in this manner is what is generally termed in Europe to lay the foundations of freedom. The second manner of diminishing the influence of authority does not consist in stripping society of any of its rights, nor in paralyzing its effects, but in distributing the exercise of its privileges in various hands, and in multiplying functionaries, to each of whom the degree of power necessary for him to perform his duty is entrusted. There may be nations whom this distribution of social powers might lead to anarchy, but in itself it is not anarchical. The action of authority is indeed thus rendered less irresistible and less perilous, but it is not totally suppressed. The revolution of the United States was the result of a mature and dignified taste for freedom, and not of a vague or ill-defined craving for independence. It contracted no alliance with the turbulent passions of anarchy, but its course was marked, on the contrary, by an attachment to whatever was lawful and orderly. It was never assumed in the United States that the citizen of a free country has a right to do whatever he pleases. On the contrary, social obligations were there imposed upon him more various than anywhere else. No idea was ever entertained of attacking the principles or of contesting the rights of society, but the exercise of its authority was divided to the end that the office might be powerful and the officer insignificant, and that the community should be at once regulated and free. 
In no country in the world does the law hold so absolute a language as in America, and in no country is the right of applying it vested in so many hands. The administrative power in the United States presents nothing, either central or hierarchical, in its constitution, which accounts for its passing, unperceived. The power exists, but its representative is not to be perceived. We have already seen that the independent townships of New England protect their own private interests, and the municipal magistrates are the persons to whom the execution of the laws of the state is most frequently entrusted. Besides the general laws, the state sometimes passes general police regulations, but more commonly the townships and town officers, conjointly with justices of the peace, regulate the minor details of social life according to the necessities of the different localities, and promulgate such enactments as concern the health of the community and the peace as well as morality of the citizens. Lastly, these municipal magistrates provide, of their own accord and without any delegated powers, for those unforeseen emergencies which frequently occur in society. It results from what we have seen that in the state of Massachusetts the administrative authority is almost entirely restricted to the township, but that it is distributed among a great number of individuals. In the French commune there is properly but one official functionary, namely the mayor, and in New England we have seen that there are nineteen. These nineteen functionaries do not in general depend upon one another. The law carefully prescribes a circle of action to each of these magistrates, and within that circle they have an entire right to perform their functions independently of any other authority. Above the township scarcely any trace of a series of official dignitaries is to be found. It sometimes happens that the county officers alter a decision of the townships or town magistrates but in general the authorities of the county have no right to interfere with the authorities of the township, except in such matters as concern the county. The magistrates of the township, as well as those of the county, are bound to communicate their acts to the central government in a very small number of predetermined cases. But the central government is not represented by an individual whose business it is to publish police regulations and ordinances enforcing the execution of the laws, to keep up a regular communication with the officers of the township and the county, to inspect their conduct, to direct their actions, or to reprimand their faults. There is no point which serves as a center to the radii of the administration. End of This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 5. Necessity of Examining the Condition of the States, Part 2. What, then, is the uniform plan on which the government is conducted, and how is the compliance of the counties and their magistrates, or the townships and their officers, enforced? In the states of New England the legislative authority embraces more subjects than it does in France. The legislator penetrates to the very core of the administration. The law descends to the most minute details. The same enactment prescribes the principle and the method of its application, and thus imposes a multitude of strict and rigorously defined obligations on the secondary functionaries of the state. The consequence of this is that, if all the secondary functionaries of the administration conform to the law, society in all its branches proceeds with the greatest uniformity. The difficulty remains of compelling the secondary functionaries of the administration to conform to the law. It may be affirmed that, in general, society has only two methods of enforcing the execution of the laws at its disposal. A discretionary power may be entrusted to a superior functionary of directing all the others, and of cashiering them in case of disobedience, 
or the courts of justice may be authorized to inflict judicial penalties on the offender, but these two methods are not always available. The right of directing a civil officer presupposes that of cashiering him if he does not obey orders, and of rewarding him by promotion if he fulfills his duties with propriety. But an elected magistrate can neither be cashiered nor promoted. All elective functions are inalienable until their term is expired. In fact, the elected magistrate has nothing either to expect or to fear from his constituents, and when all public offices are filled by ballot there can be no series of official dignities, because the double right of commanding and of enforcing obedience can never be vested in the same individual, and because the power of issuing an order can never be joined to that of inflicting a punishment or bestowing a reward. The communities, therefore, in which the secondary functionaries of the government are elected are perforce obliged to make great use of judicial penalties as a means of administration. This is not evident at first sight, for those in power are apt to look upon the institution of elected functionaries as one concession, and the subjection of the elected magistrate to the judges of the land as another. They are equally averse to both these innovations, and as they are more pressingly solicited to grant the former than the latter, they accede to the election of the magistrate and leave him independent of the judicial power. Nevertheless, the second of these measures is the only thing that can possibly counterbalance the first, and it will be found that an elective authority which is not subject to judicial power will sooner or later either elude all control or be destroyed. The courts of justice are the only possible medium between the central power and the administrative bodies. They alone can compel the elected functionary to obey, without violating the rights of the elector. The extension of judicial power in the political world ought therefore to be in the exact ratio of the extension of elective offices. If these two institutions do not go hand in hand, the state must fall into anarchy or into subjection. It has always been remarkable that habits of legal business do not render men apt to the exercise of administrative authority. The Americans have borrowed from the English, their fathers, the idea of an institution which is unknown upon the continent of Europe. I allude to that of the justices of the peace. The justice of the peace is a sort of mezzo termine between the magistrate and the man of the world, between the civil officer and the judge. A justice of the peace is a well-informed citizen, though he is not necessarily versed in the knowledge of the laws. His office simply obliges him to execute the police regulations of society, a task in which good sense and integrity are of more avail than legal science. The justice introduces into the administration a certain taste for established forms and publicity, which renders him a most unserviceable instrument of despotism, and on the other hand he is not blinded by those superstitions which render legal officers unfit members of a government. The Americans have adopted the system of the English justices of the peace, but they have deprived it of that aristocratic character which is discernible in the mother country. The governor of Massachusetts appoints a certain number of justices of the peace in every county, whose functions last seven years. He further designates three individuals from amongst the whole body of justices who form in each county what is called the Court of Sessions. The justices take a personal share in public business. They are sometimes entrusted with administrative functions in conjunction with elected officers. They sometimes constitute a tribunal before which the magistrates summarily prosecute a refractory citizen, or the citizens inform against the abuses of the magistrate. But it is in the court of sessions that they exercise their most important functions. This court meets twice a year in the county town. In Massachusetts it is empowered to enforce the obedience of the greater number of public officers. It must be observed that, in the state of Massachusetts, the Court of Sessions is at the same time an administrative body, properly so called, and a political tribunal. It has been asserted that the county is a purely administrative division. The Court of Sessions presides over that small number of affairs which, as they concern several townships, or all the townships of the county in common, cannot be entrusted to any one of them in particular. 
In all that concerns county business, the duties of the Court of Sessions are purely administrative, and if, in its investigations, it occasionally borrows the form of judicial procedure, it is only with a view to its own information, or as a guarantee to the community over which it presides. But when the administration of the township is brought before it, it always acts as a judicial body, and in some few cases as an official assembly. The first difficulty is to procure the obedience of an authority as entirely independent of the general laws of the state as the township is. We have stated that assessors are annually named by the town meetings to levy the taxes. If a township attempts to evade the payment of the taxes by neglecting to name its assessors, the Court of Sessions condemns it to a heavy penalty. The fine is levied on each of the inhabitants, and the sheriff of the county, who is the officer of justice, executes the mandate. Thus it is that in the United States the authority of the government is mysteriously concealed under the forms of a judicial sentence, and its influence is at the same time fortified by that irresistible power with which men have invested the formalities of law. These proceedings are easy to follow and to understand. The demands made upon a township are in general plain and accurately defined. They consist in a simple fact without any complication, or in a principle without its application in detail. But the difficulty arises when it is not the obedience of a township, but that of the town officer which is to be enforced. All the reprehensible actions of which a public functionary may be guilty are reducible to the following heads. He may execute the law without energy or zeal. He may neglect to execute the law. He may do what the law enjoins him not to do. The last two violations of duty can alone come under the cognizance of a tribunal. A positive and appreciable fact is the indispensable foundation of an action at law. Thus, if the selectmen omit to fulfill the legal formalities usual at town elections, they may be condemned to pay a fine, but when the public officer performs his duty without ability, and when he obeys the letter of the law without zeal or energy, he is at least beyond the reach of judicial interference. The Court of Sessions, even when it is invested with its official powers, is in this case unable to compel him to a more satisfactory obedience. The fear of removal is the only check to those quasi-offenses, and as the Court of Sessions does not originate the town authorities, it cannot remove functionaries whom it does not appoint. Moreover, a perpetual investigation would be necessary to convict the officer of negligence or lukewarmness, and the Court of Sessions sits but twice a year, and then only judges such offenses as are brought before its notice. The only security of that active and enlightened obedience which a court of justice cannot impose upon public officers lies in the possibility of their arbitrary removal. In France this security is sought for in powers exercised by the heads of the administration. In America it is sought for in the principle of election. Thus to recapitulate in a few words what I have been showing. If a public officer in New England commits a crime in the exercise of his functions, the ordinary courts of justice are always called upon to pass sentence upon him. If he commits a fault in his official capacity, a purely administrative tribunal is empowered to punish him, and if the affair is important or urgent, the judge supplies the omission of the functionary. Lastly, if the same individual is guilty of one of those intangible offenses of which human justice has no cognizance, he annually appears before a tribunal from which there is no appeal, which can at once reduce him to insignificance and deprive him of his charge. This system undoubtedly possesses great advantages, but its execution is attended with a practical difficulty which it is important to point out. I have already observed that the administrative tribunal, which is called the Court of Sessions, has no right of inspection over the town officers. It can only interfere when the conduct of a magistrate is specially brought under its notice, and this is the delicate part of the system. The Americans of New England are unacquainted with the office of public prosecutor in the Court of Sessions, and it may readily be perceived that it could not have been established without great difficulty. If an accusing magistrate had merely been appointed in the chief town of each county, and if he had been unassisted by agents in the townships, 
he would not have been better acquainted with what was going on in the county than the members of the court of sessions but to appoint agents in each township would have been to centre in his person the most formidable of powers that of a judicial administration moreover laws are the children of habit and nothing of the kind exists in the legislation of england the americans have therefore divided the offices of inspection and of prosecution as well as all the other functions of the administration grand jurors are bound by the law to apprise the court to which they belong of all the misdemeanors which may have been committed in their county there are certain great offences which are officially prosecuted by the states but more frequently the task of punishing delinquents devolves upon the fiscal officer whose province it is to receive the fine thus the treasurer of the township is charged with the prosecution of such administrative offences as fall under his notice but a more special appeal is made by american legislation to the private interest of the citizen and this great principle is constantly to be met with in studying the laws of the united states american legislators are more apt to give men credit for intelligence than for honesty and they rely not a little on personal cupidity for the execution of the laws when an individual is really and sensibly injured by an administrative abuse it is natural that his personal interests should induce him to prosecute but if a legal formality be required which however advantageous to the community is of small importance to individuals plaintiffs may be less easily found and thus by a tacit agreement the laws may fall into disuse reduced by their system to this extremity the americans are obliged to encourage informers by bestowing on them a portion of the penalty in certain cases and to ensure the execution of the laws by the dangerous expedient of degrading the morals of the people the only administrative authority above the county magistrates is properly speaking that of the government general remarks on the administration of the united states differences of the states of the union in their system of administration activity and perfection of the local authorities decreases towards the south power of the magistrate increases that of the elector diminishes administration passes from the township to the county states of new york ohio pennsylvania principles of administration applicable to the whole union election of public officers and inalienability of their functions absence of graduation of ranks introduction of judicial resources into the administration i have already premised that after having examined the constitution of the township and the county of new england in detail i should take a general view of the remainder of the union townships and a local activity exist in every state but in no part of the confederation is a township to be met with precisely similar to those of new england the more we descend toward the south the less active does the business of the township or parish become the number of magistrates of functions and of rights decreases the population exercises a less immediate influence on affairs town meetings are less frequent and the subjects of debate less numerous the power of the elected magistrate is augmented and that of the elector diminished whilst the public spirit of the local communities is less awakened and less influential these differences may be perceived to a certain extent in the state of new york they are very sensible in pennsylvania but they become less striking as we advance to the northwest the majority of immigrants who settle in the northwestern states are natives of new england and they carry the habits of their mother country with them into that which they adopt a township in ohio is by no means dissimilar from a township in massachusetts we have seen that in massachusetts the mainspring of public administration lies in the township it forms the common centre of the interests and affection of the citizens but this ceases to be the case as we descend to states in which knowledge is less generally diffused and where the township consequently offers fewer guarantees of a wise and active administration as we leave new england therefore we find that the importance of the town is gradually transferred to the county which becomes the centre of administration and the intermediate power between the government and the citizen in massachusetts the business of the county is conducted by the court of sessions which is composed of a quorum named by the governor and his council 
but the county has no representative assembly, and its expenditure is voted by the national legislature. In the great state of New York, on the contrary, and in those of Ohio and Pennsylvania, the inhabitants of each county choose a certain number of representatives who constitute the assembly of the county. The county assembly has the right of taxing the inhabitants to a certain extent, and in this respect it enjoys the privileges of a real legislative body. At the same time, it exercises an executive power in the county, frequently directs the administration of the townships, and restricts their authority within much narrower bounds than in Massachusetts. Such are the principal differences which the systems of county and town administration present in the federal states. Were it my intention to examine the provisions of American law minutely, I should have to point out still further differences in the executive details of the several communities. But what I have already said may suffice to show the general principles on which the administration of the United States rests. These principles are differently applied, their consequences are more or less numerous in various localities, but they are always substantially the same. The laws differ, and their outward features change, but their character does not vary. If the township and the county are not everywhere constituted in the same manner, it is at least true that in the United States the county and the township are always based upon the same principle, namely, that every one is the best judge of what concerns himself alone, and the most proper person to supply his private wants. The township and the county are therefore bound to take care of their special interests. The state governs, but it does not interfere with their administration. Exceptions to this rule may be met with, but not a contrary principle. The first consequence of this doctrine has been to cause all the magistrates to be chosen either by or at least from amongst the citizens. As the officers are everywhere elected or appointed for a certain period, it has been impossible to establish the rules of a dependent series of authorities. There are almost as many independent functionaries as there are functions, and the executive power is disseminated in a multitude of hands. Hence arose the indispensable necessity of introducing the control of the courts of justice over the administration, and the system of pecuniary penalties by which the secondary bodies and their representatives are constrained to obey the laws. This system obtains from one end of the Union to the other. The power of punishing the misconduct of public offices, or of performing the part of the executive in urgent cases, has not, however, been bestowed on the same judges in all the states. The Anglo-Americans derived the institution of justices of the peace from the common source, but although it exists in all the states, it is not always turned to the same use. The justices of the peace everywhere participate in the administration of the townships and the counties, either as public officers or as the judges of public misdemeanors. But in most of the states, the more important classes of public offenses come under the cognizance of ordinary tribunals. The election of public officers, or the inalienability of their functions, the absence of a graduation of powers, and the introduction of a judicial control over the secondary branches of the administration, are the universal characteristics of the American system from Maine to the Floridas. In some states, and that of New York has advanced most in this direction, traces of a centralized administration begin to be discernible. In the state of New York, the officers of the central government exercise, in certain cases, a sort of inspection or control over the secondary bodies. At other times, they constitute a court of appeal for the decision of affairs. In the state of New York, judicial penalties are less used than in other parts as a means of administration, and the right of prosecuting the offenses of public officers is vested in fewer hands. The same tendency is faintly observable in some other states, but in general the prominent feature of the administration in the United States is its excessive local independence of the state. I have now described the townships and the administration. It now remains for me to speak of the state and the government. This is ground I may pass over rapidly without fear of being misunderstood, for all I have to say is to be found in written forms of the various constitutions, which are easily to be procured. These constitutions rest upon a simple and rational theory, their forms have been adopted by all constitutional nations, and are become familiar to us. 
In this place, therefore, it is only necessary for me to give a short analysis. I shall endeavor afterwards to pass judgment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 5. Necessity of Examining the Condition of the States, Part 3. Legislative Power of the State. Division of the legislative body into two houses, Senate, House of Representatives, different functions of these two bodies. The legislative power of the state is vested in two assemblies, the first of which generally bears the name of the Senate. The Senate is commonly a legislative body, but it sometimes becomes an executive and judicial one. It takes a part in the government in several ways, according to the constitution of the different states, but it is in the nomination of public functionaries that it most commonly assumes an executive power. It partakes of judicial power in the trial of certain political offenses, and sometimes also in the decision of certain civil cases. The number of its members is always small. The other branch of the legislature, which is usually called the House of Representatives, has no share whatever in the administration, and only takes a part in the judicial power inasmuch as it impeaches public functionaries before the Senate. The members of the two houses are nearly everywhere subject to the same conditions of election. They are chosen in the same manner and by the same citizens. The only difference which exists between them is that the term for which the Senate is chosen is in general longer than that of the House of Representatives. The latter seldom remain in office longer than a year. The former usually sit two or three years. By granting to the senators the privilege of being chosen for several years and being renewed seriatim, the law takes care to preserve in the legislative body a nucleus of men already accustomed to public business and capable of exercising a salutary influence upon the junior members. The Americans plainly did not desire, by the separation of the legislative body into two branches, to make one house hereditary and the other elective, one aristocratic and the other democratic. It was not their object to create in the one a bulwark to power, whilst the other represented the interests and passions of the people. The only advantages which result from the present Constitution of the United States are the division of the legislative power and the consequent check upon the political assemblies, with the creation of a tribunal of appeal for the revision of the laws. Time and experience, however, have convinced the Americans that, if these are its only advantages, the division of the legislative power is still a principle of the greatest necessity. Pennsylvania was the only one of the United States which at first attempted to establish a single house of assembly by the principle of the sovereignty of the people as to have concurred in the measure but the pennsylvanians were soon obliged to change the law and to create two houses thus the principle of the division of the legislative power was finally established and its necessity may be henceforward regarded as a demonstrated truth this theory, which was nearly unknown to the republics of antiquity, which was introduced into the world almost by accident, like so many other great truths, and misunderstood by several modern nations, is at length become an axiom in the political science of the present age. Executive Power of the State Office of Governor in an American State The place he occupies in relation to the legislature His rights and his duties His dependence on the people the executive power of the state may with truth be said to be represented by the governor, although he enjoys but a portion of its rights. The supreme magistrate, under the title of governor, is the official moderator and counselor of the legislature. He is armed with a veto or suspensive power, which allows him to stop, or at least to retard, its movements at pleasure. He lays the wants of the country before the legislative body, and points out the means which he thinks may be usefully employed in providing for them. 
he is the natural executor of its decrees in all the undertakings which interest the nation at large. In the absence of the legislature, the governor is bound to take all necessary steps to guard the state against violent shocks and unforeseen dangers. The whole military power of the state is at the disposal of the governor. He is the commander of the militia and head of the armed forces. When the authority, which is by general consent awarded to the laws, is disregarded, the governor puts himself at the head of the armed forces of the state to quell resistance and to restore order. Lastly, the governor takes no share in the administration of townships and counties, except it be indirectly in the nomination of justices of the peace, which nomination he has not the power to cancel. The governor is an elected magistrate, and is generally chosen for one or two years only, so that he always continues to be strictly dependent upon the majority who returned him. Political Effects of the System of Local Administration in the United States Necessary distinction between the general centralization of government and the centralization of the local administration. Local administration not centralized in the United States. Great general centralization of the government. Some bad consequences resulting to the United States from the local administration. Administrative advantages attending this order of things. The power which conducts the government is less regular, less enlightened, less learned, but much greater than in Europe. Political advantage of this order of things. In the United States, the interests of the country are everywhere kept in view. Support given to the government by the community. Provincial institutions more necessary in proportion as the social condition becomes more democratic. Reason of this. Centralization has become a word of general and daily use, without any precise meaning being attached to it. Nevertheless, there exist two distinct kinds of centralization, which it is necessary to discriminate with accuracy. Certain interests are common to all parts of a nation, such as the enactment of its general laws and the maintenance of its foreign relations. Other interests are peculiar to certain parts of the nation, such for interests as the business of two different townships. When the power which directs the general interests is centered in one place or vested in the same persons, it constitutes a central government. In like manner, the power of directing partial or local interests when brought together into one place constitutes what may be termed a central administration. Upon some points, these two kinds of centralization coalesce, but by classifying the objects which fall more particularly within the province of each of them, they may be easily distinguished. It is evident that a central government acquires immense power when united to administrative centralization. Thus combined, it accustoms men to set their own will habitually and completely aside, to submit not only for once or upon one point, but in every respect and at all times. Not only, therefore, does this union of power subdue them compulsorily, but it affects them in the ordinary habits of life, and influences each individual first separately and then collectively. These two kinds of centralization mutually assist and attract each other but they must not be supposed to be inseparable. It is impossible to imagine a more completely central government than that which existed in France under Louis the Fourteenth, when the same individual was the author and the interpreter of the laws, and the representative of France at home and abroad. He was justified in asserting that the state was identified with his person. Nevertheless, the administration was much less centralized under Louis the Fourteenth than it is at the present day. In England, the centralization of the government is carried to great perfection. The state has the compact vigor of a man, and by the sole act of its will it puts immense engines in motion, and wields or collects the efforts of its authority. Indeed, I cannot conceive that a nation can enjoy a secure or prosperous existence without a powerful centralization of government. But I am of opinion that a central administration enervates the nations in which it exists by incessantly diminishing their public spirit. If such an administration succeeds in condensing, at a given moment, on a given point, all the disposable resources of a people, it impairs at least the renewal of those resources. 
It may ensure a victory in the hour of strife, but it gradually relaxes the sinews of strength. It may contribute admirably to the transient greatness of a man, but it cannot ensure the durable prosperity of a nation. If we pay proper attention, we shall find that whenever it is said that a state cannot act because it has no central point, it is the centralization of the government in which it is deficient. It is frequently asserted, and we are prepared to assent to the proposition, that the German Empire was never able to bring all its powers into action. But the reason was that the state was never able to enforce obedience to its general laws, because the several members of that great body always claimed the right, or found the means, of refusing their cooperation to the representatives of the common authority, even in the affairs which concerned the mass of the people. In other words, because there was no centralization of government. This same remark is applicable to the Middle Ages. The cause of all the confusion of feudal society was that the control, not only of local but of general interests, was divided amongst a thousand hands, and broken up in a thousand different ways. The absence of a central government prevented the nations of Europe from advancing with energy in any straightforward course. We have shown that in the United States no central administration and no dependent series of public functionaries exist. Local authority has been carried to lengths which no European nation could endure without great inconvenience and which has even produced some disadvantageous consequences in America. But in the United States the centralization of the government is complete, and it would be easy to prove that the national power is more compact than it has ever been in the old nations of Europe. Not only is there but one legislative body in each state, not only does there exist but one source of political authority, but district assemblies and county courts have not in general been multiplied, lest they should be tempted to exceed their administrative duties and interfere with the government. In America the legislature of each state is supreme. Nothing can impede its authority. Neither privileges, nor local immunities, nor personal influence, nor even the empire of reason, since it represents that majority which claims to be the sole organ of reason. Its own determination is, therefore, the only limit to this action. In juxtaposition to it, and under its immediate control, is the representative of the executive power, whose duty it is to constrain the refractories to submit by superior force. The only symptom of weakness lies in certain details of the action of the government. The American republics have no standing armies to intimidate a discontented minority. But as no minority has yet been reduced to declare open war, the necessity of an army has not been felt. The state usually employs the officers of the township or the county to deal with the citizen. Thus, for instance, in New England, the assessor fixes the rate of taxes, the collector receives them, the town treasurer transmits the amount to the public treasury, and the disputes which may arise are brought before the ordinary courts of justice. This method of collecting taxes is slow as well as inconvenient and it would prove a perpetual hindrance to a government whose pecuniary demands were large. It is desirable that, in whatever materially affects its existence, the government should be served by officers of its own, appointed by itself, removable at pleasure, and accustomed to rapid methods of proceeding. But it will always be easy for the central government, organized as it is in America, to introduce new and more efficacious modes of action proportioned to its wants. The absence of a central government will not, then, as has often been asserted, prove the destruction of the republics of the New World. Far from supposing that the American governments are not sufficiently centralized, I shall prove hereafter that they are too much so. The legislative bodies daily encroach upon the authority of the government, and their tendency, like that of the French Convention, is to appropriate it entirely to themselves. Under these circumstances the social power is constantly changing hands, because it is subordinate to the power of the people, which is too apt to forget the maxims of wisdom and of foresight in the consciousness of its strength. Hence arises its danger, and thus its vigor, and not its impotence, which will probably be the cause of its ultimate destruction. The system of local administration produces several different effects in America. The Americans seem to me to have outstepped the limits of sound policy in isolating the administration of the government. 
for order, even in second-rate affairs, is a matter of national importance. As the State has no administrative functionaries of its own, stationed on different points of its territory to whom it can give a common impulse, the consequence is that it rarely attempts to issue any general police regulations. The want of these regulations is severely felt, and is frequently observed by Europeans. The appearance of disorder which prevails on the surface leads him, at first, to imagine that society is in a state of anarchy nor does he perceive his mistake till he has gone deeper into the subject. Certain undertakings are of importance to the whole state, but they cannot be put in execution because there is no national administration to direct them. Abandoned to the exertions of the towns or counties, under the care of elected or temporary agents, they lead to no result, or at least to no durable benefit. The partisans of centralization in Europe are wont to maintain that the government directs the affairs of each locality better than the citizens could do it for themselves. This may be true when the central power is enlightened, and when the local districts are ignorant, when it is as alert as they are slow, when it is accustomed to act and they to obey. Indeed, it is evident that this double tendency must augment with the increase of centralization, and that the readiness of the one and the incapacity of the others must become more and more prominent. But I deny that such is the case when the people is as enlightened, as awake to its interests, and as accustomed to reflect on them as the Americans are. I am persuaded, on the contrary, that in this case the collective strength of the citizens will always conduce more efficaciously to the public welfare than the authority of the government. It is difficult to point out with certainty the means of arousing a sleeping population, and of giving it passions and knowledge which it does not possess. It is, I am well aware, an arduous task to persuade men to busy themselves about their own affairs, and it would frequently be easier to interest them in the punctilios of court etiquette than in the repairs of their common dwelling. But whenever a central administration affects to supersede the persons most interested, I am inclined to suppose that it is either misled or desirous to mislead. However enlightening and however skillful a central power may be, it cannot of itself embrace all the details of the existence of a great nation. Such vigilance exceeds the powers of man, and when it attempts to create and set in motion so many complicated springs, it must submit to a very imperfect result or consume itself in bootless efforts. Centralization succeeds more easily, indeed, in subjecting the external actions of men to a certain uniformity, which at least commands our regard, independently of the objects to which it is applied, like those devotees who worship the statue and forget the deity it represents. Centralization imparts without difficulty an admirable regularity to the routine of business, provides for the details of the social police with sagacity, represses the smallest disorder and the most petty misdemeanors, maintains society in a status quo alike secure from improvement and decline, and perpetuates a drowsy precision in the conduct of affairs, which is hailed by the heads of the administration as a sign of perfect order and public tranquillity. In short, it excels more in prevention than in action. Its force deserts it when society is to be disturbed or accelerated in its course, and if once the cooperation of private citizens is necessary to the furtherance of its measures, the secret of its impotence is disclosed. Even whilst it invokes their assistance, it is on the condition that they shall act exactly as much as the government chooses, and exactly in the manner it appoints. They are to take charge of the details without aspiring to guide the system. They are to work in a dark and subordinate sphere, and only to judge the acts in which they have themselves cooperated by their results. These, however, are not conditions on which the alliance of the human will is to be obtained. Its carriage must be free, and its actions responsible, or, such is the constitution of man, the citizen had rather remain a passive spectator than a dependent actor in schemes with which he is unacquainted. It is undeniable that the want of those uniform regulations which control the conduct of every inhabitant of France is not unfrequently felt in the United States. Gross instances of social indifference and neglect are to be met with, and from time to time disgraceful blemishes are to be seen in complete contrast with the surrounding civilization. 
Useful undertakings which cannot succeed without perpetual attention and rigorous exactitude are very frequently abandoned in the end. For in America, as well as in other countries, the people is subject to sudden impulses and momentary exertions. The European who is accustomed to find a functionary always at hand to interfere with all he undertakes has some difficulty in accustoming himself to the complex mechanisms of the administration of the townships. In general it may be affirmed that the lesser details of the police, which render life easy and comfortable, are neglected in America, but that the essential guarantees of man in society are as strong there as elsewhere. In America the power which conducts the government is far less regular, less enlightened, and less learned, but an hundredfold more authoritative than in Europe. In no country in the world do the citizens make such exertions for the common weal, and I am acquainted with no people which has established schools as numerous and as efficacious, places of public worship better suited to the wants of the inhabitants, or roads kept in better repair uniformity or permanence of design, the minute arrangements of details, and the perfection of an ingenious administration, must not be sought for in the United States. But it will be easy to find, on the other hand, the symptoms of a power which, if it is somewhat barbarous, is at least robust, and of an existence which is checkered with accidents indeed, but cheered at the same time by animation and effort." Granting for an instant that the villages and counties of the United States would be more usefully governed by a remote authority, which they had never seen, than by functionaries taken from the midst of them, admitting for the sake of argument that the country would be more secure, and that the resources of society better employed if the whole administration centered in a single arm, still the political advantages which the Americans derive from their system would induce me to prefer it to the contrary plan. It profits me but little, after all, that a vigilant authority should protect the tranquillity of my pleasures, and constantly avert all dangers from my path, without my care or my concern, if this same authority is the absolute mistress of my liberty and of my life, and if it so monopolizes all the energy of existence, that when it languishes, everything languishes around it, that when it sleeps, everything must sleep, that when it dies, the state itself must perish." In certain countries of Europe the natives consider themselves as a kind of settlers, indifferent to the fate of the spot upon which they live. The greatest changes are effected without their concurrence, and, unless chance may have apprised them of the event, without their knowledge. Nay more, the citizen is unconcerned as to the condition of his village, the police of his street, the repairs of the church or of the parsonage, for he looks upon all these things as unconnected with himself and as the property of a powerful stranger whom he calls the government. He has only a life interest in these possessions, and he entertains no notions of ownership or of improvement. This want of interest in his own affairs goes so far that, if his own safety or that of his children is in danger, instead of trying to avert the peril, he will fold his arms and wait till the nation comes to his assistance. This same individual, who has so completely sacrificed his own free will, has no natural propensity to obedience. He cowers, it is true, before the pettiest officer, but he braves the law with the spirit of a conquered foe as soon as its superior force is removed. His oscillations between servitude and license are perpetual. When a nation has arrived at this state, it must either change its customs and its laws or perish. The source of public virtue is dry, and though it may contain subjects, the race of citizens is extinct. Such communities are a natural prey to foreign conquests, and if they do not disappear from the scene of life, it is because they are surrounded by other nations, similar or inferior to themselves. It is because the instinctive feeling of their country's claim still exists in their hearts, and because an involuntary pride in the name it bears or a vague reminiscence of its bygone fame, suffices to give them the impulse of self-preservation. Nor can the prodigious exertions made by tribes in the defense of a country to which they did not belong be adduced in favor of such a system, for it will be found that in these cases their main incitement was religion. The permanence, the glory, or the prosperity of the nation were become parts of their faith, and in defending the country they inhabited they defended that holy city of which they were all citizens. 
The Turkish tribes have never taken an active share in the conduct of the affairs of society, but they accomplished stupendous enterprises as long as the victories of the Sultan were the triumphs of the Mohammedan faith. In the present age they are in rapid decay because their religion is departing and despotism only remains. Montesquieu, who attributed to absolute power and authority peculiar to itself, did it, as I conceived, an undeserved honor, for despotism taken by itself can produce no durable results. On close inspection we shall find that religion and not fear has ever been the cause of the long-lived prosperity of an absolute government. Whatever exertions may be made, no true power can be founded among men which does not depend on the free union of their inclinations, and patriotism and religion are the only two motives in the world which can permanently direct the whole of a body politic to one end. Laws cannot succeed in rekindling the ardor of an extinguished faith, but men may be interested in the fate of their country by the laws. By this influence the vague impulse of patriotism, which never abandons the human heart, may be directed and revived, and if it be connected with the thoughts, the passions, and the daily habits of life, it may be consolidated into a durable and rational sentiment. Let it not be said that the time for the experiment is already past, for the old age of nations is not like the old age of men and every fresh generation is a new people ready for the care of the legislator. It is not the administrative, but the political effects of the local system that I most admire in America. In the United States, the interests of the country are everywhere kept in view. They are an object of solicitude to the people of the whole Union, and every citizen is as warmly attached to them as if they were his own. He takes pride in the glory of his nation, he boasts of its success, to which he conceives himself to have contributed, and he rejoices in the general prosperity by which he profits. The feeling he entertains toward the state is analogous to that which unites him to his family, and it is by a kind of egotism that he interests himself in the welfare of his country. The European generally submits to a public officer because he represents a superior force, but to an American he represents a right. In America it may be said that no one renders obedience to a man, but to justice and to law. If the opinion which the citizen entertains of himself is exaggerated, it is at least salutary, he unhesitatingly confides in his own powers, which appear to him to be all-sufficient. When a private individual meditates an undertaking, however directly connected it may be with the welfare of society, he never thinks of soliciting the cooperation of the government but he publishes his plan, offers to execute it himself, courts the assistance of other individuals, and struggles manfully against all obstacles. Undoubtedly he is often less successful than the State might have been in his position, but in the end the sum of these private undertakings far exceeds all that the government could have done. As the administrative authority is within the reach of the citizens, whom it in some degree represents, it excites neither their jealousy nor their hatred. As its resources are limited, every one feels that he must not rely solely on its assistance. Thus, when the administration thinks fit to interfere, it is not abandoned to itself as in Europe. The duties of the private citizens are not supposed to have lapsed because the state assists in their fulfillment, but every one is ready, on the contrary, to guide and to support it. This action of individual exertions, joined to that of the public authorities, frequently performs what the most energetic central administration would be unable to execute. It would be easy to adduce several facts in proof of what I advance, but I had rather give only one, with which I am more thoroughly acquainted. In America the means which the authorities have at their disposal for the discovery of crimes and the arrest of criminals are few. The state police does not exist, and passports are unknown. The criminal police of the United States cannot be compared to that of France. The magistrates and public prosecutors are not numerous, and the examinations of prisoners are rapid and oral. Nevertheless, in no country does crime more rarely elude punishment. The reason is that everyone conceives himself to be interested in furnishing evidence of the act committed, and in stopping the delinquent. 
During my stay in the United States I witnessed the spontaneous formation of committees for the pursuit and prosecution of a man who had committed a great crime in a certain county. In Europe a criminal is an unhappy being who is struggling for his life against the ministers of justice, whilst the population is merely a spectator of the conflict. In America he is looked upon as an enemy of the human race, and the whole of mankind is against him. I believe that provincial institutions are useful to all nations, but nowhere do they appear to me to be more indispensable than amongst a democratic people. In an aristocracy, order can always be maintained in the midst of liberty, and as the rulers have a great deal to lose, order is to them a first-rate consideration. In like manner, an aristocracy protects the people from the excesses of despotism, because it always possesses an organized power ready to resist a despot. But a democracy without provincial institutions has no security against these evils. How can a populace, unaccustomed to freedom in small concerns, learn to use it temperately in great affairs? What resistance can be offered to tyranny in a country where every private individual is impotent, and where the citizens are united by no common tie? Those who dread the license of the mob, and those who fear the rule of absolute power, alike to desire the progressive growth of provincial liberties. On the other hand, I am convinced that democratic nations are most exposed to fall beneath the yoke of a central administration for several reasons, amongst which is the following. The constant tendency of these nations is to concentrate all the strength of the government in the hands of the only power which directly represents the people because beyond the people nothing is to be perceived but a mass of equal individuals confounded together. But when the same power is already in possession of all the attributes of the government, it can scarcely refrain from penetrating into the details of the administration. And an opportunity of doing so is sure to present itself in the end, as was the case in France. In the French Revolution there were two impulses in opposite directions, which must never be confounded. The one was favorable to liberty, the other to despotism. Under the ancient monarchy the king was the sole author of the laws, and below the power of the sovereign certain vestiges of provincial institutions, half destroyed, were still distinguishable. These provincial institutions were incoherent, ill-compacted, and frequently absurd. In the hands of the aristocracy they had sometimes been converted into instruments of oppression. The revolution declared itself the enemy of royalty and of provincial institutions at the same time. It confounded all that had preceded it, despotic power and the checks to its abuses, in indiscriminate hatred, and its tendency was at once to overthrow and decentralize. This double character of the French Revolution is a fact which has been adroitly handled by the friends of absolute power. Can they be accused of laboring in the cause of despotism when they are defending that central administration which was one of the great innovations of the revolution? In this manner, popularity may be conciliated with hostility to the rights of the people, and the secret slave of tyranny may be the professed admirer of freedom. I have visited the two nations in which the system of provincial liberty has been most perfectly established, and I have listened to the opinions of different parties in those countries. In America I met with men who secretly aspired to destroy the democratic institutions of the Union. In England I found others who attacked the aristocracy openly, but I know of no one who does not regard provincial independence as a great benefit. In both countries I have heard a thousand different causes assigned for the evils of the state, but the local system was never mentioned amongst them. I have heard citizens attribute the power and prosperity of their country to a multitude of reasons, but they all place the advantages of local institutions in the foremost rank. Am I to suppose that when men who are naturally so divided on religious opinions and on political theories agree on one point, and that one of which they have daily experience, they are all in error? The only nations which deny the utility of provincial liberties are those which have fewest of them. In other words, those who are unacquainted with the institution are the only persons who pass a censure upon it.
Chapter Six of Democracy in America, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Democracy in America, Volume One, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter Six: Judicial Power in the United States. Chapter Summary The Anglo-Americans have retained the characteristics of judicial power which are common to all nations. They have, however, made it a powerful political organ. How? In what the judicial system of the Anglo-Americans differs from that of all other nations? Why the American judges have the right of declaring the laws to be unconstitutional? How they use this right? Precautions taken by the legislator to prevent its abuse judicial power in the United States and its influence on political society. I have thought it essential to devote a separate chapter to the judicial authorities of the United States, lest their great political importance should be lessened in the reader's eyes by a merely incidental mention of them. Confederations have existed in other countries beside America, and republics have not been established upon the shores of the New World alone. The representative system of government has been adopted in several states of Europe, but I am not aware that any nation of the globe has hitherto organized a judicial power on the principle now adopted by the Americans. The judicial organization of the United States is the institution which a stranger has the greatest difficulty in understanding. He hears the authority of a judge invoked in the political occurrences of every day, and he naturally concludes that in the United States the judges are important political functionaries. Nevertheless, when he examines the nature of the tribunals, they offer nothing which is contrary to the usual habits and privileges of those bodies, and the magistrates seem to him to interfere in public affairs of chance, but by a chance which recurs every day. When the Parliament of Paris remonstrated or refused to enregister an edict, or when it summit a functionary accused of malversation to its bar, its political influence as a judicial body was clearly visible. But nothing of the kind is to be seen in the United States. The Americans have retained all the ordinary characteristics of judicial authority, and have carefully restricted its action to the ordinary circle of its functions. The first characteristic of judicial power in all nations is the duty of arbitration. But rights must be contested in order to warrant the interference of a tribunal, and an action must be brought to obtain the decision of a judge. As long, therefore, as the law is uncontested, the judicial authority is not called upon to discuss it, and it may exist without being perceived. When a judge in a given case attacks a law relating to that case, he extends the circle of his customary duties, without, however, stepping beyond it. Since he is in some measure obliged to decide upon the law in order to decide the case. But if he pronounces upon a law without resting upon a case, he clearly steps beyond his sphere and invades that of the legislative authority. The second characteristic of judicial power is that it pronounces on special cases, and not upon general principles. If a judge, in deciding a particular point, destroys a general principle by passing a judgment which tends to reject all the inferences from that principle, and consequently to annul it, he remains within the ordinary limits of his functions. But, if he directly attacks a general principle without having a particular case in view, he leaves the circle in which all nations have agreed to confine his authority. He assumes a more important, and perhaps a more useful, influence than that of the magistrate, but he ceases to be the representative of the judicial power. The third characteristic of the judicial power is its inability to act unless it is appealed to or until it has taken cognizance of an affair. This characteristic is less general than the other two, but, notwithstanding the exceptions, I think it may be regarded as essential. The judicial power is by its nature devoid of action. 
it must be put in motion in order to produce a result. When it is called upon to repress a crime, it punishes the criminal. When a wrong is to be redressed, it is ready to redress it. When an act requires interpretation, it is prepared to interpret it. But it does not pursue criminals, hunt out wrongs, or examine into evidence of its own accord. A judicial functionary who should open proceedings and usurp the censorship of the laws would in some measure do violence to the passive nature of his authority. The Americans have retained these three distinguishing characteristics of the judicial power. An American judge can only pronounce a decision when litigation has arisen. He is only conversant with special cases, and he cannot act until the cause has been duly brought before the court. His position is therefore perfectly similar to that of the magistrate of other nations, and he is nevertheless invested with immense political power. If the sphere of his authority and his means of action are the same as those of other judges, it may be asked whence he derives a power which they do not possess. The cause of this difference lies in the simple fact that the Americans have acknowledged the right of the judges to found their decisions on the Constitution rather than on the laws. In other words, they have left them at liberty not to apply such laws as may appear to them to be unconstitutional. I am aware that a similar right has been claimed, but claimed in vain, by courts of justice in other countries. But in America it is recognized by all authorities, and not a party, nor so much as an individual, is found to contest it. This fact can only be explained by the principles of the American Constitution. In France the Constitution is, or at least is supposed to be, immutable and the received theory is that no power has the right of changing any part of it. In England, the Parliament has an acknowledged right to modify the Constitution. As, therefore, the Constitution may undergo perpetual changes, it does not in reality exist. The Parliament is at once a legislative and a constituent assembly. The political theories of America are more simple and more rational. An American Constitution is not supposed to be immutable, as in France nor is it susceptible of modification by the ordinary powers of society as in England. It constitutes a detached whole, which, as it represents the determination of the whole people, is no less binding on the legislator than on the private citizen, but which may be altered by the will of the people in predetermined cases, according to established rules. In America, the Constitution may therefore vary, but as long as it exists, it is the origin of all authority, and the sole vehicle of the predominating force. It is easy to perceive in what manner these differences must act upon the position and the rights of the judicial bodies in the three countries I have cited. If in France the tribunals were authorized to disobey the laws on the ground of their being opposed to the Constitution, the supreme power would in fact be placed in their hands, since they alone would have the right of interpreting a constitution, the clauses of which can be modified by no authority. They would, therefore, take the place of the nation, and exercise as absolute a sway over society as the inherent weakness of judicial power would allow them to do. Undoubtedly, as the French judges are incompetent to declare a law to be unconstitutional, the power of changing the constitution is indirectly given to the legislative body, since no legal barrier would oppose the alterations which it might prescribe. But it is better to grant the power of changing the constitution of the people to men who represent, however imperfectly, the will of the people, than to men who represent no one but themselves. It would be still more unreasonable to invest the English judges with the right of resisting the decisions of the legislative body, since the Parliament which makes the laws also makes the constitution, and consequently a law emanating from the three powers of the state can in no case be unconstitutional. But neither of these remarks is applicable to America. In the United States the constitution governs the legislator as much as the private citizen. As it is the first of laws it cannot be modified by a law, and it is therefore just that the tribunals should obey the Constitution in preference to any law. This condition is essential to the power of the judicature, 
for to select that legal obligation by which he is most strictly bound is the natural right of every magistrate. In France the constitution is also the first of laws, and the judges have the same right to take it as the ground of their decisions. But were they to exercise this right, they must perforce encroach on rights more sacred than their own, namely on those of society, in whose name they are acting. In this case, the state motive clearly prevails over the motives of an individual. In America, where the nation can always reduce its magistrates to obedience by changing its constitution, no danger of this kind is to be feared. Upon this point, therefore, the political and the logical reasons agree, and the people as well as the judges preserve their privileges. Whenever a law which the judge holds to be unconstitutional is argued in a tribunal of the United States, he may refuse to admit it as a rule. This power is the only one which is peculiar to the American magistrate, but it gives rise to immense political influence. Few laws can escape the surging analysis of the judicial power for any length of time, for there are few which are not prejudicial to some private interest or other and none which may not be brought before a court of justice by the choice of parties or by the necessity of the case. But from the time that a judge has refused to apply any given law in a case, that law loses a portion of its moral cogency. The persons to whose interests it is prejudicial learn that means exist of evading its authority, and similar suits are multiplied until it becomes powerless. One of two alternatives must then be resorted to. The people must alter the constitution, or the legislator must repeal the law. The political power which the Americans have entrusted to their courts of justice is therefore immense, but the evils of this power are considerably diminished by the obligation which has been opposed of attacking the laws through the courts of justice alone. If the judge had been empowered to contest the laws on the ground of theoretical generalities, if he had been enabled to open an attack or to pass a censure on the legislator, he would have played a prominent part in the political sphere. And as the champion or the antagonist of a party, he would have arrayed the hostile passions of the nation in the conflict. But when a judge contests a law applied to some particular case in an obscure proceeding, the importance of his attack is concealed from the public gaze. His decision bears upon the interest of an individual, and if the law is slighted, it is only collaterally. Moreover, although it is censured, it is not abolished. Its moral force may be diminished, but its cogency is by no means suspended, and its final destruction can only be accomplished by the reiterated attacks of judicial functionaries. It will readily be understood that by connecting the censorship of the laws with the private interests of members of the community, and by intimately uniting the prosecution of the law with the prosecution of an individual, legislation is protected from wanton assailants and from the daily aggressions of party spirit. The errors of the legislator are exposed whenever their evil consequences are most felt, and it is always a positive and appreciable fact which serves as the basis of a prosecution. I am inclined to believe this practice of the American courts to be at once the most favorable to liberty as well as to public order. If the judge could only attack the legislator openly and directly, he would sometimes be afraid to oppose any resistance to his will, and at other moments party spirit might encourage him to brave it at every turn. The laws would consequently be attacked when the power from which they emanate is weak and obeyed when it is strong. That is to say, when it would be useful to respect them, they would be contested, and when it would be easy to convert them into an instrument of oppression, they would be respected. But the American judge is brought into the political arena independently of his own will. He only judges the law because he is obliged to judge a case. The political question which he is called upon to resolve is connected with the interest of the suitors, and he cannot refuse to decide it without abdicating the duties of his post. He performs his functions as a citizen by fulfilling the precise duties which belong to his profession as a magistrate. 
It is true that upon this system the judicial censorship which is exercised by the courts of justice over the legislation cannot extend to all laws indiscriminately, inasmuch as some of them can never give rise to that exact species of contestation which is termed a lawsuit. And even when such a contestation is possible, it may happen that no one cares to bring it before a court of justice. The Americans have often felt this disadvantage, but they have left the remedy incomplete, lest they should give it an efficacy which might in some cases prove dangerous. Within these limits the power vested in the American courts of justice of pronouncing a statute to be unconstitutional forms one of the most powerful barriers which has ever been devised against the tyranny of political assemblies. Other Powers Granted to American Judges In the United States, all the citizens have the right of indicting public functionaries before the ordinary tribunals. How they use this right. Article 75 of the French Constitution of the Year 8. The Americans and the English cannot understand the purport of this clause. It is perfectly natural that in a free country like America all the citizens should have the right of indicting public functionaries before the ordinary tribunals, and that all the judges should have the power of punishing public offenses. The right granted to the courts of justice of judging the agents of the executive government when they have violated the laws is so natural a one that it cannot be looked upon as an extraordinary privilege. Nor do the springs of government appear to me to be weakened in the United States by the customs which renders all public officers responsible to the judges of the land. The Americans seem, on the contrary, to have increased by this means that respect which is due to the authorities, and at the same time to have rendered those who are in power more scrupulous of offending public opinion. I was struck by the small number of political trials which occur in the United States, but I had no difficulty in accounting for this circumstance. A lawsuit, of whatever nature it may be, is always a difficult and expensive undertaking. It is easy to attack a public man in a journal, but the motives which can warrant an action at law must be serious. A solid ground of complaint must therefore exist to induce an individual to prosecute a public officer and public officers are careful not to furnish these grounds of complaint when they are afraid of being prosecuted. This does not depend upon the republican form of American institutions, for the same facts present themselves in England. These two nations do not regard the impeachment of the principal officers of state as a sufficient guarantee of their independence, but they hold that the right of minor prosecutions, which are within the reach of the whole community, is a better pledge of freedom than those great judicial actions which are rarely employed until it is too late. In the Middle Ages, when it was very difficult to overtake offenders, the judges inflicted the most dreadful tortures on the few who were arrested, which by no means diminished the number of crimes. It has since been discovered that when justice is more certain and more mild, it is at the same time more efficacious. The English and the Americans hold that tyranny and oppression are to be treated like any other crime, by lessening the penalty and facilitating conviction. In the year 8 of the French Republic, a constitution was drawn up in which the following clause was introduced. Article 75 all the agents of the government below the rank of ministers can only be prosecuted for offences relating to their several functions by virtue of a decree of the Conseil d'État, in which case the prosecution takes place before the ordinary tribunals. This clause survived the Constitution de l'Anhuit, and it is still maintained in spite of the just complaints of the nation. I have always found the utmost difficulty in explaining its meaning to Englishmen or Americans. They were at once led to conclude that the Conseil d'État in France was a great tribunal, established in the centre of the kingdom, which exercised a preliminary and somewhat tyrannical jurisdiction in all political causes. But when I told them that the Conseil d'État was not a judicial body in the common sense of the term, but an administrative council composed of men dependent on the crown, so that the king, after having ordered one of his servants, called a prefect, to commit an injustice, has the power of commanding another of his servants, 
called a councillor of state, to prevent the former from being punished. When I demonstrated to them that the citizen who has been injured by the order of the sovereign is obliged to solicit from the sovereign permission to obtain redress, they refused to credit so flagrant an abuse, and were tempted to accuse me of falsehood or of ignorance. It frequently happened before the revolution that a parliament issued a warrant against a public officer who had committed an offence, and sometimes the proceedings were stopped by the authority of the crown, which enforced compliance with its absolute and despotic will. It is painful to perceive how much lower we are sunk than our forefathers, since we allow things to pass under the colour of justice and the sanction of the law, which Chapter 7 of Democracy in America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Democracy in America, Volume 1 by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 7 Political Jurisdiction in the United States. Chapter Summary Definition of Political Jurisdiction. What is understood by political jurisdiction in France, in England, and in the United States? In America, the political judge can only pass sentence on public officers. He more frequently passes a sentence of removal from office than a penalty. Political jurisdiction, as it exists in the United States, is, notwithstanding its mildness, and perhaps in consequence of that mildness, a most powerful instrument in the hands of the majority. Political Jurisdiction in the United States I understand by political jurisdiction that temporary right of pronouncing a legal decision with which a political body may be invested. In absolute government, no utility can accrue from the introduction of extraordinary forms of procedure. The prince in whose name an offender is prosecuted is as much the sovereign of the courts of justice as of everything else, and the idea which is entertained of his power is of itself a sufficient security. The only thing he has to fear is that the external formalities of justice should be neglected, and that his authority should be dishonoured from a wish to render it more absolute. But in most free countries, in which the majority can never exercise the same influence upon the tribunals as an absolute monarch, the judicial power has occasionally been vested for a time in the representatives of the nation, it has been thought better to introduce a temporary confusion between the functions of the different authority than to violate the necessary principle of the unity of government. England, France, and the United States have established this political jurisdiction by law, and it is curious to examine the different adaptations which these three great nations have made of the principle. In England and in France, the House of Lords and the Chambre de Paris constitute the highest criminal court of their respective nations, and although they do not habitually try all political offences, they are competent to try them all. Another political body enjoys the right of impeachment before the House of Lords. The only difference which exists between the two countries in this respect is that in England the Commons may impeach whomsoever they please before the Lords, while in France the deputies can only employ this mode of persecution against the ministers of the crown. In both countries the upper house may make use of all the existing penal laws of the nation to punish the delinquents. In the United States, as well as in Europe, one branch of the legislature is authorized to impeach and another to judge. The House of Representatives arraigns the offender, and the Senate awards a sentence but the Senate can only try such persons as are brought before it by the House of Representatives, and those persons must belong to the class of public functionaries. Thus the jurisdiction of the Senate is less extensive than that of the peers of France, whilst the right of impeachment by the representatives is more general than that of the deputies. But the great difference which exists between Europe and America is that in Europe Political tribunals are empowered to inflict all the dispositions of the penal code, while in America, when they have deprived the offender of his official rank, and have declared him incapable of filling any political office for the future, 
their jurisdiction terminates and that of the ordinary tribunals begins. Suppose, for instance, that the President of the United States has committed the crime of high treason. The House of Representatives impeaches him, and the Senate degrades him. He must then be tried by a jury, which alone can deprive him of his liberty or his life. This accurately illustrates the subject we are treating. The political jurisdiction which is established by the laws of Europe is intended to try great offenders, whatever may be their birth, their rank, or their powers in the State, and to this end all the privileges of the courts of justice are temporarily extended to a great political assembly. The legislator is then transformed into the magistrate. He is called upon to admit, to distinguish, and to punish the offence and as he exercises all the authority of a judge, the law restricts him to the observance of all the duties of that high office, and of all the formalities of justice. When a public functionary is impeached before an English or French political tribunal, and is found guilty, the sentence deprives him ipso facto of his functions, and it may pronounce him to be incapable of resuming them, or any others, for the future. But in this case the political interdict is a consequence of the sentence, and not the sentence itself. In Europe, the sentence of a political tribunal is to be regarded as a judicial verdict, rather than as an administrative measure. In the United States, the contrary takes place. And although the decision of the Senate is judicial in its form, since the senators are obliged to comply with the practices and formalities of a court of justice, although it is judicial in respect to the motives on which it is founded, since the Senate is in general obliged to take an offence at common law as the basis of its sentence, nevertheless the object of the proceeding is purely administrative. If it had been the intention of the American legislator to invest a political body with great judicial authority, its action would not have been limited to the circle of public functionaries, since the most dangerous enemies of the State may be in the possession of no functions at all, and this is especially true in republics, where party influence is the first of authorities, and where the strength of many a reader is increased by his exercising no legal power. If it had been the intention of the American legislator to give society the means of repressing state offences by exemplary punishment, according to the practice of ordinary justice, the resources of the penal code would all have been placed at the disposal of the political tribunals but the weapon with which they are entrusted is an imperfect one, and it can never reach the most dangerous offenders, since men who aim at the entire subversion of the laws are not likely to murmur at a political interdict. The main object of the political jurisdiction which obtains in the United States is, therefore, to deprive the ill-disposed citizen of an authority which he has used amiss, and to prevent him from ever acquiring it again. This is evidently an administrative measure sanctioned by the formalities of a judicial decision. In this matter, the Americans have created a mixed system. They have surrounded the act which removes a public functionary with the securities of a political trial, and they have deprived all political condemnations of their severest penalties. Every link of the system may easily be traced from this point. We at once perceive why the American constitutions subject all the civil functionaries to the jurisdiction of the Senate, whilst the military, whose crimes are nevertheless more formidable, are exempted from that tribunal. In the civil service none of the American functionaries can be said to be removable. The places which some of them occupy are inalienable, and the others are chosen for a term which cannot be shortened. It is therefore necessary to try them all in order to deprive them of their authority. But military officers are dependent on the chief magistrate of the state, who is himself a civil functionary, and the decision which condemns him is a blow upon them all. If we now compare the American and the European systems, we shall meet with differences no less striking in the different effects which each of them produces or may produce. In France and in England, the jurisdiction of political bodies is looked upon as an extraordinary resource, which is only to be employed in order to rescue society from unwanted dangers. It is not to be denied that these tribunals, as they are constituted in Europe, are apt to violate the conservative principle of the balance of power in the state, and to threaten incessantly the lives and liberties of the subject. The same political jurisdiction in the United States is only indirectly hostile to the balance of power. 
it cannot menace the lives of the citizens, and it does not hover, as in Europe, over the heads of the community, since those only who have submitted to its authority on accepting office are exposed to the severity of its investigations. It is at the same time less formidable and less efficacious. Indeed, it has not been considered by the legislators of the United States as a remedy for the more violent evils of society, but as an ordinary means of conducting the government. In this respect, it probably exercises more real influence on the social body in America than in Europe. We must not be misled by the apparent mildness of the American legislation in all that relates to political jurisdiction. It is to be observed, in the first place, that in the United States the tribunal which passes sentence is composed of the same elements and subject to the same influences as the body which impeaches the offender, and that this uniformity gives an almost irresistible impulse to the vindictive passions of parties. If political judges in the United States cannot inflict such heavy penalties as those of Europe, there is the less chance of their acquitting a prisoner and the conviction, if it is less formidable, is more certain. The principal object of the political tribunals of Europe is to punish the offender. The purpose of those in America is to deprive him of his authority. A political condemnation in the United States may, therefore, be looked upon as a preventive measure, and there is no reason for restricting the judges to the exact definitions of criminal law. Nothing can be more alarming than the excessive latitude with which political offences are described in the laws of America. Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution of the United States runs thus, quote, The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. End quote. Many of the constitutions of the states are even less explicit. Public officers, says the Constitution of Massachusetts, quote, shall be impeached for misconduct or maladministration, end quote. The Constitution of Virginia declares that all the civil officers who shall have offended against the state by maladministration, corruption, or other high crimes may be impeached by the House of Delegates. In some constitutions, no offences are specified in order to subject the public functionaries to an unlimited responsibility. But I will venture to affirm that it is precisely their mildness which renders the American laws most formidable in this respect. We have shown that in Europe the removal of a functionary and his political interdiction are the consequences the penalty is to undergo, and that in America they constitute the penalty itself. The consequence is that in Europe political tribunals are invested with rights which they are afraid to use, and the fear of punishing too much hinders them from punishing at all. But in America no one hesitates to inflict a penalty from which humanity does not recoil. To condemn a political opponent to death in order to deprive him of his power is to commit what all the world would execrate as a horrible assassination. But to declare that opponent unworthy to exercise that authority, to deprive him of it, and to leave him uninjured in life and limb, may be judged to be the fair issue of the struggle. But this sentence, which it is so easy to pronounce, is not the less fatally severe to the majority of those upon whom it is inflicted. Great criminals may undoubtedly brave its intangible rigour, but ordinary offenders will dread it as a condemnation which destroys their position in the world casts a blight upon their honour, and condemns them to a shameful inactivity worse than death. The influence exercised in the United States upon the progress of society by the jurisdiction of political bodies may not appear to be formidable, but it is only the more immense. It does not directly coerce the subject, but it renders the majority more absolute over those in power. It does not confer an unbounded authority on the legislator, which can be exerted at some momentous crisis, but it establishes a temperate and regular influence, which is at all times available. If the power is decreased, it can, on the other hand, be more conveniently employed and more easily abused. By preventing political tribunals from inflicting judicial punishments, the Americans seem to have eluded the worst consequences of legislative tyranny, rather than tyranny itself and I am not sure that political jurisdiction, as it is constituted in the United States, is not the most formidable weapon 
which has ever been placed in the rude grasp of a popular majority. When the American republics begin to degenerate, it will be easy to verify the truth of this observation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 8, The Federal Constitution, Part 1. I have hitherto considered each state as a separate whole, and I have explained the different springs which the people sets in motion, and the different means of action which it employs. But all the states which I have considered as independent are forced to submit, in certain cases, to the supreme authority of the Union. The time has now come for me to examine separately the supremacy with which the Union has been invested and to cast a rapid glance over the Federal Constitution. CHAPTER SUMMARY ORIGIN OF THE FIRST UNION ITS WEAKNESS CONGRESS APPEALS TO THE CONSTITUENT AUTHORITY INTERVAL OF TWO YEARS BETWEEN THIS APPEAL AND THE PROMULGATION OF THE NEW CONSTITUTION HISTORY OF THE FEDERAL CONSTITUTION the thirteen colonies which simultaneously threw off the yoke of England towards the end of the last century professed, as I have already observed, the same religion, the same language, the same customs, and almost the same laws. They were struggling against a common enemy, and these reasons were sufficiently strong to unite them one to another and to consolidate them into one nation." But as each of them had enjoyed a separate existence, and a government within its own control, the peculiar interests and customs which resulted from this system were opposed to a compact and intimate union, which would have absorbed the individual importance of each in the general importance of all. Hence arose two opposite tendencies, the one prompting the Anglo-Americans to unite, the other to divide their strength. As long as the war with the mother country lasted, the principle of union was kept alive by necessity, and although the laws which constituted it were defective, the common tie subsisted in spite of their imperfections. But no sooner was peace concluded than the faults of the legislation became manifest, and the state seemed to be suddenly dissolved. Each colony became an independent republic, and assumed an absolute sovereignty. The federal government, condemned to impotence by its constitution, and no longer sustained by the presence of a common danger, witnessed the outrages offered to its flag by the great nations of Europe, whilst it was scarcely able to maintain its ground against the Indian tribes, and to pay the interest of the debt which had been contracted during the War of Independence. It was already on the verge of destruction when it officially proclaimed its inability to conduct the government and appealed to the constituent authority of the nation. If America ever approached, for however brief a time, that lofty pinnacle of glory to which the fancy of its inhabitants is wont to point, it was at the solemn moment at which the power of the nation abdicated, as it were, the empire of the land. All ages have furnished the spectacle of a people struggling with energy to win its independence, and the efforts of the Americans in throwing off the English yoke have been considerably exaggerated. Separated from their enemies by three thousand miles of ocean, and backed by a powerful ally, the success of the United States may be more justly attributed to their geographical position than to the valor of their armies or the patriotism of their citizens. It would be ridiculous to compare the American war to the wars of the French Revolution, or the efforts of the Americans to those of the French when they were attacked by the whole of Europe, 
without credit and without allies, yet capable of opposing a twentieth part of their population to the world, and of bearing the torch of revolution beyond their frontiers, whilst they stifled its devouring flame within the bosom of their country. But it is a novelty in the history of society to see a great people turn a calm and scrutinizing eye upon itself, when apprised by the legislature that the wheels of government are stopped, to see it carefully examine the extent of the evil, and patiently wait for two whole years until a remedy was discovered, which it voluntarily adopted, without having wrung a tear or a drop of blood from mankind. At the time when the inadequacy of the first constitution was discovered, America possessed the double advantage of that calm which had succeeded the effervescence of the revolution, and of those great men who had led the revolution to a successful issue. The assembly which accepted the task of composing the second constitution was small, but George Washington was its president, and it contained the choicest talents and the noblest hearts which had ever appeared in the new world. This national commission, after long and mature deliberation, offered to the acceptance of the people the body of general laws which still rules the Union. All the states adopted it successively. The new federal government commenced its functions in 1789, after an interregnum of two years. The Revolution of America terminated when that of France began. Summary of the Federal Constitution Division of Authority Between the Federal Government and the States The Government of the States is the Rule, the Federal Government the Exception The first question which awaited the Americans was intricate and by no means easy of solution. The object was so to divide the authority of the different states which composed the Union, that each of them should continue to govern itself in all that concerned its internal prosperity, whilst the entire nation, represented by the Union, should continue to form a compact body, and to provide for the general exigencies of the people. It was as impossible to determine beforehand with any degree of accuracy the share of authority which each of two governments was to enjoy, as to foresee all the incidents in the existence of a nation. The obligations and the claims of the federal government were simple and easily definable, because the Union had been formed with the express purpose of meeting the general exigencies of the people. But the claims and obligations of the states were, on the other hand, complicated and various, because those governments had penetrated into all the details of social life. The attributes of the federal government were therefore carefully enumerated, and all that was not included amongst them was declared to constitute a part of the privileges of the several governments of the states. Thus the government of the states remained the rule, and that of the confederation became the exception. But as it was foreseen that, in practice, questions might arise as to the exact limits of this exceptional authority, and that it would be dangerous to submit these questions to the decision of the ordinary courts of justice, established in the states by the states themselves, a high federal court was created, which was destined, amongst other functions, to maintain the balance of power which had been established by the Constitution between the two rival governments. Prerogative of the Federal Government Power of declaring war, making peace, and levying general taxes vested in the Federal Government. What part of the internal policy of the country it may direct? The Government of the Union, in some respects, more central than the king's government in the old French monarchy. The external relations of a people may be compared to those of private individuals, and they cannot be advantageously maintained without the agency of a single head of a government. The exclusive right of making peace and war, of concluding treaties of commerce, of raising armies and equipping fleets, was granted to the Union. 
The necessity of a national government was less imperiously felt in the conduct of the internal policy of society, but there are certain general interests which can only be attended to with advantage by a general authority. The Union was invested with the power of controlling the monetary system, of directing the post office, and of opening the great roads which were to establish a communication between the different parts of the country. The independence of the government of each state was formally recognized in its sphere. Nevertheless, the federal government was authorized to interfere in the internal affairs of the states in a few predetermined cases in which an indiscreet abuse of their independence might compromise the security of the Union at large. Thus, whilst the power of modifying and changing their legislation at pleasure was preserved in all the republics, they were forbidden to enact ex post facto laws or to create a class of nobles in their community. Lastly, as it was necessary that the federal government should be able to fulfill its engagements, it was endowed with an unlimited power of levying taxes. In examining the balance of power as established by the Federal Constitution, in remarking on the one hand the portion of sovereignty which has been reserved to the several states, and on the other the share of power which the Union has assumed, it is evident that the Federal legislators entertained the clearest and most accurate notions on the nature of the centralization of government. The United States formed not only a republic, but a confederation. Nevertheless, the authority of the nation is more central than it was in several of the monarchies of Europe when the American Constitution was formed. Take, for instance, the two following examples. Thirteen Supreme Courts of Justice existed in France, which, generally speaking, had the right of interpreting the law without appeal, and those provinces which were styled pays d'état were authorized to refuse their assent to an impost which had been levied by the sovereign who represented the nation. In the Union there is but one tribunal to interpret, as there is one legislature to make, the laws, and an impost voted by the representatives of the nation is binding upon all the citizens. In these two essential points, therefore, the Union exercises more central authority than the French monarchy possessed, although the Union is only an assemblage of confederate republics. In Spain, certain provinces had the right of establishing a system of custom-house duties peculiar to themselves, although that privilege belongs, by its very nature, to the national sovereignty. In America, the Congress alone has the right of regulating the commercial relations of the states. The government of the Confederation is therefore more centralized in this respect than the Kingdom of Spain. It is true that the power of the crown in France or in Spain was always able to obtain by force whatever the constitution of the country denied, and that the ultimate result was consequently the same but I am here discussing the theory of the Constitution. FEDERAL POWERS After having settled the limits within which the federal government was to act, the next point was to determine the powers which it was to exert. LEGISLATIVE POWERS DIVISION OF THE LEGISLATIVE BODY INTO TWO BRANCHES Difference in the manner of forming the two houses. The principle of the independence of the states predominates in the formation of the Senate. The principle of the sovereignty of the nation in the composition of the House of Representatives. Singular effects of the fact that a constitution can only be logical in the early stages of a nation. The plan which had been laid down beforehand for the constitution of the several states was followed, in many points, in the organization of the powers of the Union. The Federal Legislature of the Union was composed of a Senate and a House of Representatives. A spirit of conciliation prescribed the observance of distinct principles in the formation of these two assemblies. 
I have already shown that two contrary interests were opposed to each other in the establishment of the Federal Constitution. These two interests had given rise to two opinions. It was the wish of one party to convert the Union into a League of Independent States, or a sort of Congress, at which the representatives of the several peoples would meet to discuss certain points of their common interests. The other party desired to unite the inhabitants of the American colonies into one sole nation, and to establish a government which should act as the sole representative of the nation as far as the limited sphere of its authority would permit. The practical consequences of these two theories were exceedingly different. The question was whether a league was to be established instead of a national government, whether the majority of the state, instead of the majority of the inhabitants of the Union, was to give the law. For every state, the small as well as the great, would then remain in the full enjoyment of its independence, and enter the Union upon a footing of perfect equality. If, however, the inhabitants of the United States were to be considered as belonging to one and the same nation, it would be just that the majority of the citizens of the Union should prescribe the law. Of course, the lesser states could not subscribe to the application of this doctrine without, in fact, abdicating their existence in relation to the sovereignty of the Confederation, since they would have passed from the condition of a co-equal and co-legislative authority to that of an insignificant fraction of a great people. But if the former system would have invested them with an excessive authority, the latter would have annulled their influence altogether. Under these circumstances the result was that the strict rules of logic were evaded, as is usually the case when interests are opposed to arguments. A middle course was hit upon by the legislators, which brought together by force two systems theoretically irreconcilable. The principle of the independence of the states prevailed in the formation of the Senate, and that of the sovereignty of the nation predominated in the composition of the House of Representatives. It was decided that each state should send two senators to Congress, and a number of representatives proportioned to its population. It results from this arrangement that the state of New York has at the present day forty representatives and only two senators. The state of Delaware has two senators and only one representative. The state of Delaware is therefore equal to the state of New York in the Senate, whilst the latter has forty times the influence of the former in the House of Representatives. Thus, if the minority of the nation preponderates in the Senate, it may paralyze the decisions of the majority represented in the other house, which is contrary to the spirit of constitutional government. These facts show how rare and how difficult it is, rationally and logically, to combine all the several parts of legislation. In the course of time different interests arise, and different principles are sanctioned by the same people. And when a general constitution is to be established, these interests and principles are so many natural obstacles to the rigorous application of any political system with all its consequences. The early stages of national existence are the only periods at which it is possible to maintain the complete logic of legislation. And when we perceive a nation in the enjoyment of this advantage, before we hasten to conclude that it is wise, we should do well to remember that it is young. When the Federal Constitution was formed, the interests of independence for the separate states, and the interest of union for the whole people, were the only two conflicting interests which existed among the Anglo-Americans, and a compromise was necessarily made between them. It is, however, just to acknowledge that this part of the Constitution has not hitherto produced those evils which might have been feared. All the states are young and contiguous. Their customs, their ideas, and their exigencies are not dissimilar, and the differences which result from their size or inferiority do not suffice to set their interests at variance. 
The small states have consequently never been induced to league themselves together in the Senate to oppose the designs of the larger ones. And indeed there is so irresistible an authority in the legitimate expression of the will of a people that the Senate could offer but a feeble opposition to the vote of the majority of the House of Representatives. It must not be forgotten, on the other hand, that it was not in the power of the American legislators to reduce to a single nation the people for whom they were making laws. The object of the federal constitution was not to destroy the independence of the states, but to restrain it. By acknowledging the real authority of the secondary communities, and it was impossible to deprive them of it, they disavowed beforehand the habitual use of constraint in enforcing the decisions of the majority. Upon this principle the introduction of the influence of the states into the mechanism of the federal government was by no means to be wondered at, since it only attested the existence of an acknowledged power which was to be humored and not forcibly checked. A FURTHER DIFFERENCE BETWEEN THE SENATE AND THE HOUSE OF REPRESENTATIVES The Senate named by the provincial legislators, the representatives by the people. Double election of the former, single election of the latter. Term of the different offices. Peculiar functions of each house. The Senate not only differs from the other house in the principle which it represents, but also in the mode of its election, in the term for which it is chosen, and in the nature of its functions. The House of Representatives is named by the people, the Senate by the legislators of each state. The former is directly elected, the latter is elected by an elected body. The term for which the representatives are chosen is only two years, that of the senators is six. The functions of the House of Representatives are purely legislative, and the only share it takes in the judicial power is in the impeachment of public officers. The Senate cooperates in the work of legislation, and tries those political offenses which the House of Representatives submits to its decision. It also acts as the great executive council of the nation. The treaties which are concluded by the President must be ratified by the Senate, and the appointments he may make must be definitely approved by the same body. Dependence of the President He is elective and responsible. He is free to act in his own sphere under the inspection, but not under the direction, of the Senate. His salary fixed at his entry into office. Suspensive veto. The American legislators undertook a difficult task in attempting to create an executive power dependent on the majority of the people, and nevertheless sufficiently strong to act without restraint in its own sphere. It was indispensable to the maintenance of the Republican form of government that the representative of the executive power should be subject to the will of the nation. The President is an elective magistrate. His honor, his property, his liberty, and his life are the securities which the people has for the temperate use of his power. But in the exercise of his authority he cannot be said to be perfectly independent. The Senate takes cognizance of his relations with foreign powers, and of the distribution of public appointments, so that he can neither be bribed, nor can he employ the means of corruption." The legislators of the Union acknowledged that the executive power would be incompetent to fulfill its task with dignity and utility, unless it enjoyed a greater degree of stability and of strength than had been granted to it in the separate states. The President is chosen for four years, and he may be re-elected, so that the chances of a prolonged administration may inspire him with hopeful undertakings for the public good, and with the means of carrying them into execution. The President was made the sole representative of the executive power of the Union, and care was taken not to render his decision subordinate to the vote of a council, a dangerous measure which tends at the same time to clog the action of the government and to diminish its responsibility. 
The Senate has the right of annulling certain acts of the President, but it cannot compel him to take any steps. Nor does it participate in the exercise of the executive power. The action of the legislature on the executive power may be direct, and we have just shown that the Americans carefully obviated this influence. But it may, on the other hand, be indirect. Public assemblies which have the power of depriving an officer of state of his salary encroach upon his independence, and as they are free to make the laws, it is to be feared lest they should gradually appropriate to themselves a portion of that authority which the Constitution has vested in his hands. This dependence of the executive power is one of the defects inherent in Republican constitutions. The Americans have not been able to counteract the tendency which legislative assemblies have to get possession of the government, but they have rendered this propensity less irresistible. The salary of the President is fixed, at the time of his entering upon office, for the whole period of his magistracy. The President is, moreover, provided with a suspensive veto, which allows him to oppose the passing of such laws as might destroy the portion of independence which the Constitution awards him. The struggle between the President and the legislature must always be an unequal one, since the latter is certain of bearing down all resistance by persevering in its plans. But the suspense of veto forces it at least to reconsider the matter, and, if the motion be persisted in, it must then be backed by a majority of two-thirds of the whole House. The veto is, in fact, a sort of appeal to the people. The executive power, which, without this security, might have been secretly oppressed, adopts this means of pleading its cause and stating its motives. But if the legislature is certain of overpowering all resistance by persevering in its plans, I reply that in the constitutions of all nations, of whatever kind they may be, a certain point exists at which the legislator is obliged to have recourse to the good sense and the virtue of his fellow citizens. This point is more prominent and more discoverable in republics, whilst it is more remote and more carefully concealed in monarchies, but it always exists somewhere. There is no country in the world in which everything can be provided for by the laws, or in which political institutions can prove a substitute for common sense and public morality. Differences between the position of the President of the United States and that of a constitutional king of France. Executive power in the United States as limited and as partial as the supremacy which it represents. Executive power in France as universal as the supremacy it represents. The king, a branch of the legislature. The president, the mere executor of the law. Other differences resulting from the duration of the two powers. The president checked in the exercise of the executive authority. The king independent in its exercise. Notwithstanding these discrepancies, France is more akin to a republic than the union to a monarchy. Comparison of the number of public officers depending upon the executive power in the two countries. The executive power has so important an influence on the destinies of nations that I am inclined to pause for an instant at this portion of my subject in order more clearly to explain the part it sustains in America. In order to form an accurate idea of the position of the President of the United States, it may not be irrelevant to compare it to that of one of the constitutional kings of Europe. In this comparison I shall pay but little attention to the external signs of power, which are more apt to deceive the eye of the observer than to guide his researches. When a monarchy is being gradually transformed into a republic, the executive power retains the titles, the honors, the etiquette, and even the funds of royalty long after its authority has disappeared. The English, after having cut off the head of one king and expelled another from the throne, 
were accustomed to accost the successor of those princes upon their knees. On the other hand, when a republic falls under the sway of a single individual, the demeanor of the sovereign is simple and unpretending, as if his authority was not yet paramount. When the emperors exercised an unlimited control over the fortunes and the lives of their fellow citizens, it was customary to call them Caesar in conversation, and they were in the habit of supping without formality at their friends' houses. It is therefore necessary to look below the surface. The sovereignty of the United States is shared between the Union and the States, whilst in France it is undivided and compact. Hence arises the first and the most notable difference which exists between the President of the United States and the King of France. In the United States the executive power is as limited and partial as the sovereignty of the Union in whose name it acts. In France it is as universal as the authority of the state. The Americans have a federal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mel Mann. Democracy in America, Volume 1 by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 7, Part 2, The Federal Constitution. This cause of inferiority results from the nature of things, but it is not the only one. The second in importance is as follows. Sovereignty may be defined to be the right of making laws. In France, the king really exercises a portion of the sovereign power, since the laws have no weight till he has given his assent to them. He is, moreover, the executor of all they ordain. The president is also the executor of the laws, but he does not really cooperate in their formation, since the refusal of his assent does not annul them. He is therefore merely to be considered as the agent of the sovereign power. But not only does the king of France exercise a portion of the sovereign power, he also contributes to the nomination of the legislature, which exercises the other portion. He has the privilege of appointing the members of one chamber, and of dissolving the other at his pleasure, whereas the President of the United States has no share in the formation of the legislative body, and cannot dissolve any part of it. The King has the same right of bringing forward measures as the chambers, a right which the President does not possess. The king is represented in each assembly by his ministers, who explain his intentions, support his opinions, and maintain the principles of the government. The president and his ministers are alike excluded from Congress, so that his influence and his opinions can only penetrate indirectly into that great body. The king of France is therefore on an equal footing with the legislature, which can no more act without him than he can without it. The president exercises an authority inferior to, and depending upon, that of the legislature. Even in the exercise of the executive power, properly so called, the point upon which his position seems to be the most analogous to that of the king of France, the president labors under several causes of inferiority. The authority of the king in France has, in the first place, the advantage of duration over that of the president, and durability is one of the chief elements of strength. Nothing is either loved or feared but what is likely to endure. The president of the United States is a magistrate elected for four years. The king in France is a hereditary sovereign. In the exercise of the executive power of the President of the United States is constantly subject to a jealous scrutiny. He may make, but he cannot conclude, a treaty. He may designate, but he cannot appoint, 
a public officer. The King of France is absolute within the limits of his authority. The President of the United States is responsible for his actions, but the person of the King is declared inviolable by the French Charter. Nevertheless, the supremacy of public opinion is no less above the head of the one than of the other. This power is less definite, less evident, and less sanctioned by the laws in France than in America, but in fact it exists. In America it acts by elections and decrees. In France it proceeds by revolutions. But notwithstanding the different constitutions of these two countries, Public opinion is the predominant authority in both of them. The fundamental principle of legislation, a principle essentially republican, is the same in both countries, although its consequences may be different and its results more or less extensive. Whence I am led to conclude that France, with its king, is nearer akin to a republic than the union, with its president, is to a monarchy. In what I've been saying, I have only touched upon the main points of distinction, and if I could have entered into details, the contrast would have been rendered still more striking. I have remarked that the authority of the President of the United States is only exercised within the limits of a partial sovereignty, whilst that of the King of France is undivided. I might have gone on to show that the power of the King's government in France exceeds its natural limits however extensive they may be, and penetrates in a thousand different ways into the administration of private interests. Amongst the examples of this influence may be quoted that which results from the great number of public functionaries who all derive their appointments from the government. This number now exceeds all previous limits. It amounts to 138,000 nominations, each of which may be considered as an element of power. The President of the United States has not the exclusive right of making any public appointments, and their whole number scarcely exceeds 12,000. Accidental Causes Which May Increase the Influence of the Executive Government External Security of the Union, Army of 6,000 Men, Few Ships, the President has no opportunity of exercising his great prerogatives. In the prerogatives he exercises, he is weak. If the executive government is feebler in America than in France, the cause is more attributable to the circumstances than to the laws of the country. It is chiefly in its foreign relations that the executive power of a nation is called upon to exert its skill and its vigor. If the existence of the Union were perpetually threatened, and if its chief interests were in daily connection with those of other powerful nations, the executive government would assume an increased importance in proportion to the measures expected of it, and those which it would carry into effect. The President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, but an army composed of only 6,000 men. He commands the fleet, but the fleet reckons but few sail. He conducts the foreign relations of the Union, but the United States are a nation without neighbors. Separated from the rest of the world by the ocean, and too weak as yet to aim at the dominion of the seas, they have no enemies, and their interests rarely come into contact with those of any other nation of the globe. The practical part of a government must not be judged by the theory of its constitution. The President of the United States is in the possession of almost royal prerogatives, which he has no opportunity of exercising, and of those privileges which he can at present use are very circumscribed. The law allows him to possess a degree of influence which circumstances do not permit him to employ. On the other hand, the great strength of the royal prerogatives in France arises from circumstances far more than from laws. There the executive government is constantly struggling against prodigious obstacles and exerting all its energies to repress them, so that it increases by the extent of its achievements and by the importance of the events it controls without modifying its constitution. 
If the laws had made it as feeble and as circumscribed as it is in the Union, its influence would very soon become still more preponderant. Why the President of the United States does not require the majority of the two houses in order to carry on the government. It is an established axiom in Europe that a constitutional king cannot persevere in a system of government which is opposed by the two other branches of the legislature. But several presidents of the United States have been known to lose the majority in the legislative body without being obliged to abandon the supreme power and without inflicting a serious evil upon society. I have heard this fact quoted as an instance of the independence and the power of the executive government in America. A moment's reflection will convince us, on the contrary, that it is a proof of its extreme weakness. A king in Europe requires the support of the legislature to enable him to perform the duties imposed upon him by the Constitution, because those duties are enormous. A constitutional king in Europe is not merely the executor of the law, but the execution of its provisions devolves so completely upon him that he has the power of paralyzing its influence if it opposes his designs. He requires the assistance of the legislative assemblies to make the law, but those assemblies stand in need of his aid to execute it. These two authorities cannot subsist without each other, and the mechanism of government is stopped as soon as they are at variance. In America, the president cannot prevent any law from being passed, nor can he evade the obligation of enforcing it. His sincere and zealous cooperation is no doubt useful, but it is not indispensable in the carrying on of public affairs. All of his important acts are directly or indirectly submitted to the legislature, and of his own free authority he can do but little. It is therefore his weakness, and not his power, which enables him to remain in opposition to Congress. In Europe, harmony must reign between the crown and the other branches of the legislature, because a collision between them may prove serious. In America, this harmony is not indispensable, because such a collision is impossible. Election of the President Dangers of the elective system increase in proportion to the extent of the prerogative. The system possible in America because no powerful executive authority is required. What circumstances are favorable to the elective system? Why the election of the President does not cause a deviation from the principles of the government? Influence of the election of the President on secondary functionaries. The dangers of the system of election applied to the head of executive government of a great people have been sufficiently exemplified by experience and by history, and the remarks I am about to make refer to America alone. These dangers may be more or less formidable in proportion to the place which the executive power occupies, and to the importance it possesses in the state, and they may vary according to the mode of the election and the circumstances in which the electors are placed. The most weighty argument against the election of a chief magistrate is that it offers so splendid a lure to private ambition, and is so apt to inflame men in the pursuit of power, that when legitimate means are wanting force, may not unfrequently seize what right denied. It is clear that the greater the privileges of the executive authority are, the greater is the temptation. The more the ambition of the candidates is excited, the more warmly are their interests espoused by a throng of partisans who hope to share the power when their patron has won the prize. The dangers of the elective system increase, therefore, in the exact ratio of the influence exercised by the executive power in the affairs of the state. The revolutions of Poland were not solely attributable to the elective system in general, but to the fact that the elected monarch was the sovereign of a powerful kingdom. Before we can discuss the absolute advantages of the elective system, we must make preliminary inquiries as to whether the geographical position, the laws, the habits, the manners and the opinions of the people amongst whom it is to be introduced 
will admit of the establishment of a weak and dependent executive government. For to attempt to render the representative of the state a powerful sovereign, and at the same time elective, is, in my opinion, to entertain two incompatible designs. To reduce hereditary royalty to the condition of an elective authority, the only means that I am acquainted with are to circumscribe its sphere of action beforehand, gradually to diminish its prerogatives, and to accustom the people to live without its protection. Nothing, however, is further from the designs of the Republicans of Europe than this course, as many of them owe their hatred of tyranny to the sufferings which they have personally undergone, it is oppression, and not the extent of the executive power, which excites their hostility. And they attack the former without perceiving how nearly it is connected with the latter. Here, too, no citizen has shown any disposition to expose his honor and his life in order to become the President of the United States, because the power of that office is temporary, limited, and subordinate. The prize of fortune must be great to encourage adventurers in so desperate a game. No candidate has yet been able to arouse the dangerous enthusiasm or the passionate sympathies of the people in his favor for the very simple reason that when he is at the head of the government, he has but little power, but little wealth, and but little glory to share amongst his friends. And his influence in the state is too small for the success or the ruin of a fraction to depend upon the elevation of an individual to power. The great advantage of hereditary monarchies is that, as the private interest of a family is always intimately connected with the interest of the state, the executive government is never suspended for a single instant. And if the affairs of a monarch are not better conducted than those of a republic, at least there is always someone to conduct them, well or ill, according to his capacity. In elective states, on the contrary, the wheels of government cease to act, as it were, of their own accord at the approach of an election, and even for some time previous to that event. The laws may indeed accelerate the operation of the election, which may be conducted with such simplicity and rapidity that the seat of power will never be left vacant, but notwithstanding these precautions, a break necessarily occurs in the minds of the people. At the approach of an election, the head of the executive government is wholly occupied by the coming struggle. His future plans are doubtful. He can undertake nothing new, and he will only prosecute with indifference those designs which another will perhaps terminate. I am so near the time of my retirement from office, said President Jefferson on the 21st of January, 1809, that I feel no passion, I take no part, I express no sentiment. It appears to me just to leave to my successor the commencement of those measures which he will have to prosecute and for which he will be responsible. On the other hand, the eyes of the nation are centered on a single point. All are watching the gradual birth of so important an event. The wider influence of the executive power extends, the greater and the more necessary is its constant action. The more fatal is the term of suspense. And a nation which is accustomed to the government, or still more, one used to the administrative protection of a powerful executive authority, would be infallibly convulsed by an election of this kind. In the United States, the action of the government may be slackened with impunity, because it is always weak and circumscribed. One of the great vices of the elective system is that it always introduces a certain degree of instability into the internal and external policy of the state. But this disadvantage is less sensibly felt if the share of power vested in the elected magistrate is small. In Rome, the principles of the government underwent no variation, although the councils were changed every year because the Senate, which was an hereditary assembly, possessed the directing authority. If the elective system were adopted in Europe, the condition of most of the monarchical states would be changed at every new election. 
In America, the president exercises a certain influence on state affairs, but he does not conduct them. The preponderating power is vested in the representatives of the whole nation. The political maxims of the country depend, therefore, on the mass of the people, not on the president alone. And consequently, in America, the elective system has no very prejudicial influence on the fixed principles of the government. But the want of fixed principles is an evil so inherent in the elective system that it is still extremely perceptible in the narrow sphere to which the authority of the president extends. The Americans have admitted that the head of the executive power, who has to bear the whole responsibility of the duties he is called upon to fulfill, ought to be empowered to choose his own agents and to remove them at his pleasure. The legislative bodies watch the conduct of the president more than they direct it. The consequence of this arrangement is that at every new election the fate of all the federal public officers is in suspense. Mr. Quincy Adams, on his entry into office, discharged the majority of the individuals who had been appointed by his predecessor, and I am not aware that General Jackson allowed a single removable functionary employed in the federal service to retain his place beyond the first year which succeeded his election. It is sometimes made a subject of complaint that in the constitutional monarchies of Europe the fate of the humbler servants of administration depends upon that of the ministers. But in elective governments this evil is far greater. In a constitutional monarchy, successive ministries are rapidly formed, but as the principal representative of the executive power does not change, the spirit of innovation is kept within bounds. The changes which take place are in the details, rather than in the principles of the administrative system. But to substitute one system for another as is done in America every four years, by law, is to cause a sort of revolution. As to the misfortunes which may fall upon individuals and the consequence of this state of things, it must be allowed that the uncertain situation of the public officers is less fraught with evil consequences in America than elsewhere. It is so easy to acquire an independent position in the United States that the public officer who loses his place may be deprived of the comforts of life, but not the means of subsistence. I remarked at the beginning of this chapter that the dangers of the elective system applied to the head of the state are augmented or decreased by the peculiar circumstances of the people which adopts it. However, the functions of the executive power may be restricted. It must always exercise a great influence upon the foreign policy of the country, for a negotiation cannot be opened or successfully carried on otherwise than by a single agent. The more precarious and the more perilous the position of a people becomes, the more absolute is the want of a fixed or consistent external policy, and the more dangerous does the elective system of the chief magistrate become. The policy of the Americans in relation to the whole world is exceedingly simple for it may almost be said that no country stands in need of them, nor do they require the cooperation of any other people. Their independence is never threatened. In their present condition, therefore, the functions of the executive power are no less limited by circumstances than by the laws, and the president may frequently change his line of policy without involving the state in difficulty or destruction. Whatever the prerogatives of the executive power may be, the period which immediately precedes an election and the moment of its duration must always be considered as a national crisis, which is perilous in proportion to the internal embarrassments and the external dangers of the country. Few of the nations of Europe could escape the calamities of anarchy or of conquest every time they might have to elect a new sovereign. In America, society is so constituted that it can stand without assistance upon its own basis. Nothing is to be feared from the pressure of external dangers, and the election of the president is a cause of agitation, but not of ruin. Mode of Election Skills of the American legislatures shown in the mode of election adopted by them. Creation of a special electoral body. 
separate votes of these electors. Case in which the House of Representatives is called upon to choose the President. Results of the twelve elections which have taken place since the Constitution has been established. Besides the dangers which are inherent in the system, many other difficulties may arise from the mode of election which may be obviated by the precaution of the legislature. When a people meet in arms on some public spot to choose its head, it was exposed to all the chances of civil war resulting from so martial a mode of proceeding, besides the dangers of the elective system in itself. The Polish laws, which subjected the election of the sovereign to the veto of a single individual, suggested the murder of that individual, or prepared the way to anarchy. In the examination of the institutions and the political as well as social condition of the United States, we are struck by the admirable harmony of the gifts of fortune and the efforts of man. The nation possessed two of the main causes of internal peace. It was a new country, but it was inhabited by a people grown old in the exercise of freedom. America had no hostile neighbors to dread, and the American legislatures, profiting by these favorable circumstances, created a weak and subordinate executive power which could, without danger, be made elective. If then only remained for them to choose the least dangerous of the modes of election, and the rules which they laid down upon this point admirably correspond to the securities which the physical and political constitution of the country already afforded. Their object was to find the mode of election which would best express the choice of the people with the least possible excitement and suspense. It was admitted in the first place that the simple majority should be decisive, but the difficulty was to obtain this majority without an interval of delay which it was most important to avoid. It rarely happens that an individual can at once collect the majority of the suffrages of a great people, and this difficulty is enhanced in a republic of confederate states, where local influences are apt to preponderate. The means by which it is proposed to obviate this second obstacle was to delegate the electoral powers of the nation to a body of representatives. This mode of election rendered a majority more probable for the fewer the electors are, the greater is the chance of their coming to a final decision. It also offered an additional probability of a judicious choice. It then remained to be decided whether this right of election was to be entrusted to a legislative body, the habitual representative's assembly of the nation, or whether an electoral assembly should be formed for the express purpose of proceeding to the nomination of a president. The Americans chose the latter alternative, from a belief that the individuals who were returned to make laws were incompetent to represent the wishes of the nation in the election of its chief magistrate, and that as they are chosen for more than a year, the constituency they represent might have changed its opinion in that time. It was thought that the legislature was empowered to elect the head of the executive power its members would, for some time before the election, be exposed to the maneuvers of corruption and the tricks of intrigue, whereas the special electors would, like a jury, remain mixed up with the crowd to the day of action, when they would appear for the sole purpose of giving their votes. It was therefore established that every state should name a certain number of electors who, in their turn, should elect the president and it had been observed that the assemblies to which the choice of a chief magistrate had been entrusted in elective countries inevitably became the centers of passion and of cabal, that they sometimes usurped an authority which did not belong to them, and that their proceedings, or the uncertainty which resulted from them, were sometimes prolonged so much as to endanger the welfare of the state. It was determined that the electors should all vote upon the same day without being convoked to the same place. This double election rendered a majority probable, though not certain, for it was possible that as many differences might exist between the electors as between their constituents. In this case, it was necessary to have recourse to one of three measures, 
either to appoint new electors or to consult a second time those already appointed or to defer the decision to another authority. The first two of these alternatives, independently of the uncertainty of their results, were likely to delay the final decision and to perpetuate an agitation which must always be accompanied with danger. The third expedient was therefore adopted, and it was agreed that the votes should be transmitted sealed to the President of the Senate, and that they should be opened and counted in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives. If none of the candidates has a majority, the House of Representatives then proceeds immediately to elect a President, but with the condition that it must fix upon one of the three candidates who have the highest numbers. This is only in case of an event which cannot often happen, which can never be foreseen, that the election is entrusted to the ordinary representatives of the nation, and even that they are obliged to choose a citizen who has already been designated by a powerful minority of the special electors. It is by this happy expedient that the respect which is due to the popular voice is combined with the utmost celerity of execution, and these precautions which the peace of the country demands. But the decision of the question by the House of Representatives does not necessarily offer an immediate solution of the difficulty, for the majority of that assembly may still be doubtful, and in this case the Constitution prescribes no remedy. Nevertheless, by restricting the number of candidates to three, and by referring the matter to the judgment of an enlightened public body, it has smoothed all the obstacles which are not inherent in the elective system. In the 44 years which have elapsed since the promulgation of the federal constitution, the United States have 12 times chosen a president. Ten of these elections took place simultaneously by the votes of the special electors in the different states. The House of Representatives has only twice exercised its conditional privilege of deciding in cases of uncertainty. The first time was at the election of Mr. Jefferson in 1801. The second was in 1825, when Mr. Quincy Adams was named. Crisis of the Election The election may be considered as a national crisis. Why? Passions of the people. Anxiety of the President. Calm, which succeeds the agitation of the election. I have shown that the circumstances which are favored the adoption of the elective system in the United States, and what precautions were taken by the legislatures to obviate its dangers. The Americans are habitually accustomed to all kinds of elections, and they know by experience the utmost degree of excitement which is compatible with security. The vast extent of the country and the dissemination of the inhabitants render a collision between parties less probable and less dangerous there than elsewhere. The political circumstances under which the elections have hitherto been carried have presented no real embarrassments to the nation. Nonetheless, the epoch of the election of a president of the United States may be considered as a crisis in the affairs of the nation. The influence which he exercises on public business is no doubt feeble and indirect, but the choice of the president, which is of small importance to each individual citizen, concerns the citizens collectively, and however trifling an interest may be, it assumes a greater degree of importance as soon as it becomes general. The president possesses but few means of rewarding his supporters in comparison to the kings of Europe, but the places which are at his disposal are sufficiently numerous to interest, directly or indirectly, several thousand electors in his success. Political parties in the United States are led to rally around an individual in order to acquire a more tangible shape in the eyes of the crowd, and the name of the candidate for the presidency is put forward as the symbol and personification of their theories. For these reasons, parties are strongly interested in gaining the election, not so much with a view to the triumph of their principles under the auspices of the president-elect, as to show by the majority which returned him the strength of the supporters of those principles. For a long while before the appointed time is at hand, the election becomes the most important and the all-engrossing topic of discussion. 
the ardor of faction is redoubled, and all the artificial passions which the imagination can create in the bosom of a happy and peaceful land are agitated and brought to light. The president, on the other hand, is absorbed by the cares of self-defense. He no longer governs for the interest of the state, but for that of his re-election. He does homage to the majority, and instead of checking its passions, as his duty commands him to do, he frequently courts its worst caprices. As the election draws near, the activity of intrigue and the agitation of the populace increase. The citizens are divided into hostile camps, each of which assumes the name of its favorite candidate. The whole nation glows with feverish excitement. The election is the daily theme of the public papers, the subject of private conversation, the end of every thought and every action, the sole interest of the present. As soon as the choice is determined, this ardor is dispelled, and as a calmer season returns, the current of the state, which had nearly broken its banks, sinks to its usual level. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Tassinari Democracy in America, Volume 1 By Alexis de Tocqueville Translated by Henry Reeve Chapter 8, Part 3 Chapter 8 The Federal Constitution, Part 3 Re-election of the President Chapter Summary When the head of the executive power is re-eligible, it is the state which is the source of intrigue and corruption. The desire of being re-elected, the chief aim of a President of the United States. Disadvantage of the system peculiar to America. The natural evil of democracy is that it subordinates all authority to the slightest desires of the majority. The re-election of the President encourages this evil. It may be asked whether the legislators of the United States did right or wrong in allowing the re-election of the President. It seems at first sight contrary to all reason to prevent the head of the executive power from being elected a second time. The influence which the talents and the character of a single individual may exercise upon the fate of a whole people, in critical circumstances or arduous times, is well known. A law preventing the re-election of the chief magistrate would deprive the citizens of the surest pledge of the prosperity and the security of the commonwealth and, by a singular inconsistency, a man would be excluded from the government at the very time when he had shown his ability in conducting its affairs. But if these arguments are strong, perhaps still more powerful reasons may be advanced against them. Intrigue and corruption are the natural defects of elective government, but when the head of the state can be re-elected, these evils rise to a great height and compromise the very existence of the country. When a simple candidate seeks to rise by intrigue, his maneuvers must necessarily be limited to a narrow sphere. But when the chief magistrate enters the lists, he borrows the strength of the government for his own purposes. In the former case, the feeble resources of an individual are in action. In the latter, the state itself, with all its immense influence, is busied in the work of corruption and cabal. The private citizen, who employs the most immoral practices to acquire power, can only act in a manner indirectly prejudicial to the public prosperity. But if the representative of the executive descends into the combat, the cares of government dwindle into second-rate importance, and the success of his election is his first concern. All laws and all the negotiations he undertakes are to him nothing more than electioneering schemes. Places become the reward of services rendered, not to the nation but to its chief, and the influence of the government, if not injurious to the country, is at least no longer beneficial to the community for which it was created. It is impossible to consider the ordinary course of affairs in the United States 
without perceiving that the desire of being re-elected is the chief aim of the President, that his whole administration, and even his most indifferent measures, tend to this object, and that, as the crisis approaches, his personal interest takes the place of his interest in the public good. The principle of re-eligibility renders the corrupt influence of elective government still more extensive and pernicious. In America it exercises a peculiarly fatal influence on the sources of national existence. Every government seems to be afflicted by some evil which is inherent in its nature, and the genius of the legislator is shown in eluding its attacks. A state may survive the influence of a host of bad laws, and the mischief they cause is frequently exaggerated, but a law which encourages the growth of the canker within must prove fatal in the end, although its bad consequences may not be immediately perceived. The principle of destruction in absolute monarchies lies in the excessive and unreasonable extension of the prerogative of the crown, and a measure tending to remove the constitutional provisions which counterbalance this influence would be radically bad, even if its immediate consequences were unattended with evil. By a parity of reasoning, in countries governed by a democracy, where the people is perpetually drawing all authority to itself, the laws which increase or accelerate its action are the direct assailants of the very principle of the government. The greatest proof of the ability of the American legislators is that they clearly discerned this truth, and that they had the courage to act up to it. They conceived that a certain authority above the body of the people was necessary, which should enjoy a degree of independence, without, however, being entirely beyond the popular control an authority which would be forced to comply with the permanent determinations of the majority, but which would be able to resist its caprices and to refuse its most dangerous demands. To this end they centered the whole executive power of the nation in a single arm. They granted extensive prerogatives to the President, and they armed him with the veto to resist the encroachments of the legislature. But by introducing the principle of re-election, they partly destroyed their work, and they rendered the President but little inclined to exert the great power they had vested in his hands. If ineligible a second time, the President would be far from independent of the people, for his responsibility would not be lessened, but the favor of the people would not be so necessary to him as to induce him to court it by humoring its desires. If re-eligible, and this is more especially true at the present day when political morality is relaxed and when great men are rare, the President of the United States becomes an easy tool in the hands of the majority. He adopts its likings and its animosities. He hastens to anticipate its wishes. He forestalls its complaints. He yields to its idlest cravings, and instead of guiding it, as the legislature intended that he should do, he is ever ready to follow its bidding. Thus, in order not to deprive the state of the talents of an individual, those talents have been rendered almost useless, and to reserve an expedient for extraordinary perils, the country has been exposed to daily dangers. FEDERAL COURTS CHAPTER SUMMARY POLITICAL IMPORTANCE OF THE JUDICIARY IN THE UNITED STATES DIFFICULTY OF TREATING THIS SUBJECT Utility of judicial power in confederations. What tribunals could be introduced into the Union? Necessity of establishing federal courts of justice. Organization of the national judiciary. The Supreme Court. In what it differs from all known tribunals. I have inquired into the legislative and executive power of the Union, and the judicial power now remains to be examined. But in this place I cannot conceal my fears from the reader. Their judicial institutions exercise a great influence on the condition of the Anglo-Americans, and they occupy a prominent place amongst what are probably called political institutions. In this respect they are peculiarly deserving of our attention. 
but I am at a loss to explain the political action of the American tribunals without entering into some technical details of their constitution and their forms of proceeding. And I know not how to descend to these minutiae without wearying the curiosity of the reader by the natural aridity of the subject, or without risking to fall into obscurity through a desire to be succinct. I can scarcely hope to escape these various evils, for if I appear too lengthy to a man of the world, a lawyer may on the other hand complain of my brevity. But these are the natural disadvantages of my subject, and more especially of the point which I am about to discuss. The great difficulty was, not to devise the Constitution to the Federal Government, but to find out a method of enforcing its laws. Governments have in general but two means of overcoming the opposition of the people they govern, vis-à-vis -vis the physical force which is at their own disposal, and the moral force which they derive from the decisions of the courts of justice. A government which should have no other means of exacting obedience than open war must be very near its ruin, for one of two alternatives would then probably occur. If its authority was small and its character temperate, it would not resort to violence till the last extremity, and it would connive at a number of partial acts of insubordination, in which case the state would gradually fall into anarchy. If it was enterprising and powerful, it would perpetually have recourse to its physical strength, and would speedily degenerate into a military despotism so that its activity would not be less prejudicial to the community than its inaction. The great end of justice is to substitute the notion of right for that of violence, and to place a legal barrier between the power of the government and the use of physical force. The authority which is awarded to the intervention of a court of justice by the general opinion of mankind is so surprisingly great that it clings to the mere formalities of justice and gives a bodily influence to the shadow of the law. The moral force which courts of justice possess renders the introduction of physical force exceedingly rare, and is very frequently substituted for it. But if the latter proves to be indispensable, its power is doubled by the association of the idea of law. A federal government stands in greater need of the support of judicial institutions than any other because it is naturally weak and exposed to formidable opposition. If it were always obliged to resort to violence in the first instance, it could not fulfill its task. The Union, therefore, required a national judiciary to enforce the obedience of the citizens to the laws, and to repeal the attacks which might be directed against them. The question then remained as to what tribunals were to exercise these privileges. Were they to be entrusted to the courts of justice, which were already organized in every state, or was it necessary to create federal courts? It may easily be proved that the Union could not adapt the judicial power of the states to its wants. The separation of the judiciary from the administrative power of the state no doubt affects the security of every citizen and the liberty of all but it is no less important to the existence of the nation that these several powers should have the same origin, should follow the same principles, and act in the same sphere, in a word, that they should be correlative and homogeneous. No one, I presume, ever suggested the advantage of trying offenses committed in France by a foreign court of justice in order to secure the impartiality of the judges. The Americans form one people in relation to their federal government, but in the bosom of this people diverse political bodies have been allowed to subsist which are dependent on the national government in a few points, and independent in all the rest, which have all a distinct origin, maxims peculiar to themselves, and special means of carrying on their affairs. To entrust the execution of the laws of the Union to tribunals instituted by these political bodies would be to allow foreign judges to preside over the nation. Nay, more, not only is each state foreign to the Union at large, but it is in perpetual opposition to the common interests, since whatever authority the Union loses turns to the advantage of the states. 
thus to enforce the laws of the Union by means of the tribunals of the states, would be to allow not only foreign but partial judges to preside over the nation. But the number, still more than the mere character of the tribunals of the states, rendered them unfit for the service of the nation. When the federal constitution was formed, there were already thirteen courts of justice in the United States which decided causes without appeal. That number is now increased to twenty-four. To suppose that a state can subsist when its fundamental laws may be subjected to four and twenty different interpretations at the same time is to advance a proposition alike contrary to reason and to experience. The American legislators, therefore, agreed to create a federal judiciary power to apply the laws of the Union, and to determine certain questions affecting general interests, which were carefully determined beforehand. The entire judicial power of the Union was centered in one tribunal, which was denominated the Supreme Court of the United States. But, to facilitate the expedition of business, inferior courts were appended to it, which were empowered to decide causes of small importance without appeal, and with appeal causes of more magnitude. The members of the Supreme Court are named neither by the people nor the legislature, but by the President of the United States, acting with the advice of the Senate. In order to render them independent of the other authorities, their office was made inalienable, and it was determined that their salary, when once fixed, should not be altered by the legislature. It was easy to proclaim the principle of a federal judiciary, but difficulties multiplied when the extent of its jurisdiction was to be determined. Chapter Summary Means of Determining the Jurisdiction of the Federal Courts Difficulty of Determining the Jurisdiction of Separate Courts of Justice and Confederations The Courts of the Union Obtained the Right of Fixing Their Own Jurisdiction in what respect this rule attacks the portion of sovereignty reserved to the several states, the sovereignty of these states restricted by the laws and the interpretation of the laws, consequently the danger of the several states is more apparent than real. As the Constitution of the United States recognized two distinct powers in presence of each other, represented in a judicial point of view by two distinct classes of courts of justice, the utmost care which could be taken in defining their separate jurisdictions would have been insufficient to prevent frequent collisions between those tribunals. The question then arose, to whom the right of deciding the competency of each court was to be referred. In nations which constitute a single-body politic, when a question is debated between two courts relating to their mutual jurisdiction, a third tribunal is generally within reach to decide the difference. And this is effected without difficulty, because in these nations the questions of judicial competency have no connection with the privileges of the national supremacy. But it was impossible to create an arbiter between a superior court of the Union and the superior court of a separate state, which would not belong to one of these two classes. It was, therefore, necessary to allow one of these courts to judge its own cause, and to take or retain cognizance of the point which was contested. To grant this privilege to the different courts of the states would have been to destroy the sovereignty of the Union de facto, after having established it de jure. For the interpretation of the Constitution, would soon have restored that portion of independence to the states of which the terms of that act deprived them. The object of the creation of a federal tribunal was to prevent the courts of the states from deciding questions affecting the national interests in their own department, and so to form a uniform body of jurisprudence for the interpretation of the laws of the Union. This end would not have been accomplished if the courts of the several states had been competent to decide upon cases in their separate capacities from which they were obliged to abstain as federal tribunals. The Supreme Court of the United States was therefore invested with the right of determining all questions of jurisdiction. This was a severe blow upon the independence of the states, which was thus restricted 
not only by the laws, but by the interpretation of them, by one limit which was known, and by another which was dubious, by a rule which was certain, and a rule which was arbitrary. It is true the Constitution had laid down the precise limits of the federal supremacy, but whenever this supremacy is contested by one of the states, a federal tribunal decides the question. Nevertheless, the dangers with which the independence of the states was threatened by this mode of proceeding are less serious than they appeared to be. We shall see hereafter that in America the real strength of the country is vested in the provincial far more than in the federal government. The federal judges are conscious of the relative weakness of the power in whose name they act, and they are more inclined to abandon a right of jurisdiction in cases where it is justly their own than to assert a privilege to which they have no legal claim. DIFFERENT CASES OF JURISDICTION CHAPTER SUMMARY The matter and the party are the first conditions of the federal jurisdiction. Suits in which ambassadors are engaged. Suits of the Union. Of a separate state. By whom tried. Causes resulting from the laws of the Union. Why judged by the federal tribunals. Causes relating to the performance of contracts tried by the federal courts. Consequence of this arrangement. After having appointed the means of fixing the competency of the federal courts, the legislators of the Union define the cases which should come within their jurisdiction. It was established on the one hand that certain parties must always be brought before the federal courts without any regard to the special nature of the cause and on the other, that certain causes must always be brought before the same courts, without any regard to the quality of the parties in the suit. These distinctions were therefore admitted to be the basis of the federal jurisdiction. Ambassadors are the representatives of nations, in a state of amity with the Union, and whatever concerns these personages concerns in some degree the whole Union. When an ambassador is a party in a suit, that suit affects the welfare of the nation, and a federal tribunal is naturally called upon to decide it. The Union itself may be invoked in legal proceedings, and in this case it would be alike contrary to the customs of all nations, and to common sense, to appeal to a tribunal representing any other sovereignty than its own. The federal courts, therefore, take cognizance of these affairs. When two parties belonging to two different states are engaged in a suit, the case cannot with propriety be brought before a court of either state. The surest expedient is to select a tribunal like that of the Union, which can excite the suspicions of neither party, and which offers the most natural as well as the most certain remedy. When the two parties are not private individuals but states, an important political consideration is added to the same motive of equity. The quality of the parties in this case gives a national importance to all their disputes, and the most trifling litigation of the states may be said to involve the peace of the whole Union. The nature of the cause frequently prescribes the rule of competency. Thus, all the questions which concern maritime commerce evidently fall under the cognizance of the federal tribunals. Almost all these questions are connected with the interpretation of the law of nations, and in this respect they essentially interest the Union in relation to foreign powers. Moreover, as the sea is not included within the limits of any peculiar jurisdiction, the national courts can only hear causes which originate in maritime affairs. The Constitution comprises under one head almost all the cases which by their very nature come within the limits of the federal courts. The rule which it lays down is simple but pregnant with an entire system of ideas, and with a vast multitude of facts. It declares that the judicial power of the Supreme Court shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the laws of the United States. Two examples will put the intention of the legislator in the clearest light. The Constitution prohibits the states from making laws on the value and circulation of money. If, notwithstanding this prohibition, 
a state passes a law of this kind, with which the interested parties refuse to comply because it is contrary to the Constitution, the case must come before a federal court, because it arises under the laws of the United States. Again, if difficulties arise in the levying of import duties which have been voted by Congress, the federal court must decide the case, because it arises under the interpretation of a law of the United States. This rule is in perfect accordance with the fundamental principles of the federal constitution. The Union, as it was established in 1789, possesses, it is true, a limited supremacy. But it was intended that, within its limits, it should form one and the same people. Within those limits the Union is sovereign. When this point is established and admitted, the inference is easy. For if it be acknowledged that the United States constitute one and the same people within the bounds prescribed by their Constitution, it is impossible to refuse them the rights which belong to other nations. But it has been allowed, from the origin of society, that every nation has the right of deciding by its own courts those questions which concern the execution of its own laws. To this it is answered that the Union is in so singular a position that in relation to some matters it constitutes a people, and that in relation to all the rest it is a non-entity. But the inference to be drawn is that in the laws relating to these matters the Union possesses all the rights of absolute sovereignty. The difficulty is to know what these matters are. And when once it is resolved, and we have shown how it was resolved in speaking of the means of determining the jurisdiction of the federal courts, no further doubt can arise, for as soon as it is established that a suit is federal, that is to say, that it belongs to the share of sovereignty reserved by the Constitution of the Union, the natural consequence is that it should come within the jurisdiction of a federal court. Whenever the laws of the United States are attacked, or whenever they are resorted to in self-defense, the federal courts must be appealed to. Thus the jurisdiction of the tribunals of the Union extends and narrows its limits exactly in the same ratio as the sovereignty of the Union augments or decreases. We have shown that the principal aim of the legislators of 1789 was to divide the sovereign authority into two parts. In the one they placed the control of all the general interests of the Union, in the other the control of the special interests of its component states. Their chief solicitude was to arm the federal government with sufficient power to enable it to resist, within its sphere, the encroachments of the several states. As for these communities, the principle of independence within certain limits of their own was adopted in their behalf, and they were concealed from the inspection and protected from the control of the central government. In speaking of the division of authority, I observed that this latter principle had not always been held sacred, since the states are prevented from passing certain laws which apparently belong to their own particular sphere of interest. When a state of the Union passes a law of this kind, the citizens who are injured by its execution can appeal to the federal courts. Thus the jurisdiction of the federal courts extends not only to all the cases which arise under the laws of the Union, but also to those which arise under laws made by the several states in opposition to the Constitution. The states are prohibited from making ex post facto laws in criminal cases, and any person condemned by virtue of a law of this kind can appeal to the judicial power of the Union. The states are likewise prohibited from making laws which have a tendency to impair the obligations of contracts. If a citizen thinks that an obligation of this kind is impaired by a law passed in his state, he may refuse to obey it and may appeal to the federal courts. This provision appears to me to be the most serious attack upon the independence of the states. The rights awarded to the federal government for purposes of obvious national importance are definite and easily comprehensible, but those with which this last clause invests it are not either clearly appreciable or accurately defined, for there are vast numbers of political laws which influence the existence of obligations of contracts, which may thus furnish an easy pretext
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Tassinari. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 8, Part 4. Chapter 8. The Federal Constitution, Part 4. Procedure of the Federal Courts. Chapter Summary Natural weakness of the judiciary power in confederations. Legislators ought to strive as much as possible to bring private individuals and not states before the federal courts. How the Americans have succeeded in this. Direct prosecution of private individuals in the federal courts. Indirect prosecution of the states which violate the laws of the Union. The decrees of the Supreme Court enervate but do not destroy the provincial laws. I have shown what the privileges of the federal courts are, and it is no less important to point out the manner in which they are exercised. The irresistible authority of justice in countries in which the sovereignty is undivided is derived from the fact that the tribunals of those countries represent the entire nation at issue with the individual against whom their decree is directed, and the idea of power is thus introduced to corroborate the idea of right. But this is not always the case in countries in which the sovereignty is divided. In them the judicial power is more frequently opposed to a fraction of the nation than to an isolated individual, and its moral authority and physical strength are consequently diminished. In federal states the power of the judge is naturally decreased, and that of the justiciable parties is augmented. The aim of the legislator in confederate states ought therefore to be to render the position of the courts of justice analogous to that which they occupy in countries where the sovereignty is undivided. In other words, his efforts ought constantly to tend to maintain the judicial power of the confederation as the representative of the nation and the justiciable party as representative of an individual interest. Every government, whatever may be its constitution, requires the means of constraining its subjects to discharge their obligations, and of protecting its privileges from their assaults. As far as the direct action of the government on the community is concerned, the Constitution of the United States contrived, by a master stroke of policy, that the federal courts acting in the name of the laws, should only take cognizance of parties in an individual capacity. For, as it had been declared that the Union consisted of one and the same people within the limits laid down by the Constitution, the inference was that the government created by this Constitution, and acting within these limits, was invested with all the privileges of a national government one of the principle of which is the right of transmitting its injunctions directly to the private citizen. When, for instance, the Union votes an impost, it does not apply to the states for the levying of it, but to every American citizen in proportion to his assessment. The Supreme Court, which is empowered to enforce the execution of this law of the Union, exerts its influence not upon a refractory state, but upon the private taxpayer and, like the judicial power of other nations, it is opposed to the person of an individual. It is to be observed that the Union chose its own antagonist, and as that antagonist is feeble, he is naturally worsted. But the difficulty increases when the proceedings are not brought forward by, but against the Union. The Constitution recognizes the legislative power of the states, and a law so enacted may impair the privileges of the Union, in which case a collision is unavoidable between that body and the state which has passed the law, and it only remains to select the least dangerous remedy, which is very clearly deducible from the general principles I have before established. It may be conceived that, in the case under consideration, the Union might have used the state before a federal court, which would have annulled the act, and by this means it would have adopted a natural course of proceeding. But the judicial power would have been placed in open hostility to the state, and it was desirable to avoid this predicament as much as possible. 
The Americans hold that it is nearly impossible that a new law should not impair the interests of some private individual by its provisions. These private interests are assumed by the American legislators as the ground of attack against such measures as may be prejudicial to the Union, and it is to these cases that the protection of the Supreme Court is extended. Suppose a state vends a certain portion of its territory to a company, and that a year afterwards it passes a law by which the territory is otherwise disposed of, and that clause of the Constitution which prohibits laws impairing the obligation of contracts violated. When the purchaser under the second act appears to take possession, the possessor under the first act brings his action before the tribunals of the Union, and causes the title of the claimant to be pronounced null and void. Thus, in point of fact, the judicial power of the Union is contesting the claims of the sovereignty of a state, but it only acts indirectly and upon a special application of detail. It attacks the law in its consequences, not in its principle, and it rather weakens than destroys it. The last hypothesis that remained was that each state formed a corporation enjoying a separate existence and distinct civil rights, and that it could therefore sue or be sued before a tribunal. Thus a state could bring an action against another state. In this instance, the Union was not called upon to contest a provincial law, but to try a suit in which a state was a party. This suit was perfectly similar to any other cause, except that the quality of the parties was different and here the danger pointed out at the beginning of this chapter exists with less chance of being avoided. The inherent disadvantage of the very essence of federal constitutions is that they engender parties in the bosom of the nation which present powerful obstacles to the free course of justice. Section Summary High rank of the Supreme Court amongst the great powers of state no nation ever constituted so great a judicial power as the Americans, extent of its prerogative, its political influence, the tranquility and the very existence of the Union depend on the discretion of the seven federal judges. When we have successively examined in detail the organization of the Supreme Court and the entire prerogatives which it exercises, we shall readily admit that a more imposing judicial power was never constituted by any people. The Supreme Court is placed at the head of all known tribunals, both by the nature of its rights and the class of justiciable parties which it controls. In all the civilized countries of Europe, the government has always shown the greatest repugnance to allow the cases to which it was itself a party to be decided by the ordinary course of justice. This repugnance naturally attains its utmost height in an absolute government. And, on the other hand, the privileges of the courts of justice are extended with the increasing liberties of the people. But no European nation has at present held that all judicial controversies, without regard to their origin, can be decided by the judges of common law. In America this theory has been actually put in practice and the Supreme Court of the United States is the sole tribunal of the nation. Its power extends to all the cases arising under laws and treaties made by the executive and legislative authorities, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, and in general to all points which affect the law of nations. It may even be affirmed that, although its constitution is essentially judicial, its prerogatives are almost entirely political. Its sole object is to enforce the execution of the laws of the Union, and the Union only regulates the relations of the government with the citizens, and of the nation with foreign powers. The relations of citizens amongst themselves are almost exclusively regulated by the sovereignty of the states. A second and still greater cause of the preponderance of this court may be adduced. In the nations of Europe, the courts of justice are only called upon to try the controversies of private individuals. But the Supreme Court of the United States summons sovereign powers to its bar. When the clerk of the court advances on the steps of the tribunal and simply says, The State of New York versus the State of Ohio, it is impossible not to feel that the court which he addresses is no ordinary body. And when it is recollected that one of these parties represents one million, 
and the other two millions of men, one is struck by the responsibility of the seven judges whose decision is about to satisfy or to disappoint so large a number of their fellow citizens. The peace, the prosperity, and the very existence of the Union are vested in the hands of the seven judges. Without their act of cooperation, the Constitution would be a dead letter. The executive appeals to them for assistance against the encroachments of the legislative powers. The legislature demands their protection from the designs of the executive. They defend the Union from the disobedience of the states, the states from the exaggerated claims of the Union, the public interest against the interests of private citizens, and the conservative spirit of order against the fleeting innovations of democracy. Their power is enormous, but it is clothed in the authority of public opinion. They are the all-powerful guardians of a people which respects law, but they would be impotent against popular neglect or popular contempt. The force of public opinion is the most intractable of agents, because its exact limits cannot be defined, and it is not less dangerous to exceed than to remain below the boundary prescribed. The federal judges must not only be good citizens and men possessed of that information and integrity which are indispensable to magistrates, but they must be statesmen, politicians, not unread in the signs of the times, not afraid to brave the obstacles which can be subdued, nor slow to turn aside such encroaching elements as may threaten the supremacy of the Union and the obedience which is due to the laws. The President, who exercises a limited power, may err without causing great mischief in the State. Congress may decide amiss without destroying the Union, because the electoral body in which Congress originates may cause it to retract its decision by changing its members. But if the Supreme Court is ever composed of imprudent men or bad citizens, the Union may be plunged into anarchy or civil war. The real cause of this danger, however, does not lie in the constitution of the tribunal, but in the very nature of federal governments. We have observed that in confederate peoples it is especially necessary to consolidate the judicial authority, because in no other nations do those independent persons who are able to cope with the social body exist in greater power or in a better condition to resist the physical strength of the government. But the more a power requires to be strengthened, the more extensive and independent it must be made, and the dangers which its abuse may create are heightened by its independence and its strength. The source of the evil is not, therefore, in the constitution of the power, but in the constitution of those states which render its existence necessary. In what respects the federal constitution is superior to that of the states? Section Summary in what respects the Constitution of the Union can be compared to that of the States? Superiority of the Constitution of the Union attributable to the wisdom of the Federal Legislators. Legislature of the Union less dependent on the people than that of the States. Executive power more independent in its sphere. Judicial power less subjected to the inclinations of the majority. Practical consequence of these facts. The dangers inherent in a democratic government eluded by the federal legislators and increased by the legislators of the states. The federal constitution differs essentially from that of the states in the ends which it is intended to accomplish, but in the means by which these ends are promoted a greater analogy exists between them. The objects of the governments are different, but their forms are the same and in this special point of view there is some advantage in comparing them together. I am of opinion that the federal constitution is superior to all the constitutions of the states for several reasons. The present constitution of the Union was formed at a later period than those of the majority of the states, and it may have derived some ameliorations from past experience. But we shall be led to acknowledge that this is only a secondary cause of its superiority, when we recollect that eleven new states have been added to the American Confederation since the promulgation of the Federal Constitution, and that these new republics have always rather exaggerated than avoided the defects which existed in the former constitutions. 
the chief cause of the superiority of the federal constitution lay in the character of the legislators who composed it. At the time when it was formed, the dangers of the confederation were imminent, and its ruin seemed inevitable. In this extremity, the people chose the men who most deserved the esteem, rather than those who had gained the affections of the country. I have already observed that distinguished as almost all the legislators of the Union were for their intelligence, they were still more so for their patriotism. They had all been nurtured at a time when the spirit of liberty was braced by a continual struggle against a powerful and predominant authority. When the contest was terminated, whilst the excited passions of the populace persisted in warring with dangers which had ceased to threaten them, these men stopped short in their career. They cast a calmer and more penetrating look upon the country which was now their own. They perceived that the war of independence was definitely ended, and that the only dangers which America had to fear were those which might result from the abuse of the freedom she had won. They had the courage to say what they believed to be true, because they were animated by a warm and sincere love of liberty, and they ventured to propose restrictions, because they were resolutely opposed to destruction. The greater number of the constitutions of the states assign one year for the duration of the House of Representatives, and two years for that of the Senate so that members of the legislative body are constantly and narrowly tied down by the slightest desires of their constituents. The legislators of the Union were of opinion that this excessive dependence of the legislature tended to alter the nature of the main consequences of the representative system, since it vested the source not only of authority but of government in the people. They increased the length of the time for which the representatives were returned, in order to give them freer scope for the exercise of their own judgment. The Federal Constitution, as well as the constitutions of the different states, divided the legislative body into two branches, but in the states these two branches were composed of the same elements, and elected in the same manner. The consequence was that the passions and inclinations of the populace were as rapidly and as energetically represented in one chamber as in the other and that laws were made with all the characteristics of violence and precipitation. By the Federal Constitution, the two houses originate in like manner in the choice of the people, but the conditions of eligibility and the mode of election were changed, to the end that, if, as is the case in certain nations, one branch of the legislature represents the same interests as the other, it may at least represent a superior degree of intelligence and discretion. A mature age was made one of the conditions of the senatorial dignity, and the upper house was chosen by an elected assembly of a limited number of members. To concentrate the whole social force in the hands of the legislative body is the natural tendency of democracies. For as this is the power which emanates the most directly from the people, it is made to participate most fully in the preponderating authority of the multitude and it is naturally led to monopolize every species of influence. This concentration is at once prejudicial to a well-conducted administration, and favorable to the despotism of the majority. The legislators of the states frequently yielded to these democratic propensities, which were invariably and courageously resisted by the founders of the Union. In the states the executive power is vested in the hands of a magistrate, who is apparently placed upon a level with the legislature, but who is in reality nothing more than the blind agent and the passive instrument of its decisions. He can derive no influence from the duration of his functions, which terminate with the revolving year, or from the exercise of prerogatives which can scarcely be said to exist. The legislature can condemn him to inaction by entrusting the execution of the laws to special committees of its own members, and can annul his temporary dignity by depriving him of his salary. The Federal Constitution vests all the privileges and all the responsibility of the executive power in a single individual. The duration of the presidency is fixed at four years. The salary of the individual who fills that office cannot be altered during the term of his functions. He is protected by a body of official dependents, and armed with a suspense of veto. 
In short, every effort was made to confer a strong and independent position upon the executive authority within the limits which had been prescribed to it. In the constitutions of all the states, the judicial power is that which remains the most independent of the legislative authority. Nevertheless, in all the states, the legislature has reserved to itself the right of regulating the emoluments of the judges, a practice which necessarily subjects these magistrates to its immediate influence. In some states, the judges are only temporarily appointed, which deprives them of a great portion of their power and their freedom. In others, the legislative and judicial powers are entirely confounded. Thus, the Senate of New York, for instance, constitutes in certain cases the superior court of the state. The federal constitution, on the other hand, carefully separates the judicial authority from all external influences, and it provides for the independence of the judges by declaring that their salary shall not be altered and that their functions shall be inalienable. The practical consequences of these different systems may easily be perceived. An attentive observer will soon remark that the business of the Union is incomparably better conducted than that of any individual state. The conduct of the federal government is more fair and more temperate than that of the states, its designs are more fraught with wisdom, its projects are more durable and more skillfully combined, its measures are put into execution with more vigor and consistency. I recapitulate the substance of this chapter in a few words. The existence of democracies is threatened by two dangers, vis a vis the complete subjection of the legislative body to the caprices of the electoral body, and the concentration of all the powers of the government in the legislative authority. The growth of these evils has been encouraged by the policy of the legislators of the states but it has been resisted by the legislators of the Union by every means which lay within their control. Section Summary Characteristics which distinguish the Federal Constitution of the United States of America from all other Federal Constitutions American Union appears to resemble all other Confederations Nevertheless, its effects are different Reason of this distinctions between the Union and all other confederations, the American government, not a federal, but an imperfect national government. The United States of America do not afford either the first or the only instance of confederate states, several of which have existed in modern Europe without adverting to those of antiquity. Switzerland, the Germanic Empire, and the Republic of the United Provinces either have been or still are confederations. In studying the constitutions of these different countries, the politician is surprised to observe that the powers with which they invested the federal government are nearly identical with the privileges awarded by the American Constitution to the government of the United States. They confer upon the central power the same rights of making peace and war, of raising money and troops, and of providing for the general exigencies and the common interests of the nation. Nevertheless, the federal government of these different peoples has always been as remarkable for its weakness and inefficiency as that of the Union is for its vigorous and enterprising spirit. Again, the first American Confederation perished through the excessive weakness of its government, and this weak government was, notwithstanding, in possession of rights even more extensive than those of the federal government of the present day. But the more recent Constitution of the United States contains certain principles which exercise a most important influence, although they do not at once strike the observer. This Constitution, which may at first sight be confounded with the Federal Constitutions which preceded it, rests upon a novel theory which may be considered as a great invention in modern political science. In all the confederations which had been formed before the American Constitution of 1789, the Allied States agreed to obey the injunctions of a federal government, but they reserved to themselves the right of ordaining and enforcing the execution of the laws of the Union. The American States which combined in 1789 agreed that the federal government should not only dictate the laws, but that it should execute its own enactments. In both cases, the right is the same, but the exercise of the right is different, 
and this alteration produced the most momentous consequences. In all the confederations which had been formed before the American Union, the federal government demanded its supplies at the hands of the separate governments, and if the measure it prescribed was onerous to any one of those bodies, means were found to evade its claims. If the state was powerful, it had recourse to arms. If it was weak, it connived at the resistance which the law of the Union, its sovereign, met with, and resorted to inaction under the plea of inability. Under these circumstances, one of the two alternatives has invariably occurred. Either the most preponderant of the allied peoples has assumed the privileges of the federal authority and ruled all the states in its name, or the federal government has been abandoned by its natural supporters, anarchy has arisen between the confederates, and the Union has lost all powers of action. In America, the subjects of the Union are not states, but private citizens. The national government levies a tax not upon the state of Massachusetts, but upon each inhabitant of Massachusetts. All former confederate governments presided over communities, but that of the Union rules individuals. Its force is not borrowed, but self-derived, and it is served by its own civil and military officers, by its own army, and its own courts of justice. It cannot be doubted that the spirit of the nation, the passions of the multitude, and the provincial prejudices of each state tend singularly to diminish the authority of a federal authority thus constituted, and to facilitate the means of resistance to its mandates but the comparative weakness of a restricted sovereignty is an evil inherent in the federal system. In America each state has fewer opportunities of resistance and fewer temptations to non-compliance. Nor can such a design be put in execution, if indeed it be entertained, without an open violation of the laws of the Union, a direct interruption of the ordinary course of justice, and a bold declaration of revolt in a word without taking a decisive step which men hesitate to adopt. In all former confederations, the privileges of the Union furnished more elements of discord than of power, since they multiplied the claims of the nation without augmenting the means of enforcing them. And in accordance with this fact, it may be remarked that the real weakness of federal governments has almost always been in the exact ratio of their nominal power. Such is not the case in the American Union, in which, as in ordinary governments, the federal government has the means of enforcing all it is empowered to demand. The human understanding more easily invents new things than new words, and we are thence constrained to employ a multitude of improper and inadequate expressions. When several nations form a permanent league and establish a supreme authority which, although it has not the same influence over the members of the community as a national government, acts upon each of the confederate states in a body, this government, which is so essentially different from all others, is denominated a federal one. Another form of society is afterwards discovered, in which several peoples are fused into one and the same nation with regard to certain common interests, although they remain distinct, or at least only confederate, with regard to all their other concerns. In this case the central power acts directly upon those whom it governs, whom it rules, and whom it judges, in the same manner as, but in a more limited circle than, a national government. Here the term federal government is clearly no longer applicable to a state of things which must be styled an incomplete national government. A form of government has been found out which is neither exactly national nor federal but no further progress has been made, and the new word which will one day designate this novel invention does not yet exist. The absence of this new species of confederation has been the cause which has brought all unions to civil war, to subjection, or to a stagnant apathy, and the peoples which formed these leagues have been either too dull to discern, or too pusillanimous to apply this great remedy. The American Confederation perished by the same defects but the confederate states of america had been long accustomed to form a portion of one empire before they had won their independence they had not contracted the habit of governing themselves and their national prejudices had not taken deep root in their minds 
superior to the rest of the world in political knowledge, and sharing that knowledge equally amongst themselves, they were little agitated by the passions which generally opposed the extension of federal authority in a nation, and those passions were checked by the wisdom of the chief citizens. The Americans applied the remedy with prudent firmness as soon as they were conscious of the evil. They amended their laws, and they saved This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Tassinari. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 8, Part 5. Chapter 8, The Federal Constitution, Part 5. ADVANTAGES OF THE FEDERAL SYSTEM IN GENERAL, AND ITS SPECIAL UTILITY IN AMERICA CHAPTER SUMMARY HAPPINESS AND FREEDOM OF SMALL NATIONS POWER OF GREAT NATIONS GREAT EMPIRES FAVORABLE TO THE GROWTH OF CIVILIZATION STRENGTH OFTEN THE FIRST ELEMENT OF NATIONAL PROSPERITY AIM OF THE FEDERAL SYSTEM TO UNITE THE TWOFOLD ADVANTAGES RESULTING FROM A SMALL AND FROM A LARGE TERRITORY advantages derived by the united states from this system the law adapts itself to the exigencies of the population population does not conform to the exigencies of the law activity amelioration love and enjoyment of freedom in the american communities public spirit of the union the abstract of provincial patriotism principles and things circulate freely over the territory of the united states the Union is happy and free as a little nation, and respected as a great empire. In small nations the scrutiny of society penetrates into every part, and the spirit of improvement enters into the most trifling details. As the ambition of the people is necessarily checked by its weakness, all the efforts and resources of the citizens are turned to the internal benefit of the community and are not likely to evaporate in the fleeting breath of glory. The desires of every individual are limited, because extraordinary faculties are rarely to be met with. The gifts of an equal fortune render the various conditions of life uniform, and the manners of the inhabitants are orderly and simple. Thus, if one estimate the gradations of popular morality and enlightenment, we shall generally find that in small nations there are more persons in easy circumstances, a more numerous population, and a more tranquil state of society than in great empires. When tyranny is established in the bosom of a small nation, it is more galling than elsewhere because, as it acts within a narrow circle, every point of that circle is subject to its direct influence. It supplies the place of those great designs which it cannot entertain by a violent or an exasperating interference in a multitude of minute details, and it leaves the political world, to which it properly belongs, to meddle with the arrangements of domestic life. Tastes as well as actions are to be regulated at its pleasure, and the families of the citizens as well as the affairs of the state are to be governed by its decisions. This invasion of rights occurs, however, but seldom, and freedom is in truth the natural state of small communities. The temptations which the government offers to ambition are too weak, and the resources of private individuals are too slender, for the sovereign power easily to fall within the grasp of a single citizen. And should such an event have occurred, the subjects of the state can without difficulty overthrow the tyrant and his oppression by a simultaneous revolt. Small nations have therefore ever been the cradle of political liberty, and the fact that many of them have lost their immunities by extending their dominion shows that the freedom they enjoyed was more a consequence of the inferior size than of the character of the people. The history of the world affords no instance of a great nation retaining the form of republican government for a long series of years, and this has led to the conclusion that such a state of things is impracticable. 
For my own part, I cannot but censure the imprudence of attempting to limit the possible and to judge the future on the part of a being who is hourly deceived by the most palpable realities of life, and who is constantly taken by surprise in the circumstances with which he is most familiar. But it may be advanced with confidence that the existence of a great republic will always be exposed to far greater perils than that of a small one. All the passions which are most fatal to republican institutions spread with an increasing territory, whilst the virtues which maintain their dignity do not augment in the same proportion. The ambition of the citizens increases with the power of the state, the strength of parties with the importance of the ends they have in view, but that devotion to the common weal which is the surest check on destructive passions is not stronger in a large than in a small republic. It might indeed be proved without difficulty that it is less powerful and less sincere. The arrogance of wealth and the dejection of wretchedness, capital cities of unwanted extent, a lax morality, a vulgar egotism, and a great confusion of interests, are the dangers which almost invariably arise from the magnitude of states. But several of these evils are scarcely prejudicial to a monarchy, and some of them contribute to maintain its existence. In monarchical states, the strength of the government is its own. It may use, but it does not depend on the community, and the authority of the prince is proportioned to the prosperity of the nation. But the only security which a republican government possesses against these evils lies in the support of the majority. This support is not, however, proportionably greater in a large republic than it is in a small one. And thus, whilst the means of attack perpetually increase both in number and in influence, the power of resistance remains the same, or it may rather be said to diminish, since the propensities and interests of the people are diversified by the increase of the population, and the difficulty of forming a compact majority is constantly augmented. It has been observed, moreover, that the intensity of human passions is heightened, not only by the importance of the end which they propose to attain, but by the multitude of individuals who are animated by them at the same time. Every one has had occasion to remark that his emotions in the midst of a sympathizing crowd are far greater than those which he would have felt in solitude. In great republics the impetus of political passion is irresistible, not only because it aims at gigantic purposes, but because it is felt and shared by millions of men at the same time. It may therefore be asserted, as a general proposition, that nothing is more opposed to the well-being and the freedom of man than vast empires. Nevertheless, it is important to acknowledge the peculiar advantages of great states. For the very reason which renders the desire of power more intense in these communities than amongst ordinary men, the love of glory is also more prominent in the hearts of a class of citizens who regard the applause of a great people as a reward worthy of their exertions, and an elevating encouragement to man. If we would learn why it is that great nations contribute more powerfully to the spread of human improvement than small states, we shall discover an adequate cause in the rapid and energetic circulation of ideas, and in those great cities which are the intellectual centers where all the rays of human genius are reflected and combined. To this it may be added that most important discoveries demand a display of national power which the government of a small state is unable to make. In great nations the government entertains a greater number of general notions, and is more completely disengaged from the routine of precedent and the egotism of local prejudice. Its designs are conceived with more talent and executed with more boldness. In time of peace the well-being of small nations is undoubtedly more general and more complete, but they are apt to suffer more acutely from the calamities of war than those great empires whose distant frontiers may for ages avert the presence of the danger from the mass of the people which is therefore more frequently afflicted than ruined by the evil. But in this matter, as in many others, the argument derived from the necessity of the case predominates over all others. If none but small nations existed, I do not doubt that mankind would be more happy and more free, but the existence of great nations is unavoidable. 
This consideration introduces the element of physical strength as a condition of national prosperity. It profits a people but little to be affluent and free if it is perpetually exposed to be pillaged or subjugated. The number of its manufactures and the extent of its commerce are of small advantage if another nation has the empire of the seas and gives the law in all the markets of the globe. Small nations are often impoverished, not because they are small, but because they are weak. The great empires prosper less because they are great than because they are strong. Physical strength is therefore one of the first conditions of the happiness and even of the existence of nations. Hence it occurs that, unless very peculiar circumstances intervene, small nations are always united to large empires in the end, either by force or by their own consent. Yet I am unacquainted with a more deplorable spectacle than that of a people unable either to defend or to maintain its independence. The federal system was created with the intention of combining the different advantages which result from the greater and the lesser extent of nations. And a single glance over the United States of America suffices to discover the advantages which they have derived from its adoption. In great centralized nations, the legislator is obliged to impart a character of uniformity to the laws which does not always suit the diversity of customs and of districts. As he takes no cognizance of special cases, he can only proceed upon general principles, and the population is obliged to conform to the exigencies of the legislation, since the legislation cannot adapt itself to the exigencies and the customs of the population, which is the cause of endless trouble and misery. This disadvantage does not exist in confederations. Congress regulates the principal measures of the national government, and all the details of the administration are reserved to the provincial legislatures. It is impossible to imagine how much this division of sovereignty contributes to the well-being of each of the states which compose the Union. In these small communities, which are never agitated by the desire of aggrandizement or the cares of self-defense, all public authority and private energy is employed in internal amelioration. The central government of each state which is an immediate juxtaposition to the citizens, is daily apprised of the wants which arise in society, and new projects are proposed every year, which are discussed either at town meetings or by the legislature of the state, and which are transmitted by the press to stimulate the zeal and to excite the interest of the citizens. This spirit of amelioration is constantly alive in the American republics, without compromising their tranquillity. The ambition of power yields to the less refined and less dangerous love of comfort. It is generally believed in America that the existence and the permanence of the republican form of government in the New World depend upon the existence and the permanence of the federal system, and it is not unusual to attribute a large share of the misfortunes which have befallen the new states of South America to the injudicious erection of great republics, instead of a divided and confederate sovereignty. It is incontestably true that the love and the habits of republican government in the United States were engendered in the townships and in the provincial assemblies. In a small state like that of Connecticut, for instance, where cutting a canal or laying down a road is a momentous political question, where the state has no army to pay and no wars to carry on, and where much wealth and much honor cannot be bestowed upon the chief citizens, no form of government can be more natural or more appropriate than that of a republic. But it is this same republican spirit, it is these manners and customs of a free people, which are engendered and nurtured in the different states, to be afterwards applied to the country at large. The public spirit of the Union is, so to speak, nothing more than an abstract of the patriotic zeal of the provinces. Every citizen of the United States transfuses his attachment to his little republic in the common store of American patriotism. In defending the Union, he defends the increasing prosperity of his own district, the right of conducting its affairs, and the hope of causing measures of improvement to be adopted which may be favorable to his own interest. And these are motives which are wont to stir men more readily than the general interests of the country in the glory of the nation. 
On the other hand, if the temper and the manners of the inhabitants especially fitted them to promote the welfare of a great republic, the federal system smoothed the obstacles which they might have encountered. The confederation of all the American states presents none of the ordinary disadvantages resulting from great agglomerations of men. The Union is a great republic in extent, but the paucity of objects for which its government provides assimilates it to a small state. Its acts are important, but they are rare. As the sovereignty of the Union is limited and incomplete, its exercise is not incompatible with liberty, for it does not excite those insatiable desires of fame and power which have proved so fatal to great republics. As there is no common center to the country, vast capital cities, colossal wealth, abject poverty, and sudden revolutions are alike unknown and political passion, instead of spreading over the land like a torrent of desolation, spends its strength against the interests and the individual passions of every state. Nevertheless, all commodities and ideas circulate throughout the Union as freely as in a country inhabited by one people. Nothing checks the spirit of enterprise. Government avails itself of the assistance of all who have talents or knowledge to serve it. Within the frontiers of the Union, the profoundest peace prevails, as within the heart of some great empire. Abroad, it ranks with the most powerful nations of the earth. Two thousand miles of coast are open to the commerce of the world, and as it possesses the keys of the globe, its flag is respected in the most remote seas. The Union is as happy and as free as a small people, and as glorious and as strong as a great nation. Why the federal system is not adapted to all peoples, and how the Anglo-Americans were enabled to adopt it. Section Summary Every federal system contains defects which baffle the efforts of the legislator. The federal system is complex. It demands a daily exercise of discretion on the part of the citizens. Practical knowledge of government common amongst the Americans. Relative weakness of the government of the Union, another defect inherent in the federal system. The Americans have diminished without remedying it. The sovereignty of the separate states apparently weaker, but really stronger than that of the Union. Why? Natural causes of Union must exist between Confederate peoples besides the laws. What these causes are amongst the Anglo-Americans. Maine and Georgia, separated by a distance of a thousand miles, more naturally united than Normandy and Brittany. War, the main peril of confederations. This proved even by the example of the United States. The Union has no great wars to fear. Why? Dangers to which Europeans would be exposed if they adopted the federal system of the Americans. When a legislator succeeds, after persevering efforts, in exercising an indirect influence upon the destiny of nations, his genius is lauded by mankind, whilst, in point of fact, the geographical position of the country which he is unable to change, a social condition which arose without his cooperation, manners and opinions which he cannot trace to their source, and an origin with which he is unacquainted, exercise so irresistible an influence over the courses of society, that he is himself borne away by the current after an ineffectual resistance. Like the navigator, he may direct the vessel which bears him along, but he can neither change its structure, nor raise the winds, nor lull the waters which swell beneath him. I have shown the advantages which the Americans derive from their federal system. It remains for me to point out the circumstances which rendered that system practicable as its benefits are not to be enjoyed by all nations. The incidental defects of the federal system which originate in the laws may be corrected by the skill of the legislator, but there are further evils inherent in the system which cannot be counteracted by the peoples which adopt it. These nations must therefore find the strength necessary to support the natural imperfections of their government. The most prominent evil of all federal systems is the very complex nature of the means they employ. Two sovereignties are necessarily in presence of each other. The legislator may simplify and equalize the action of these two sovereignties 
by limiting each of them to a sphere of authority accurately defined, but he cannot combine them into one, or prevent them from coming into collision at certain points. The federal system, therefore, rests upon a theory which is necessarily complicated, and which demands the daily exercise of a considerable share of discretion on the part of those it governs. A proposition must be plain to be adopted by the understanding of a people. A false notion which is clear and precise will always meet with a greater number of adherents in the world than a true principle which is obscure or involved. Hence it arises that parties, which are like small communities in the heart of the nation, invariably adopt some principle or some name as a symbol, which very inadequately represents the end they have in view and the means which are at their disposal, but without which they could neither act nor subsist. The governments which are founded upon a single principle or a single feeling which is easily defined are perhaps not the best, but they are unquestionably the strongest and the most durable in the world. In examining the Constitution of the United States, which is the most perfect federal constitution that ever existed, one is startled, on the other hand, at the variety of information and the excellence of discretion which it presupposes in the people whom it is meant to govern. The government of the Union depends entirely upon legal fictions. The Union is an ideal nation which only exists in the mind, and whose limits and extent can only be discerned by the understanding. When once the general theory is comprehended, numberless difficulties remain to be solved in its application. For the sovereignty of the Union is so involved in that of the States that it is impossible to distinguish its boundaries at the first glance. The whole structure of the government is artificial and conventional, and it would be ill-adapted to a people which has not been long accustomed to conduct its own affairs, or to one in which the science of politics has not descended to the humblest classes of society. I have never been more struck by the good sense and the practical judgment of the Americans than in the ingenious devices by which they elude the numberless difficulties resulting from their federal constitution. I scarcely ever met with a plain American citizen who could not distinguish, with surprising facility, the obligations created by the laws of Congress from those created by the laws of his own state, and who, after having discriminated between the matters which come under the cognizance of the Union and those which the local legislature is competent to regulate, could not point out the exact limit of the several jurisdictions of the federal courts and the tribunals of the state. The Constitution of the United States is like those exquisite productions of human industry which ensure wealth and renown to their inventors, but which are profitless in any other hands. This truth is exemplified by the condition of Mexico at the present time. The Mexicans were desirous of establishing a federal system, and they took the federal constitution of their neighbors, the Anglo-Americans, as their model, and copied it with considerable accuracy. But although they had borrowed the letter of the law, they were unable to create or to introduce the spirit and the sense which give it life. They were involved in ceaseless embarrassments between the mechanism of their double government. The sovereignty of the states and that of the Union perpetually exceeded their respective privileges and entered into collision. And to the present day Mexico is alternately the victim of anarchy and the slave of military despotism. The second, and the most fatal of all the defects I have alluded to, and that which I believe to be inherent in the federal system, is the relative weakness of the government of the Union. The principle upon which all confederations rest is that of a divided sovereignty. The legislator may render this partition less perceptible, he may even conceal it for a time from the public eye, but he cannot prevent it from existing and a divided sovereignty must always be less powerful than an entire supremacy. The reader has seen in the remarks I have made on the Constitution of the United States that the Americans have displayed singular ingenuity in combining the restriction of the power of the Union within the narrow limits of a federal government with the semblance and, to a certain extent, with the force of a national government. By this means the legislators of the Union have succeeded in diminishing, though not in counteracting, the natural danger of confederations. 
It has been remarked that the American government does not apply itself to the states, but that it immediately transmits its injunctions to the citizens, and compels them as isolated individuals to comply with its demands. But if the federal law were to clash with the interests and the prejudices of a state, it might be feared that all the citizens of that state would conceive themselves to be interested in the cause of a single individual who should refuse to obey. If all the citizens of the state were aggrieved at the same time, and in the same manner by the authority of the Union, the federal government would vainly attempt to subdue them individually. They would instinctively unite in a common defense, and they would derive a ready prepared organization from the share of sovereignty which the institution of their state allows them to enjoy. Fiction would give way to reality, and an organized portion of the territory might then contest the central authority. The same observation holds good with regard to the federal jurisdiction. If the courts of the Union violated an important law of a state in a private case, the real, if not the apparent, contest would arise between the aggrieved state, represented by a citizen, and the Union, represented by its courts of justice. He would have but a partial knowledge of the world who should imagine that it is possible, by the aid of legal fictions, to prevent men from finding out and employing those means of gratifying their passions which have been left open to them. And it may be doubted whether the American legislators, when they rendered a collision between the two sovereigns less probable, destroyed the cause of such a misfortune. But it may even be affirmed that they were unable to ensure the preponderance of the federal element in a case of this kind. The Union is possessed of money and of troops, but the affections and the prejudices of the people are in the bosom of the states. The sovereignty of the Union is an abstract being, which is connected with but few external objects. The sovereignty of the states is hourly perceptible, easily understood, constantly active, and if the former is of recent creation, the latter is coeval with the people itself. The sovereignty of the Union is fractious, that of the states is natural and derives its existence from its own simple influence, like the authority of a parent. The supreme power of the nation only affects a few of the chief interests of society. It represents an immense but remote country, and claims a feeling of patriotism which is vague and ill-defined. But the authority of the states controls every individual citizen, at every hour and in all circumstances. It protects his property, his freedom, and his life, and when we recollect the traditions, the customs, the prejudices of local and familiar attachment with which it is connected, we cannot doubt of the superiority of a power which is interwoven with every circumstance that renders the love of one's native country instinctive in the human heart. Since legislators are unable to obviate such dangerous collisions as occur between the two sovereignties which coexist in the federal system, their first object must be not only to dissuade the Confederate States from warfare, but to encourage such institutions as may promote the maintenance of peace. Hence it results that the Federal Compact cannot be lasting unless there exists in the communities which are leagued together a certain number of inducements to union which render their common dependence agreeable, and the task of the government light and that system cannot succeed without the presence of favorable circumstances added to the influence of good laws. All the peoples which have ever formed a confederation have been held together by a certain number of common interests, which served as the intellectual ties of association. But the sentiments and the principles of man must be taken into consideration, as well as his immediate interests. A certain uniformity of civilization is not less necessary to the durability of a confederation than a uniformity of interests in the states which compose it. In Switzerland the difference which exists between the canton of Uri and the canton of Vaud is equal to that between the 15th and the 19th centuries, and properly speaking Switzerland has never possessed a federal government. The union between these two cantons only subsists upon the map and their discrepancies would soon be perceived if an attempt were made by a central authority to prescribe the same laws to the whole territory. One of the circumstances which most powerfully contribute to support the federal government in America 
is that the states have not only similar interests, a common origin, and a common tongue, but that they are also arrived at the same stage of civilization, which almost always renders a union feasible. I do not know of any European nation, how small soever it may be, which does not present less uniformity in its different provinces than the American people, which occupies a territory as extensive as one half of Europe. The distance from the state of Maine to that of Georgia is reckoned at about one thousand miles, but the difference between the civilization of Maine and that of Georgia is slighter than the difference between the habits of Normandy and those of Brittany. Maine and Georgia, which are placed at the opposite extremities of a great empire, are consequently in the natural possession of more real inducements to form a confederation than Normandy and Brittany, which are only separated by a bridge. The geographical position of the country contributed to increase the facilities which the American legislators derived from the manners and customs of the inhabitants, and it is to this circumstance that the adoption and the maintenance of the federal system are mainly attributable. The most important occurrence which can mark the annals of a people is the breaking out of a war. In war, a people struggles with the energy of a single man against foreign nations in the defense of its very existence. The skill of a government, the good sense of the community, and the natural fondness which men entertain for their country, may suffice to maintain peace in the interior of a district, and to favor its internal prosperity. But a nation can only carry on a great war at the cost of more numerous and more painful sacrifices and to suppose that a great number of men will of their own accord comply with these exigencies of the state is to betray an ignorance of mankind. All the peoples which have been obliged to sustain a long and serious warfare have consequently been led to augment the power of their government. Those which have not succeeded in this attempt have been subjugated. A long war almost always places nations in the wretched alternative of being abandoned to ruin by defeat, or to despotism by success. War, therefore, renders the symptoms of the weakness of a government most palpable and most alarming, and I have shown that the inherent defeat of federal governments is that of being weak. The federal system is not only deficient in every kind of centralized administration, but the central government itself is imperfectly organized which is invariably an influential cause of inferiority when the nation is opposed to other countries which are themselves governed by a single authority. In the Federal Constitution of the United States, by which the central government possesses more real force, this evil is still extremely sensible. An example will illustrate the case to the reader. The Constitution confers upon Congress the right of calling forth militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. And another article declares that the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the Militia. In the War of 1812, the President ordered the Militia of the Northern States to march to the frontiers. But Connecticut and Massachusetts, whose interests were impaired by the war, refused to obey the command. They argued that the Constitution authorizes the federal government to call forth the militia in case of insurrection or invasion, but that in the present instance there was neither invasion nor insurrection. They added that the same Constitution which conferred upon the Union the right of calling forth the militia reserved to the states that of naming the officers, and that consequently, as they understood the clause, no officer of the Union had any right to command the militia, even during war, except the President in person, and in this case they were ordered to join an army commanded by another individual. These absurd and pernicious doctrines received the sanction not only of the governors and the legislative bodies, but also of the courts of justice in both states, and the federal government was constrained to raise elsewhere the troops which it required. The only safeguard which the American Union, with all the relative perfection of its laws, possesses against the dissolution which would be produced by a great war, lies in its probable exemption from that calamity. Placed in the center of an immense continent, which offers a boundless field for human industry, the Union is almost as much insulated from the world as if its frontiers were girt by the ocean. Canada contains only a million of inhabitants 
and its population is divided into two inimical nations. The rigor of the climate limits the extension of its territory, and shuts up its ports during the six months of winter. From Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, a few savage tribes are to be met with, which retire, perishing in their retreat, before six thousand soldiers. To the south, the Union has a point of contact with the Empire of Mexico, and it is thence that serious hostilities may one day be expected to arise. But for a long while to come, the uncivilized state of the Mexican community, the depravity of its morals, and its extreme poverty, will prevent that country from ranking high amongst nations. As for the powers of Europe, they are too distant to be formidable. The great advantage of the United States does not, then, consist in a federal constitution which allows them to carry on great wars, but in a geographical position which renders such enterprises extremely improbable. No one can be more inclined than I am myself to appreciate the advantages of the federal system, which I hold to be one of the combinations most favorable to the prosperity and freedom of man. I envy the lot of those nations which have been enabled to adopt it, but I cannot believe that any confederate peoples could maintain a long or an equal contest with a nation of similar strength in which the government should be centralized. A people which should divide its sovereignty into fractional powers, in the presence of the great military monarchies of Europe, would, in my opinion, by that very act, abdicate its power, and perhaps its existence and its name. But such is the admirable position of the new world that man has no other enemy than himself, and that, in order to be happy and to be free, it suffices to seek the gifts of prosperity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Gilbert. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 9. Why the people may strictly be said to govern in the United States. I have hitherto examined the institutions of the United States. I have passed their legislation in review, and I have depicted the present characteristics of political society in that country. But a sovereign power exists above these institutions, and beyond these characteristic features, which may destroy or modify them at its pleasure. I mean that of the people. It remains to be shown in what manner this power which regulates the laws, acts, its propensities and its passions remain to be pointed out, as well as the secret springs which retard, accelerate, or direct its irresistible course, and the effects of its unbounded authority with the destiny which is probably reserved for it. In America, the people appoints the legislative and the executive power, and furnishes the jurors who punish all offenses against the laws. The American institutions are democratic, not only in their principle, but in all their consequences, and the people elects its representatives directly, and for the most part annually, in order to ensure their dependence. The people is therefore the real directing power, and although the form of government is representative, it is evident that the opinions, the prejudices, the interests, and even the passions of the community are hindered by no durable obstacles from exercising a perpetual influence on society. In the United States, the majority governs in the name of the people, as is the case in all the countries in which the people is supreme. The majority is principally composed of peaceful citizens who, 
either by inclination or by interest, are sincerely desirous of the welfare of their country, but they are surrounded by the incessant agitation of parties, which attempt to gain their cooperation This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Gilbert. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 10 Parties in the United States. CHAPTER SUMMARY GREAT DISTINCTION TO BE MADE BETWEEN PARTIES PARTIES WHICH ARE TO EACH OTHER AS RIVAL NATIONS PARTIES PROPERLY SO CALLED DIFFERENCE BETWEEN GREAT AND SMALL PARTIES EPICS WHICH PRODUCED THEM THEIR CHARACTERISTICS AMERICA HAS HAD GREAT PARTIES THEY ARE EXTINCT Federalists, Republicans, Defeat of the Federalists, Difficulty of Creating Parties in the United States, What is Done with This Intention, Aristocratic or Democratic Character to be Met with in All Parties, Struggle of General Jackson Against the Bank. Parties in the United States. A great distinction must be made between parties. Some countries are so large that the different populations which inhabit them have contradictory interests, although they are the subjects of the same government, and they may hence be in a perpetual state of opposition. In this case, the different factions of the people may more properly be considered as distinct nations than as mere parties, and if a civil war breaks out, the struggle is carried on by rival peoples rather than by factions in the state. But when the citizens entertain different opinions upon subjects which affect the whole country alike, such, for instance, as the principles upon which the government is to be conducted, then distinctions arise which may correctly be styled parties. Parties are a necessary evil in free governments, but they have not at all times the same character and the same propensities. At certain periods a nation may be oppressed by such insupportable evils as to conceive the design of effecting a total change in its political constitution. At other times, the mischief lies still deeper, and the existence of society itself is endangered. Such are the times of great revolutions and of great parties. But between these epochs of misery and of confusion, there are periods during which human society seems to rest, and mankind to take a pause. This pause is, indeed, only apparent, for time does not stop its course for nations any more than for men. They are all advancing towards a goal with which they are unacquainted, and we only imagine them to be stationary, when their progress escapes our observation as men who are going at a foot-pace seem to be standing still to those who run. But however this may be, there are certain epochs in which the changes that take place in the social and political constitution of nations are so slow and so insensitive that men imagine their present condition to be a final state, and the human mind 
believing itself to be firmly based upon certain foundations, does not extend its researches beyond the horizon which it decries. These are the times of small parties and of intrigue. The political parties which I style great are those which cling to principles more than to their consequences, to general and not to especial cases, to ideas and not to men. These parties are usually distinguished by a nobler character, a more generous passions, more genuine convictions, and a more bold and open conduct than the others. In them private interests, which always plays the chief part in political passions, is more studiously veiled under the pretext of the public good, and it may even be sometimes concealed from the eyes of the very person whom it excites and impels. Minor parties are, on the other hand, generally deficient in political faith, as they are not sustained or dignified by a lofty purpose. They ostensibly display the egotism of their character in their actions. They glow with a factious zeal. Their language is vehement but their conduct is timid and irresolute. The means they employ are as wretched as the end at which they aim. Hence it arises that when a calm state of things succeeds a violent revolution, the leaders of society seem suddenly to disappear, and the powers of the human mind to lie concealed. Society is convulsed by great parties, by minor ones it is agitated. It is torn by the former, by the latter it is degraded, and if these sometimes save it a salutary perturbation, those invariably disturb it to no good end. America has already lost the great parties which once divided the nation, and if her happiness is considerably increased, her morality has suffered by their extinction. When the war of independence was terminated, and the foundations of the new government were to be laid down, the nation was divided between two opinions, two opinions which are as old as the world, and which are perpetually to be met with under all forms and all the names which have ever obtained in free communities the one tending to limit, the other to extend indefinitely the power of the people. The conflict of these two opinions never assumed that degree of violence in America which it has frequently displayed elsewhere. Both parties of the Americans were, in fact, agreed upon the most essential points, and neither of them had to destroy a traditionally constitution, or to overthrow the structure of society, in order to ensure its own triumph. In neither of them, consequently, were a great number of private interests affected by success or by defeat. But moral principles of a high order, such as the love of equality and of independence, were concerned in the struggle, and they sufficed to kindle violent passions. The party which desired to limit the power of the people endeavored to apply its doctrines more especially to the Constitution of the Union, whence it derived its name of Federal. The other party, which affected to be more exclusively attached to the cause of liberty, took that of Republican. America is a land of democracy, and the Federalists were always in a minority, but they reckoned on their side almost all the great men who had been called forth by the War of Independence, and their moral influence was very considerable. Their cause was, moreover, favored by circumstances. The ruin of the Confederation had impressed the people with a dread of anarchy and the Federalists did not fail to profit 
by this transient disposition of the multitude. For ten or twelve years they were at the head of affairs, and they were able to apply some, though not all, of their principles, for the hostile current was becoming from day to day too violent to be checked or stemmed. In 1801 the Republicans got possession of the government. Thomas Jefferson was named President, and he increased the influence of their party by the weight of his celebrity, the greatness of his talents, and the immense extent of his popularity. The means by which the Federalists had maintained their position were artificial, and their resources were temporary. It was by the virtues or the talents of their leaders that they had risen to power. When the Republicans attained to that lofty station, their opponents were overwhelmed by utter defeat. An immense majority declared itself against the retiring party, and the Federalists found themselves in so small a minority that they at once despaired of their future success. From that moment the Republican or Democratic Party has proceeded from conquest to conquest until it has acquired absolute supremacy in the country. The Federalists, perceiving that they were vanquished without resource and isolated in the midst of the nation, fell into two divisions, of which one joined the victorious Republicans and the other abandoned its rallying point and its name. Many years have already elapsed since they ceased to exist as a party. Great political parties are not, then, to be met with in the United States at the present time. Parties, indeed, may be found which threaten the future tranquility of the Union, but there are none which seem to contest the present form of government or the present course of society. The parties by which the Union is menaced do not rest upon abstract principles, but upon temporal interests. These interests, disseminated in the provinces of so vast an empire, may be said to constitute rival nations rather than parties. Thus, upon a recent occasion, the North contended for the system of commercial prohibition, and the South took up arms in favor of free trade simply because the North is a manufacturing and the South an agricultural district, and that the restrictive systems which was profitable to the one was prejudicial to the other. In the absence of great parties, the United States abound with lesser controversies, and public opinion is divided into a thousand minute shades of difference upon questions of very little moment. The pains which are taken to create parties are inconceivable, and at the present day it is no easy task. In the United States there is no religious animosity, because all religion is respected, and no sect is predominant. There is no jealousy of rank, because the people is everything, and none can contest its authority. Lastly, there is no public indulgence to supply the means of agitation, because the physical position of the country opens so wide a field to industry that man is able to accomplish the most surprising undertakings with his own native resources. Nevertheless, ambitious men are interested in the creation of parties, since it is difficult to elect a person from authority upon the mere ground that his place is coveted by others. The skill of the actors in the political world lies, therefore, in the art of creating parties. A political aspirant in the United States begins by discriminating his own political interest, and by calculating upon those interests which may be collected around the amalgamated with it. He then contrives to discover some doctrine or some principle which may suit the purpose of this new association, and which he adopts in order to bring forward his party and to secure his popularity. Just as the imprinture of a king 
was in former days incorporated with the volume which it authorized, but to which it nowise belonged. When these preliminaries are terminated, the new party is ushered into the political world. All the domestic controversies of the Americans at first appear to be stranger to be so incomprehensible and so puerile that he is at a loss whether to pity the people which take such ardent trifles in good earnest, or to envy the happiness which enables it to discuss them. But when he comes to study the secret propensities which govern the factions of America, he easily perceives that the greater part of them are more or less connected with one or the other of those two divisions which have always existed in free communities. The deeper we penetrate into the working of these parties, the more do we perceive that the object of the one is to limit, and that of the other to extend, the popular authority. I do not assert that the ostensible end, or even that the secret aim of American parties, is to promote the rule of aristocracy or democracy in the country. But I affirm that aristocratic or democratic positions may easily be detected at the bottom of all parties, and that although they escape a superficial observation, they are the main point and the main soul of every faction in the United States. To quote a recent example, when the President attacked the bank, the country was excited and parties were formed. The well-formed classes rallied around the bank, the common people round the President. But it must not be imagined that the people had formed a rational opinion upon a question which offers so many difficulties to the most experienced statesman. The bank is a great establishment which enjoys an independent existence and the people, accustomed to make and unmake whatsoever it pleases, is startled to meet with this obstacle to its authority. In the midst of the perpetual fluctuations of society, the community is irritated by so permanent an institution, and is led to attack it in order to see whether it can be shaken and controlled like all other institutions of the country remains of the aristocratic party in the United States. Secret opposition to wealthy individuals to democracy, their retirement, their taste for exclusive pleasures and for luxury at home, their simplicity abroad, their affected condescension towards the people. It sometimes happens in people which various opinions prevail that the balance of the several parties is lost and one of them obtains an irresistible preponderance, overpowers all obstacles, harasses its opponents, and appropriates all the resources of society to its own purpose. The vanquished citizens despair of success, and they conceal their dissatisfaction in silence and in general apathy. The nation seems to be governed by a single principle, and the prevailing party assumes the credit of having restored peace and unanimity to the country. But this apparent unanimity is merely a cloak to a alarming dissensions and perpetual opposition. This is precisely what occurred in America. When the Democratic Party got the upper hand, it took exclusive possession of the conduct of affairs, and from that time the laws and the customs of society have been adapted to its caprices. At the present day, the more affluent classes of society are so entirely removed from the direction of political affairs in the United States that wealth, far from conferring a right to the exercise of power, is rather an obstacle than a means of attaining to it. The wealthy members of the community abandon the lists through unwillingness to contend and frequently to contend in vain against the poorest classes of their fellow citizens. They concentrate all their enjoyments in the privacy of their homes, where they occupy a rank which cannot be assumed in public. They constitute a private society in the state, 
which has its own tastes and its own pleasures. They substitute to this state of things as an irredeemable evil, but they are careful not to show that they are galled by its continence. It is even not uncommon to hear them laud the delights of a republican government and the advantages of democratic institutions when they are in public. Next to hating their enemies, men are most inclined to flatter them. Mark, for instance, that opulent citizen, who is as anxious as a Jew of the Middle Ages to conceal his wealth. His dress is plain, his demeanor unassuming, but the interior of his dwelling glitters with luxury, and none but a few chosen guests, whom he haughtily styles his equals, are allowed to penetrate into this sanctuary. No European noble is more exclusive in his pleasures, or more jealous of the smallest advantages which his privileged station confers upon him. But the very same individual crosses the city to reach a dark counting-house in the center of traffic, where every one may accost him who pleases. If he meets his cobbler on the way, they stop and converse. The two citizens discuss the affairs of the state, in which they have an equal interest, and they shake hands before they part. But beneath this artificial enthusiasm, and these obsequious attentions to the prepondering power, it is easy to perceive that the wealthy members of the community entertain a hearty distaste to the democratic institutions of their country. The populace is at once the object of their scorn and of their fears. If the maladministration of the democracy ever brings about a revolutionary crisis, and if monarchical institutions ever become practicable in the United States, the truth of what I advise will become obvious. The two chief weapons which parties use in order to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more information and to learn how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Christian Picot at CommunistRevolution.org. Democracy in America by Alex de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve Chapter 11 Liberty of the Press in the United States Chapter Summary Difficulty of Restraining the Liberty of the Press Particular Reasons Which Some Nations Have to Cherish This Liberty the liberty of the press a necessary consequence of the sovereignty of the people, as it is understood in America. Violent language of the periodical press in the United States. Propensities of the periodical press. Illustrated by the United States. Opinion of the Americans upon the repression of the abuse of the liberty of the press by judicial prosecutions. Reasons for which the press is less powerful in America than in France. The influence of the liberty of the press does not affect political opinions alone, but it extends to all the opinions of men and it modifies customs as well as laws. In another part of this work I shall attempt to determinate the degree of influence which the liberty of the press has exercised upon civil society in the United States, and to point out the direction which it has given to the ideas as well as the tone which it has imparted to the character and the feelings 
of the Anglo-Americans. But at present I purpose simply to examine the effects produced by the liberty of the press in the political world. I confess that I do not entertain that firm and complete attachment to the liberty of the press which things that are supremely good in their very nature are wont to excite in the mind. And I approve of it more from a recollection of the evils it prevents than from a consideration of the advantages it ensures. If anyone could point out an intermediate and yet a tenable position between the complete independence and the entire subjection of the public expression of opinion, I should perhaps be inclined to adopt it. But the difficulty is to discover this position. If it is your intention to correct the abuses of unlicensed printing and to restore the use of orderly language, you may in the first instance try the offender by a jury but if the jury acquits him, the opinion, which was that of a single individual, becomes the opinion of the country at large. Too much and too little has therefore hitherto been done. If you proceed, you must bring the delinquent before a court of permanent judges. But even here the cause must be heard before it can be decided and the very principles which no book would have ventured to avow are blazoned forth in the pleadings, and what was obscurely hinted at in a single composition is then repeated in a multitude of other publications. The language in which a thought is embodied is the mere carcass of the thought, and not the idea itself. Tribunals may condemn the form, but the sense and spirit of the work is too subtle for their authority. Too much has still been done to recede, too little to attain your end. You must therefore proceed. If you establish a censorship of the press, the tongue of the public speaker will still make itself heard and you have only increased the mischief. The powers of thought do not rely, like the powers of physical strength, upon the number of their mechanical agents. Nor can a host of authors be reckoned like the troops which compose an army. On the contrary, the authority of a principle is often increased by the smallness of the number of men by whom it is expressed. The words of a strong-minded man, which penetrate amidst the passions of a listening assembly, have more power than the vociferations of a thousand orators. And, if it be allowed to speak freely in any public place, the consequence is the same as if free speaking was allowed in every village. The liberty of discourse must therefore be destroyed, as well as the liberty of the press. This is the necessary term of your efforts. But if your object was to repress the abuses of liberty, they have brought you to the feet of a despot. You have been led from the extreme of independence to the extreme of subjection, without meeting with a single tenable position for shelter or repose. There are certain nations which have peculiar reasons for cherishing the liberty of the press, independently of the general motives which I have just pointed out. For in certain countries which profess to enjoy the privileges of freedom, every individual agent of the government may violate the laws with impunity, since those whom he oppresses cannot prosecute him before the courts of justice. In this case, the liberty of the press is not merely a guarantee, but it is the only guarantee of their liberty and their security which the citizens possess. 
If the rulers of these nations proposed to abolish the independence of the press, the people would be justified in saying, Give us the right of prosecuting your offenses before the ordinary tribunals, and perhaps we may then waive our right of appeal to the tribunal of public opinion. But in the countries in which the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people ostensibly prevails, the censorship of the press is not only dangerous, but it is absurd. When the right of every citizen to cooperate in the government of society is acknowledged, every citizen must be presumed to possess the power of discriminating between the different opinions of his contemporaries, and of appreciating the different facts from which inferences may be drawn. The sovereignty of the people and the liberty of the press may therefore be looked upon as correlative institutions just as the censorship of the press and universal suffrage are two things which are irreconcilably opposed, and which cannot long be retained among the institutions of the same people. Not a single individual of the twelve millions who inhabit the territory of the United States has as yet dared to propose any restrictions to the liberty of the press. The first newspaper over which I cast my eyes upon my arrival in America contained the following article. In all this affair the language of Jackson has been that of a heartless despot, solely occupied with the preservation of his own authority. Ambition is his crime, and it will be his punishment too. Intrigue is his native element and intrigue will confound his tricks, and will deprive him of his power. He governs by means of corruption, and his immoral practices will redound to his shame and confusion. His conduct in the political arena has been that of a shameless and lawless gamester. He succeeded at the time, but the hour of retribution approaches, and he will be obliged to disgorge his winnings, to throw aside his false dice, and to end his days in some retirement, where he may curse his madness at his leisure. For repentance is a virtue with which his heart is likely to remain forever unacquainted. It is not uncommonly imagined in France that the virulence of the press originates in the uncertain social condition, in the political excitement, and the general sense of consequent evil which prevail in that country. And it is therefore supposed that as soon as society has resumed a certain degree of composure, the press will abandon its present vehemence. I am inclined to think that the above causes explain the reason of the extraordinary ascendancy it has acquired over the nation, but that they do not exercise much influence upon the tone of its language. The periodical press appears to me to be actuated by passions and propensities independent of the circumstances in which it is placed and the present position of America corroborates this opinion. America is perhaps, at this moment, the country of the world which contains the fewest germs of revolution. But the press is not less destructive in its principles than in France, and it displays the same violence without the same reasons for indignation. In America, as in France, it constitutes a singular power, so strangely composed of mingled good and evil, that it is at the same time indispensable to the existence of freedom, and nearly incompatible with the maintenance of public order. 
its power is certainly much greater in France than in the United States. Though nothing is more rare in the latter country than to hear of a prosecution having been instituted against it. The reason of this is perfectly simple. The Americans, having once admitted the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people, apply it with perfect consistency. It was never their intention to found a permanent state of things with elements which undergo daily modifications, and there is consequently nothing criminal in an attack upon the existing laws, provided it be not attended with a violent infraction of them. They are, moreover, of opinion that courts of justice are unable to check the abuses of the press, and that as the subtlety of human language perpetually eludes the severity of judicial analysis, offenses of this nature are apt to escape the hand which attempts to apprehend them. They hold that to act with efficacy upon the press it would be necessary to find a tribunal not only devoted to the existing order of things but capable of surmounting the influence of public opinion. A tribunal which should conduct its proceedings without publicity, which should pronounce its decrees without assigning its motives, and punish the intentions even more than the language of an author. Whosoever should have the power of creating and maintaining a tribunal of this kind would waste his time in prosecuting the liberty of the press, for he would be the supreme master of the whole community, and he would be as free to rid himself of the authors as of their writings. In this question, therefore, there is no medium between servitude and extreme license. In order to enjoy the inestimable benefits which the liberty of the press ensures, it is necessary to submit to the inevitable evils which it engenders. To expect to acquire the former, and to escape the latter, is to cherish one of those illusions which commonly misled nations in their times of sickness, when, tired with faction and exhausted by effort, they attempt to combine hostile opinions and contrary principles upon the same soil. The small influence of the American journals is attributable to several reasons, amongst which are the following. The liberty of writing, like all other liberty, is most formidable when it is a novelty. For a people which has never been accustomed to cooperate in the conduct of state affairs places implicit confidence in the first tribune who arouses its attention. The Anglo-Americans have enjoyed this liberty ever since the foundation of the settlements. Moreover, the press cannot create human passions by its own power however skillfully it may kindle them where they exist. In America, politics are discussed with animation and a varied activity, but they rarely touch those deep passions which are excited whenever the positive interest of a part of the community is impaired. But in the United States, the interests of the community are in a most prosperous condition. A single glance upon a French and an American newspaper is sufficient to show the difference which exists between the two nations on this head. In France, the space allotted to commercial advertisements is very limited, and the intelligence is not considerable, but the most essential part of the journal is that which contains the discussion of the politics of the day. 
In America, three-quarters of the enormous sheet which is set before the reader are filled with advertisements, and the remainder is frequently occupied by political intelligence or trivial anecdotes. It is only from time to time that one finds a corner devoted to passionate discussions like those with which the journalists of France are wont to indulge their readers. It has been demonstrated by observation and discovered by the innate sagacity of the pettiest as well as the greatest of despots that the influence of a power is increased in proportion as its direction is rendered more central. In France, the press combines a twofold centralization. Almost all its power is centered in the same spot, and vested in the same hands, for its organs are far from numerous. The influence of a public press thus constituted upon a skeptical nation must be unbounded. It is an enemy with which a government may sign an occasional truce, but which it is difficult to resist for any length of time. Neither of these kinds of centralization exists in America. The United States have no metropolis. The intelligence as well as the power of the country are dispersed abroad, and instead of radiating from a point they cross each other in every direction. The Americans have established no central control over the expression of opinion, any more than over the conduct of business. These are circumstances which do not depend on human foresight, but it is owing to the laws of the Union that there are no licenses to be granted to printers no securities demanded from editors, as in France, and no stamp duty, as in France, and formerly in England. The consequence of this is that nothing is easier than to set up a newspaper, and a small number of readers suffices to defray the expenses of the editor. The number of periodical and occasional publications which appears in the United States actually surpasses belief. The most enlightened Americans attribute the subordinate influence of the press to this excessive dissemination, and it is adopted as an axiom of political science in that country that the only way to neutralize the effect of public journals is to multiply them indefinitely. I cannot conceive that a truth which is so self-evident should not already have been more generally admitted in Europe. It is comprehensible that the persons who hope to bring about revolutions by means of the press should be desirous of confining its action to a few powerful organs. But it is perfectly incredible that the partisans of the existing state of things and the natural supporters of the law should attempt to diminish the influence of the press by concentrating its authority. The governments of Europe seem to treat the press with the courtesy of the knights of old. They are anxious to furnish it with the same central power which they have found to be so trusty a weapon in order to enhance the glory of their resistance to its attacks. In America, there is scarcely a hamlet which has not its own newspaper. It may readily be imagined that neither discipline nor unity of design can be communicated to so multifarious a host, and each one is consequently led to fight under his own standard. All the political journals of the United States are indeed arrayed on the side of the administration or against it, but they attack and defend in a thousand different ways. 
they cannot succeed in forming those great currents of opinion which overwhelm the most solid obstacles. This division of the influence of the press produces a variety of other consequences which are scarcely less remarkable. The facility with which journals can be established induces a multitude of individuals to take a part in them. But as the extent of competition precludes the possibility of considerable profit, the most distinguished classes of society are rarely led to engage in these undertakings. But such is the number of the public prints that, even if they were a source of wealth, writers of ability could not be found to direct them all. The journalists of the United States are usually placed in a very humble position, with a scanty education and a vulgar turn of mind. The will of the majority is the most general of laws, and it establishes certain habits which form the characteristics of each peculiar class of society. Thus it dictates the etiquette practiced at courts and the etiquette of the bar. The characteristics of the French journalist consist in a violent, but frequently an eloquent and lofty manner of discussing the politics of the day, and the exceptions to this habitual practice are only occasional. The characteristics of the American journalist consist in an open and coarse appeal to the passions of the populace, and he habitually abandons the principles of political science to assail the characters of individuals, to track them into private life, and to disclose all their weaknesses and errors. Nothing can be more deplorable than this abuse of the powers of thought. I shall have occasion to point out hereafter the influence of the newspapers upon the taste and the morality of the American people, but my present subject exclusively concerns the political world. It cannot be denied that the effects of this extreme license of the press tend indirectly to the maintenance of public order. The individuals who are already in the possession of a high station in the esteem of their fellow citizens are afraid to write in the newspapers, and they are thus deprived of the most powerful instrument which they can use to excite the passions of the multitude to their own advantage. Note, they only write in the papers when they choose to address the people in their own name as, for instance, when they are called upon to repel calumnious imputations and to correct a misstatement of facts. The personal opinions of the editors have no kind of weight in the eyes of the public. The only use of a journal is that it imparts the knowledge of certain facts, and it is only by altering or distorting those facts that a journalist can contribute to the support of his own views. But although the press is limited to these resources, its influence in America is immense. It is the power which impels the circulation of political life through all the districts of that vast territory. Its eye is constantly open to detect the secret springs of political designs and to summon the leaders of all parties to the bar of public opinion. It rallies the interests of the community round certain principles, and it draws up the creed which factions adopt, for it affords a means of intercourse between parties which hear and which address each other without ever having been in immediate contact. When a great number of the organs of the press adopt the same line of conduct, their influence becomes irresistible, and public opinion, when it is perpetually assailed from the same side, 
eventually yields to the attack. In the United States, each separate journal exercises but little authority, but the power of the periodical press is only second to that of the people. The opinions established in the United States under the empire of the liberty of the press are frequently more firmly rooted than those which are formed elsewhere under the sanction of a censor. In the United States, the democracy perpetually raises fresh individuals to the conduct of public affairs, and the measures of the administration are consequently seldom regulated by the strict rules of consistency or of order. But the general principles of the government are more stable, and the opinions most prevalent in society are generally more durable than in many other countries. When once the Americans have taken up an idea, whether it be well or ill-founded, nothing is more difficult than to eradicate it from their minds. The same tenacity of opinion has been observed in England, where, for the last century, greater freedom of conscience and more invincible prejudices have existed than in all the other countries of Europe. I attribute this consequence to a cause which may at first sight appear to have a very opposite tendency, namely, to the liberty of the press. The nations amongst which this liberty exists are as apt to cling to their opinions from pride as from conviction. They cherish them because they hold them to be just, and because they exercise their own free will in choosing them. And they maintain them not only because they are true, but because they are their own. Several other reasons conduce to the same end. It was remarked by a man of genius that ignorance lies at the two ends of knowledge. Perhaps it would have been more correct to have said that absolute convictions are to be met with at the two extremities, and that doubt lies in the middle. For the human intellect may be considered in three distinct states, which frequently succeed one another. A man believes implicitly because he adopts a proposition without inquiry. He doubts as soon as he is assailed by the objections which his inquiries may have aroused. But he frequently succeeds in satisfying these doubts and then he begins to believe afresh. He no longer lays hold on a truth in its most shadowy and uncertain form, but he sees it clearly before him, and he advances onwards by the light it gives him. Note. It may, however, be doubted whether this rational and self-guiding conviction arouses as much fervor or enthusiastic devotedness in men as their first dogmatical belief. End note. When the liberty of the press acts upon men who are in the first of these three states, it does not immediately disturb their habit of believing implicitly without investigation, but it constantly modifies the objects of their intuitive convictions. The human mind continues to discern but one point upon the whole intellectual horizon, and that point is in continual motion. Such are the symptoms of sudden revolutions, and of the misfortunes which are sure to befall those generations which abruptly adopt the unconditional freedom of the press. The circle of novel ideas is, however, soon terminated. The touch of experience is upon them, and the doubt and mistrust 
which their uncertainty produces becomes universal. We may rest assured that the majority of mankind will either believe they know not wherefore, or will not know what to believe. Few are the beings who can ever hope to attain to the state of rational and independent conviction which true knowledge can beget in defiance of the attacks of doubt. It has been remarked that in times of great religious fervor, men sometimes change their religious opinions, whereas in times of general skepticism, every one clings to his own persuasion. The same thing takes place in politics under the liberty of the press. In countries where all the theories of social science have been contested in their turn, the citizens who have adopted one of them stick to it, not so much because they are assured of its excellence, as because they are not convinced of the superiority of any other. In the present age, men are not very ready to die in defense of their opinions, but they are rarely inclined to change them, and there are fewer martyrs as well as fewer apostates. Another still more valid reason may yet be adduced. When no abstract opinions are looked upon as certain, men cling to the mere propensities and external interests of their position, which are naturally more tangible and more permanent than any opinions in the world. But it is not a question of easy solution whether aristocracy or democracy is most fit to govern a country. But it is certain that democracy annoys one part of the community and that aristocracy oppresses another part. When the question is reduced to the simple expression of the struggle between poverty and wealth, the tendency of each side of the dispute becomes perfectly This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 7. Political Associations in the United States. In no country in the world has the principle of association been more successfully used, or more unsparingly applied to a multitude of different objects, than in America. Besides the permanent associations which are established by law under the names of townships, cities, and counties, a vast number of others are formed and maintained by the agency of private individuals. The citizen of the United States is taught from his earliest infancy to rely upon his own exertions in order to resist the evils and the difficulties of life. He looks upon social authority with an eye of mistrust and anxiety, and he only claims its assistance when he is quite unable to shift without it. This habit may even be traced in the schools of the rising generation, where the children in their games are wont to submit to rules which they have themselves established, and to punish misdemeanors which they have themselves defined. The same spirit pervades every act of social life. If a stoppage occurs in a thoroughfare, and the circulation of the public is hindered, the neighbors immediately constitute a deliberative body, and this extemporaneous assembly gives rise to an executive power which remedies the inconvenience before anybody has thought of recurring to an authority superior to that of the persons immediately concerned. If the public pressures are concerned, an association is formed to provide for the splendor and the regularity of the entertainment. Societies are formed to resist enemies which are exclusively of a moral nature, and to diminish the vices of intemperance. In the United States, associations are established to promote public order, commerce, industry, morality, and religion,
for there is no end which the human will, seconded by the collective exertions of individuals, despairs of attaining. I shall hereafter have occasion to show the effects of association upon the course of society, and I must confine myself for the present to the political world. When once the right of association is recognized, the citizens may employ it in several different ways. An association consists simply in the public assent which a number of individuals give to certain doctrines, and in the engagement which they contract to promote the spread of these doctrines by their exertions. The right of association with these views is very analogous to the liberty of unlicensed writing, but societies thus formed possess more authority than the press. When an opinion is represented by a society, it necessarily assumes a more exact and explicit form. It numbers its partisans, and comprises their welfare in its cause. They, on the other hand, become acquainted with each other, and their zeal is increased by their number. An association unites the efforts of minds which have a tendency to diverge in one single channel, and urges them vigorously towards one single end, which it points out. The second degree in the right of association is the power of meeting. When an association is allowed to establish centers of action at certain important points in the country, its activity is increased and its influence extended. Men have the opportunity of seeing each other, means of execution are more readily combined, and opinions are maintained with a degree of warmth and energy, which written language cannot approach. Lastly, in the exercise of the right of political association, there is a third degree. The partisans of an opinion may unite in electoral bodies, and choose delegates to represent them in a central assembly. This is, properly speaking, the application of the representative system to a party. Thus, in the first instance, a society is formed between individuals professing the same opinion, and the tie which keeps it together is of a purely intellectual nature. In the second case, small assemblies are formed, which only represent a fraction of the party. Lastly, in the third case, they constitute a separate nation in the midst of the nation, a government within the government. Their delegates, like the real delegates of the majority, represent the entire collective force of their party, and they enjoy a certain degree of that national dignity and great influence which belongs to the chosen representatives of the people. It is true that they have not the right of making the laws, but they have the power of attacking those which are in being, and of drawing up beforehand those which they may afterwards cause to be adopted. If in a people which is imperfectly accustomed to the exercise of freedom, or which is exposed to violent political passions, a deliberating minority, which confines itself to the contemplation of future laws, be placed in juxtaposition to the legislative majority, I cannot but believe that public tranquillity incurs very great risks in the nation. There is doubtless a very wide difference between proving that one law is in itself better than another, and proving that the former ought to be substituted for the latter. But the imagination of the populace is very apt to overlook this difference, which is so apparent to the minds of thinking men. It sometimes happens that a nation is divided into two nearly equal parties, each of which affects to represent the majority. If, in immediate contiguity to the directing power, another power be established, which exercises almost as much moral authority as the former, it is not to be believed that it will long be content to speak without acting, or that it will always be restrained by the abstract consideration of the nature of associations, which are meant to direct, but not to enforce opinions, to suggest, but not to make the laws. The more we consider the independence of the press in its principal consequences, the more are we convinced that it is the chief, and so to speak, the constitutive element of freedom in the modern world. A nation which is determined to remain free is therefore right in demanding the unrestrained exercise of this independence. But the unrestrained liberty of political association cannot be entirely assimilated to the liberty of the press. The one is at the same time less necessary and more dangerous than the other. A nation may confine it within certain limits without forfeiting any part of its self-control, and it may sometimes be obliged to do so in order to maintain its own authority. In America the liberty of association for political purposes is unbounded, 
An example will show in the clearest light to what an extent this privilege is tolerated. The question of the tariff, or of free trade, produced a great manifestation of party feeling in America. The tariff was not only a subject of debate as a matter of opinion, but it exercised a favorable or prejudicial influence upon several very powerful interests of the states. The North attributed a great portion of its prosperity, and the South all its sufferings to this system, insomuch that, for a long time, the tariff was the sole source of the political animosities which agitated the Union. In 1831, when the dispute was raging with the utmost virulence, a private citizen of Massachusetts proposed, to all the enemies of the tariff, by means of the public prints, to send delegates to Philadelphia, in order to consult together upon the means which were most fitted to promote freedom of trade. This proposal circulated, in a few days, from Maine to New Orleans, by the power of the printing press. The opponents of the tariff adopted it with enthusiasm, meetings were formed on all sides, and delegates were named. The majority of these individuals were well known, and some of them had earned a considerable degree of celebrity. South Carolina alone, which afterwards took up arms in the same cause, sent sixty-three delegates. On October 1st, 1831, this assembly, which according to the American custom had taken the name of a convention, met at Philadelphia. It consisted of more than two hundred members. Its debates were public, and they at once assumed a legislative character. The extent of the powers of Congress, the theories of free trade, and the different clauses of the tariff were discussed in turn. At the end of ten days' deliberation the convention broke up, after having published an address to the American people, in which it declared, 1. That Congress had not the right of making a tariff, and that the existing tariff was unconstitutional. 2. That the prohibition of free trade was prejudicial to the interests of all nations, and to that of the American people in particular. It must be acknowledged that the unrestrained liberty of political association has not hitherto produced, in the United States, those fatal consequences which might perhaps be expected from it elsewhere. The right of association was imported from England, and it has always existed in America, so that the exercise of this privilege is now amalgamated with the manners and customs of the people. At the present time, liberty of association is become a necessary guarantee against the tyranny of the majority. In the United States, as soon as a party has become preponderant, all public authority passes under its control. Its private supporters occupy all the places, and have all the force of the administration at their disposal. As the most distinguished partisans of the other side of the question are unable to surmount the obstacles which exclude them from power, they require some means of establishing themselves upon their own basis, and of opposing the moral authority of the minority to the physical power which domineers over it. Thus a dangerous expedient is used to obviate a still more formidable danger. The omnipotence of the majority appears to me to present such extreme perils to the American republics that a dangerous measure which is used to repress it seems to be more advantageous than prejudicial. And here I am about to advance a proposition which may remind the reader of what I said before in speaking of municipal freedom. There are no countries in which associations are more needed to prevent the despotism of faction or the arbitrary power of a prince than those which are democratically constituted. In aristocratic nations the body of the nobles and the more opulent part of the community are in themselves natural associations, which act as checks upon the abuses of power. In countries in which these associations do not exist, if private individuals are unable to create an artificial and a temporary substitute for them, I can imagine no permanent protection against the most galling tyranny, and a great people may be oppressed by a small faction or by a single individual with impunity. The meeting of a great political convention, for there are conventions of all kinds, which may frequently become a necessary measure, is always a serious occurrence, even in America, and one which is never looked forward to by the judicious friends of the country without alarm. This was very perceptible in the convention of 1831, 
at which the exertions of all the most distinguished members of the assembly tended to moderate its language and to restrain the subjects which it treated within certain limits it is probable in fact that the convention of eighteen thirty one exercised a very great influence upon the minds of the malcontents and prepared them for the open revolt against the commercial laws of the union which took place in eighteen thirty two it cannot be denied that the unrestrained liberty of association for political purposes is the privilege which a people is longest in learning how to exercise if it does not throw the nation into anarchy it perpetually augments the chances of that calamity on one point however this perilous liberty offers a security against dangers of another kind in countries where associations are free secret societies are unknown in america there are numerous factions but no conspiracies different ways in which the right of association is understood in europe and in the united states different use which is made of it the most natural privilege of man next to the right of acting for himself is that of combining his exertions with those of his fellow creatures and of acting in common with them i am therefore led to conclude that the right of association is almost as inalienable as the right of personal liberty no legislator can attack it without impairing the very foundations of society nevertheless if the liberty of association is a fruitful source of advantages and prosperity to some nations it may be perverted or carried to excess by others and the element of life may be changed into an element of destruction a comparison of the different methods which associations pursue in those countries in which they are managed with discretion as well as in those where liberty degenerates into license may perhaps be thought useful both to governments and to parties the greater part of europeans look upon an association as a weapon which is to be hastily fashioned and immediately tried in the conflict a society is formed for discussion but the idea of impending action prevails in the minds of those who constitute it it is in fact an army and the time given to parley serves to reckon up the strength and to animate the courage of the host after which they direct their march against the enemy resources which lie within the bounds of the law may suggest themselves to the person who compose it as means but never as the only means of success such however is not the manner in which the right of association is understood in the united states in america the citizens who form the minority associate in order in the first place to show their numerical strength and so to diminish the moral authority of the majority and in the second place to stimulate competition and to discover those arguments which are most fitted to act upon the majority for they always entertain hopes of drawing over their opponents to their own side and of afterwards disposing of the supreme power in their name political associations in the united states are therefore peaceable in their intentions and strictly legal in the means which they employ and they assert with perfect truth that they only aim at success by lawful expedience the difference which exists between the americans and ourselves depends on several causes in europe there are numerous parties so diametrically opposed to the majority that they can never hope to acquire its support and at the same time they think they are sufficiently strong in themselves to struggle and defend their cause when a party of this kind forms an association its object is not to conquer but to fight in america the individuals who hold opinions very much opposed to those of the majority are no sort of impediment to its power and all other parties hope to win it over to their own principles in the end the exercise of the right of association becomes dangerous in proportion to the impossibility which excludes great parties from acquiring the majority in a country like the united states in which the differences of opinion are mere differences of hue the right of association may remain unrestrained without evil consequences the inexperience of many of the european nations in the enjoyment of liberty leads them only to look upon the liberty of association as a right of attacking the government the first notion which presents itself to a party as well as to an individual when it has acquired a consciousness of its own strength is that of violence 
the notion of persuasion arises at a later period and is only derived from experience the english who are divided into parties which differ most essentially from each other rarely abuse the right of association because they have been long accustomed to exercise it in france the passion for war is so intense that there is no undertaking so mad or so injurious to the welfare of the state that a man does not consider himself honored in defending it at the risk of his life but perhaps the most powerful of the causes which tend to mitigate the excesses of political association in the united states is universal suffrage in countries in which universal suffrage exists the majority is never doubtful because neither party can pretend to represent that portion of the community which is not voted. The associations which are formed are aware, as well as the nation at large, that they do not represent the majority. This is, indeed, a condition inseparable from their existence, for if they did represent the preponderating power, they would change the law instead of soliciting its reform. The consequence of this is that the moral influence of the government which they attack is very much increased, and their own power is very much enfeebled. In Europe there are few associations which do not affect to represent the majority, or which do not believe that they represent it. This conviction, or this pretension, tends to augment their force amazingly, and contributes no less to legalize their measures violence may seem to be excusable in defense of the cause of oppressed right thus it is in the vast labyrinth of human laws that extreme liberty sometimes corrects the abuses of license and that extreme democracy obviates the dangers of democratic government in europe associations consider themselves in some degree as the legislative and executive councils of the people which is unable to speak for itself in America, where they only represent a minority of the population, they argue and they petition. The means which the associations of Europe employ are in accordance with the end which they propose to obtain. As the principal aim of those bodies is to act, and not to debate, to fight rather than to persuade, they are naturally led to adopt a form of organization which differs from the ordinary customs of civil bodies, and which assumes the habits and the maxims of military life. They centralize the direction of their resources as much as possible, and they entrust the powers of the whole party to a very small number of leaders. The members of these associations respond to a watchword, like soldiers on duty. They profess the doctrine of passive obedience, say rather that in uniting together they at once abjure the exercise of their own judgment and free will, and the tyrannical control which these societies exercise is often far more unsupportable than the authority possessed over society by the government which they attack. Their moral force is much diminished by these excesses, and they lose the powerful interest which is always excited by a struggle between oppressors and the oppressed. The man who, in given cases, consents to obey his fellows with servility, and who submits his activity and even his opinions to their control, can have no claim to rank as a free citizen. The Americans have also established certain forms of government which are applied to their associations, but these are invariably borrowed from the forms of the civil administration. The independence of each individual is formally recognized. The tendency of the members of the association points, as it does in the body of the community, towards the same end, but they are not obliged to follow the same track. No one abjures the exercise. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 13, Part 1. Government of the Democracy in America. I am well aware of the difficulties which attend this part of my subject, but although every expression which I am about to make use of may clash upon some one point with the feelings of the different parties which divide my country, 
I shall speak my opinion with the most perfect openness. In Europe we are at a loss how to judge the true character and the more permanent propensities of democracy, because in Europe two conflicting principles exist, and we do not know what to attribute to the principles themselves, and what to refer to the passions which they bring into collision. Such, however, is not the case in America. There the people reigns without any obstacle, and it has no perils to dread, and no injuries to avenge. In America, democracy is swayed by its own free propensities. Its course is natural, and its activity is unrestrained. The United States consequently afford the most favorable opportunity of studying its real character. And to no people can this inquiry be more vitally interesting than to the French nation, which is blindly driven onwards by a daily and irresistible impulse towards a state of things which may prove either despotic or republican, but which will assuredly be democratic. Universal Suffrage I have already observed that universal suffrage has been adopted in all the states of the Union. It consequently occurs amongst different populations which occupy very different positions in the scale of society. I have had opportunities of observing its effects in different localities, and amongst races of men who are nearly strangers to each other by their language, their religion, and their manner of life, in Louisiana as well as in New England, in Georgia and in Canada. I have remarked that universal suffrage is far from producing in America either all the good or all the evil consequences which are assigned to it in Europe and that its effects differ very widely from those which are usually attributed to it. Choice of the People and Instinctive Preferences of the American Democracy In the United States, the most able men are rarely placed at the head of affairs. Reason of this peculiarity. The envy which prevails in the lower orders of France against the higher classes is not a French, but a purely democratic sentiment. For what reason, the most distinguished men in America frequently seclude themselves from public affairs. Many people in Europe are apt to believe without saying it, or to say without believing it, that one of the great advantages of universal suffrage is that it entrusts the direction of public affairs to men who are worthy of the public confidence. They admit that the people is unable to govern for itself, but they aver that it is always sincerely disposed to promote the welfare of the state, and that it instinctively designates those persons who are animated by the same good wishes, and who are the most fit to wield the supreme authority. I confess that the observations I made in America by no means coincide with these opinions. On my arrival in the United States, I was surprised to find so much distinguished talent among the subjects, and so little among the heads of the government. It is a well-authenticated fact that at the present day the most able men in the United States are very rarely placed at the head of affairs, and it must be acknowledged that such has been the result in proportion as democracy has outstepped all its former limits. The race of American statesmen has evidently dwindled most remarkably in the course of the last fifty years. Several causes may be assigned to this phenomenon. It is impossible, notwithstanding the most strenuous exertions, to raise the intelligence of the people above a certain level. Whatever may be the facilities of acquiring information, whatever may be the profusion of easy methods and of cheap science, the human mind can never be instructed and educated without devoting a considerable space of time to those objects. The greater or the lesser possibility of subsisting without labor is therefore the necessary boundary of intellectual improvement. This boundary is more remote in some countries and more restricted in others, but it must exist somewhere in order to procure the means of physical subsistence, that is to say, as long as it retains its popular character. It is therefore quite as difficult to imagine a state in which all the citizens should be very well informed as a state in which they should all be wealthy. These two difficulties may be looked upon as correlative. 
it may very readily be admitted that the mass of the citizens are sincerely disposed to promote the welfare of their country. Nay more, it may even be allowed that the lower classes are less apt to be swayed by considerations of personal interest than the higher orders. But it is always more or less impossible for them to discern the best means of attaining the end which they desire with sincerity. Long and patient observation, joined to a multitude of different notions, is required to form a just estimate of the character of a single individual. And can it be supposed that the vulgar have the power of succeeding in an inquiry which misleads the penetration of genius itself? The people has neither the time nor the means which are essential to the prosecution of an investigation of this kind. Its conclusions are hastily formed from a superficial inspection of the more prominent features of a question. Hence it often ascends to the clamor of a mountebank who knows the secret of stimulating its tastes, while its truest friends frequently fail in their exertions. Moreover, the democracy is not only deficient in that soundness of judgment which is necessary to select men really deserving of its confidence, but it has neither the desire nor the inclination to find them out. It cannot be denied that democratic institutions have a very strong tendency to promote the feeling of envy in the human heart, not so much because they afford to every one the means of rising to the level of any of his fellow citizens, as because those means perpetually disappoint the persons who employ them. Democratic institutions awaken and foster a passion for equality which they can never entirely satisfy. This complete equality eludes the grasp of the people at the very moment at which it thinks to hold it fast, and flies, as Pascal says, with eternal flight. The people is excited in the pursuit of an advantage, which is more precious because it is not sufficiently remote to be unknown, or sufficiently near to be enjoyed. The lower orders are agitated by the chance of success, they are irritated by its uncertainty, and they pass from the enthusiasm of pursuit to the exhaustion of ill success, and lastly to the acrimony of disappointment. Whatever transcends their own limits appears to be an obstacle to their desires, and there is no kind of superiority, however legitimate it may be, which is not irksome in their sight. It has been supposed that the secret instinct which leads the lower orders to remove their superiors as much as possible from the direction of public affairs is peculiar to France. This, however, is an error. The propensity to which I allude is not inherent in any particular nation, but in democratic institutions in general. And although it may have been heightened by peculiar political circumstances, it owes its origin to a higher cause. In the United States, the people is not disposed to hate the superior classes of society, but it is not very favorably inclined towards them, and it carefully excludes them from the exercise of authority. It does not entertain any dread of distinguished talents, but it is rarely captivated by them, and it awards its approbation very sparingly to such as have risen without the popular support. Whilst the natural propensities of democracy induce the people to reject the most distinguished citizens as its rulers, these individuals are no less apt to retire from a political career in which it is almost impossible to retain their independence, or to advance without degrading themselves. This opinion has been very candidly set forth by Chancellor Kent, who says, in speaking with great eulogiums of that part of the Constitution which empowers the executive to nominate the judges, quote, It is indeed probable that the men who are best fitted to discharge the duties of this high office would have too much reserve in their manners, and too much austerity in their principles, for them to be returned by the majority at an election where universal suffrage is adopted. Unquote. Such were the opinions which were printed without contradiction in America in the year 1830. I hold it to be sufficiently demonstrated 
that universal suffrage is by no means a guarantee of the wisdom of the popular choice, and that whatever its advantages may be, this is not one of them. Causes which may partly correct these tendencies of the democracy. Contrary effects produced on peoples as well as on individuals by great dangers. Why so many distinguished men stood at the head of affairs in America fifty years ago. Influence which the intelligence and manners of the people exercise upon its choice. Example of New England. States of the Southwest. Influence of certain laws upon the choice of the people. Election by an elected body. Its effects upon the composition of the Senate. When a state is threatened by serious dangers, the people frequently succeeds in selecting the citizens who are the most able to save it. It has been observed that man rarely retains his customary level in presence of very critical circumstances. He rises above or he sinks below his usual condition, and the same thing occurs in nations at large. Extreme perils sometimes quench the energy of a people instead of stimulating it. They excite without directing its passions, and instead of clearing, they confuse its powers of perception. The Jews deluge the smoking ruins of their temple with the carnage of the remnant of their host. But it is more common, both in the case of nations and in that of individuals, to find extraordinary virtues arising from the very eminence of the danger. Great characters are then thrown into relief, as edifices which are concealed by the gloom of night are illuminated by the glare of a conflagration. At those dangerous times, genius no longer abstains from presenting itself in the arena, and the people, alarmed by the perils of its situation, buries its envious passions in a short oblivion. Great names may then be drawn from the balloting box. I have already observed that the American statesmen of the present day are very inferior to those who stood at the head of affairs fifty years ago. This is as much a consequence of the circumstances as of the laws of the country. When America was struggling in the high cause of independence to throw off the yoke of another country, and when it was about to usher a new nation into the world, the spirits of its inhabitants were roused to the height which their great efforts required. In this general excitement, the most distinguished men were ready to forestall the wants of the community, and the people clung to them for support, and placed them at its head. But events of this magnitude are rare, and it is from an inspection of the ordinary course of affairs that our judgment must be formed. If passing occurrences sometimes act as checks upon the passions of democracy, the intelligence and the manners of the community exercise an influence which is not less powerful and far more permanent. This is extremely perceptible in the United States. In New England, the education and the liberties of the communities were engendered by the moral and religious principles of their founders. Where society has acquired a sufficient degree of stability to enable it to hold certain maxims and to retain fixed habits, the lower orders are accustomed to respect intellectual superiority and to submit to it without complaint, although they set at naught all those privileges which wealth and birth have introduced among mankind. The democracy in New England consequently makes a more judicious choice than it does elsewhere. But as we descend towards the South, to those states in which the constitution of society is more modern and less strong, where instruction is less general, and where the principles of morality, of religion, and of liberty are less happily combined, we perceive that the talents and the virtues of those who are in authority become more and more rare. Lastly, when we arrive at the new southwestern states, in which the constitution of society dates but from yesterday, and presents an agglomeration of adventurers and speculators, 
we are amazed at the persons who are invested with public authority, and we are led to ask by what force, independent of the legislation and of the people who direct it, the state can be protected, and society be made to flourish. There are certain laws of a democratic nature which contribute, nevertheless, to correct, in some measure, the dangerous tendencies of democracy. On entering the House of Representatives of Washington, one is struck by the vulgar demeanor of that great assembly. The eye frequently does not discover a man of celebrity within its walls. Its members are almost all obscure individuals whose names present no associations to the mind. They are mostly village lawyers, men in trade, or even persons belonging to the lower classes of society. In a country in which education is very general, it is said that the representatives of the people do not always know how to write correctly. At a few yards' distance from this spot is the door of the Senate, which contains within a small space a large proportion of the celebrated men of America. Scarcely an individual is to be perceived in it who does not recall the idea of an active and illustrious career. The Senate is composed of eloquent advocates, distinguished generals, wise magistrates, and statesmen of note, whose language would at all times do honor to the most remarkable parliamentary debates of Europe. What, then, is the cause of this strange contrast, and why are the most able citizens to be found in one assembly rather than in the other? Why is the former body remarkable for its vulgarity and its poverty of talent, whilst the latter seems to enjoy a monopoly of intelligence and of sound judgment? Both of these assemblies emanate from the people. Both of them are chosen by universal suffrage, and no voice has hitherto been heard to assert in America that the Senate is hostile to the interests of the people. From what cause, then, does so startling a difference arise? The only reason which appears to me adequately to account for it is that the House of Representatives is elected by the populace directly, and that the Senate is elected by elected bodies. The whole body of the citizens names the legislature of each state, and the federal constitution converts these legislatures into so many electoral bodies, which return the members of the Senate. The senators are elected by an indirect application of universal suffrage, for the legislatures which name them are not aristocratic or privileged bodies which exercise the electoral franchise in their own right, but they are chosen by the totality of the citizens. They are generally elected every year, and new members may constantly be chosen who will employ their electoral rights in conformity with the wishes of the public. But this transmission of the popular authority through an assembly of chosen men operates an important change in it, by refining its discretion and improving the forms which it adopts. Men who are chosen in this manner accurately represent the majority of the nation which governs them, but they represent the elevated thoughts which are current in the community, the propensities which prompt its nobler actions, rather than the petty passions which disturb, or the vices which disgrace it. The time may be already anticipated at which the American republics will be obliged to introduce the plan of election by an elected body more frequently into their system of representation, or they will incur no small risk of perishing miserably amongst the shoals of democracy. And here I have no scruple in confessing that I look upon this peculiar system of election as the only means of bringing the exercise of political power to the level of all classes of the people. Those thinkers who regard this institution as the exclusive weapon of a party, and those who fear, on the other hand, to make use of it, seem to me to fall into as great an error in the one case as in the other. Influence which the American democracy has exercised on the laws relating to elections. When elections are rare, they expose the state to a violent crisis. 
when they are frequent, they keep up a degree of feverish excitement. The Americans preferred the second of these two evils. Mutability of the laws. Opinions of Hamilton and Jefferson on this subject. When elections recur at long intervals, the state is exposed to violent agitation every time they take place. Parties exert themselves to the utmost in order to gain a prize which is so rarely within their reach, and as the evil is almost irremediable for the candidates who fail, the consequences of their disappointed ambition may prove most disastrous. If, on the other hand, the legal struggle can be repeated within a short space of time, the defeated parties take patience. When elections occur frequently, their recurrence keeps society in a perpetual state of feverish excitement, and imparts a continual instability to public affairs. Thus, on the one hand, the state is exposed to the perils of revolution, on the other to perpetual mutability. The former system threatens the very existence of the government. The latter is an obstacle to all steady and consistent policy. The Americans have preferred the second of these evils to the first, but they were led to this conclusion by their instinct much more than by their reason, for a taste for variety is one of the characteristic passions of democracy. An extraordinary mutability has, by this means, been introduced into their legislation. Many of the Americans consider the instability of their laws as a necessary consequence of a system whose general results are beneficial. But no one in the United States affects to deny the fact of this instability, or to contend that it is not a great evil. Hamilton, after having demonstrated the utility of a power which might prevent, or which might at least impede, the promulgation of bad laws, adds, quote, It might perhaps be said that the power of preventing bad laws includes that of preventing good ones, and may be used to the one purpose as well as to the other. But this objection will have little weight with those who can properly estimate the mischiefs of that inconstancy and mutability in the laws, which form the greatest blemish in the character and genius of our governments. Unquote. Federalist number 73. And again in number 62 of the same work, he observes, quote, The facility and excess of law-making seem to be the diseases to which our governments are most liable. The mischievous effects of the mutability in the public councils arising from a rapid succession of new members would fill a volume. Every new election in the states is found to change one half of the representatives. From this change of men must proceed a change of opinions and of measures, which forfeits the respect and confidence of other nations, poisons the blessings of liberty itself, and diminishes the attachment and reverence of the people toward a political system which betrays so many marks of infirmity. Unquote. Jefferson himself, the greatest Democrat whom the democracy of America has yet produced, pointed out the same evils. The instability of our laws, said he in a letter to Madison, is really a very serious inconvenience. I think that we ought to have obviated it by deciding that a whole year should always be allowed to elapse between the bringing in of a bill and the final passing of it. It should afterward be discussed and put to the vote without the possibility of making any alteration in it and if the circumstances of the case required a more speedy decision, the question should not be decided by a simple majority, but by a majority of at least two-thirds of both houses. Public Officers Under the Control of the Democracy in America Simple Exterior of the American Public Officers No Official Costume All Public Officers Are Remunerated Political Consequences of this System No Public Career Exists in America Result of This Public officers in the United States are commingled with a crowd of citizens. 
They have neither palaces, nor guards, nor ceremonial costumes. This simple exterior of the persons in authority is connected not only with the peculiarities of the American character, but with the fundamental principles of that society. In the estimation of the democracy, a government is not a benefit, but a necessary evil. A certain degree of power must be granted to the public officers, for they would be of no use without it. But the ostensible semblance of authority is by no means indispensable to the conduct of affairs, and it is needlessly offensive to the susceptibility of the public. The public officers themselves are well aware that they only enjoy the superiority over their fellow citizens, which they derive from their authority upon condition of putting themselves on a level with the whole community by their manners. A public officer in the United States is uniformly civil, accessible to all the world, attentive to all requests, and obliging in his replies. I was pleased by these characteristics of a democratic government, and I was struck by the manly independence of the citizens, who respect the office more than the officer, and who are less attached to the emblems of authority than to the man who bears them. I am inclined to believe that the influence which costumes really exercise, in an age like that in which we live, has been a good deal exaggerated. I never perceived that a public officer in America was the less respected whilst he was in the discharge of his duties, because his own merit was set off by no adventitious signs. On the other hand, it is very doubtful whether a peculiar dress contributes to the respect which public characters ought to have for their own position, at least when they are not otherwise inclined to respect it. When a magistrate, and in France such instances are not rare, indulges his trivial wit at the expense of the prisoner, or derides the predicament in which a culprit is placed, it would be well to deprive him of his robes of office, to see whether he would recall some portion of the natural dignity of mankind, when he is reduced to the apparel of a private citizen. A democracy may, however, allow a certain show of magisterial pomp, and clothe its officers in silks and gold, without seriously compromising its principles. Privileges of this kind are transitory, they belong to the place, and are distinct from the individual. But if public officers are not uniformly remunerated by the state, the public charges must be entrusted to men of opulence and independence, who constitute the basis of an aristocracy, and if the people still retains its right of election, that election can only be made from a certain class of citizens. When a democratic republic renders offices which had formerly been remunerated gratuitous, it may safely be believed that the state is advancing to monarchical institutions. And when a monarchy begins to remunerate such officers as had hitherto been unpaid, it is a sure sign that it is approaching toward a despotic or a republican form of government. The substitution of paid for unpaid functionaries is of itself, in my opinion, sufficient to constitute a serious revolution. I look upon the entire absence of gratuitous functionaries in America as one of the most prominent signs of the absolute dominion which democracy exercises in that country. All public services, of whatsoever nature they may be, are paid, so that every one has not merely the right, but also the means of performing them. Although in democratic states all the citizens are qualified to occupy stations in the government, all are not tempted to try for them. The number and the capacities of the candidates are more apt to restrict the choice of electors than the connections of the candidateship. In nations in which the principle of election extends to every place in the state, no political career can, properly speaking, be said to exist. Men are promoted as if by chance to the rank which they enjoy, and they are by no means sure of retaining it. The consequence is that in tranquil times public functions offer but few lures to ambition. 
In the United States, the persons who engage in the perplexities of political life are individuals of very moderate pretensions. The pursuit of wealth generally diverts men of great talents and of great passions from the pursuit of power, and it very frequently happens that a man does not undertake to direct the fortune of the state until he has discovered his incompetence to conduct his own affairs. The vast number of very ordinary men who occupy public stations is quite as attributable to these causes as to the bad choice of the democracy. In the United States, I am not sure that the people would return the men of superior abilities who might solicit its support, but it is certain that men of this description do not come forward. Arbitrary Power of Magistrates under the rule of the American democracy. For what reason the arbitrary power of magistrates is greater in absolute monarchies and in democratic republics than it is in limited monarchies? Arbitrary power of the magistrates in New England. In two different kinds of government, the magistrates exercise a considerable degree of arbitrary power, namely, under the absolute government of a single individual, and under that of a democracy. This identical result proceeds from causes which are nearly analogous. In despotic states, the fortune of no citizen is secure, and public officers are not more safe than private individuals. The sovereign, who has under his control the lives, the property, and sometimes the honor of the men whom he employs, does not scruple to allow them a great latitude of action, because he is convinced that they will not use it to his prejudice. In despotic states, the sovereign is so attached to the exercise of his power, that he dislikes the constraint even of his own regulations, and he is well pleased that his agents should follow a somewhat fortuitous line of conduct provided he be certain that their actions will never counteract his desires. In democracies, as the majority has every year the right of depriving the officers whom it is appointed of their power, it has no reason to fear any abuse of their authority. As the people is always able to signify its wishes to those who conduct the government, it prefers leaving them to make their own exertions to prescribing an invariable rule of conduct which would at once fetter their activity and the popular authority. It may even be observed, on attentive consideration, that under the rule of a democracy the arbitrary power of the magistrate must be still greater than in despotic states. In the latter, the sovereign has the power of punishing all the faults with which he becomes acquainted, but it would be vain for him to hope to become acquainted with all those which are committed. In the former, the sovereign power is not only supreme, but it is universally present. The American functionaries are, in point of fact, much more independent in the sphere of action which the law traces out for them than any public officer in Europe. Very frequently the object which they are to accomplish is simply pointed out to them, and the choice of the means is left to their own discretion. In New England, for instance, the select men of each township are bound to draw up the list of persons who are to serve on the jury. The only rule which is laid down to guide them in their choice is that they are to select citizens possessing the elective franchise and enjoying a fair reputation. In France, the lives and liberties of the subjects would be thought to be in danger if a public officer of any kind was entrusted with so formidable a right. In New England, the same magistrates are empowered to post the names of habitual drunkards in public houses, and to prohibit the inhabitants of a town from supplying them with liquor. A censorial power of this excessive kind would be revolting to the population of the most absolute monarchies. Here, however, it is submitted to without difficulty. Nowhere has so much been left by the law to the arbitrary determination of the magistrate as in democratic republics, because this arbitrary power is unattended by any alarming consequences. 
It may even be asserted that the freedom of the magistrate increases as the elective franchise is extended, and as the duration of the time of office is shortened. Hence arises the great difficulty which attends the conversion of a democratic republic into a monarchy. The magistrate ceases to be elective, but he retains the rights and the habits of an elected officer, which lead directly to despotism. It is only in limited monarchies that the law, which prescribes the sphere in which public officers are to act, superintends all their measures. The cause of this may be easily detected. In limited monarchies, the power is divided between the king and the people, both of whom are interested in the stability of the magistrate. The king does not venture to place the public officers under the control of the people, lest they should be tempted to betray his interests. On the other hand, the people fears lest the magistrate should serve to oppress the liberties of the country, if they were entirely dependent upon the crown. They cannot therefore be said to depend on either one or the other. The same cause which induces the king and the people to render public officers independent suggests the necessity of such securities as may prevent their independence from encroaching upon the authority of the former and the liberties of the latter. They consequently agree as to the necessity of restricting the functionary to a line of conduct laid down beforehand, and they are interested in confining him by certain regulations which he cannot evade. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 13, Part 2, Government of the Democracy in America INSTABILITY OF THE ADMINISTRATION IN THE UNITED STATES In America, the public acts of a community frequently leave fewer traces than the occurrences of a family. Newspapers, the only historical remains. Instability of the administration prejudicial to the art of government. The authority which public men possess in America is so brief, and they are so soon commingled with the ever-changing population of the country, that the acts of a community frequently leave fewer traces than the occurrences of a private family. The public administration is, so to speak, oral and traditionary. But little is committed to writing, and that little is wafted away forever, like the leaves of the sibyl by the smallest breeze. The only historical remains in the United States are the newspapers. But if a number be wanting, the chain of time is broken, and the present is severed from the past. I am convinced that in fifty years it will be more difficult to collect authentic documents concerning the social condition of the Americans at the present day than it is to find remains of the administration of France during the Middle Ages. And if the United States were ever invaded by barbarians, it would be necessary to have recourse to the history of other nations in order to learn anything of the people which now inhabits them. The instability of the administration has penetrated into the habits of the people. It even appears to suit the general taste, and no one cares for what occurred before his time. No methodical system is pursued, no archives are formed, and no documents are brought together when it would be very easy to do so. Where they exist, little store is set upon them, and I have amongst my papers several original public documents which are given to me in answer to some of my inquiries. In America, society seems to live from hand to mouth, like an army in the field. Nevertheless, the art of administration may undoubtedly be ranked as a science, and no sciences can be improved if the discoveries and observations of successive generations are not connected together in the order in which they occur. 
One man, in the short space of his life, remarks a fact, another conceives an idea. The former invents a means of execution, the latter reduces a truth to a fixed proposition, and mankind gathers the fruit of individual experience upon its way, and gradually forms the sciences. But the persons who conduct the administration in America can seldom afford any instruction to each other, and when they assume the direction of society, they simply possess those attainments which are most widely disseminated in the community, and no experience peculiar to themselves. Democracy, carried to its furthest limits, is therefore prejudicial to the art of government, and for this reason it is better adapted to a people already versed in the conduct of an administration than to a nation which is uninitiated in public affairs. This remark, indeed, is not exclusively applicable to the science of administration. Although a democratic government is founded upon a very simple and natural principle, it always presupposes the existence of a high degree of culture and enlightenment in society. At the first glance it may be imagined to belong to the earliest ages of the world, but maturer observation will convince us that it could only come last in the succession of human history. Charges levied by the state under the rule of the American democracy. In all communities, citizens divisible into three classes. Habits of each of these classes in the direction of public finances. Why public expenditure must tend to increase when the people governs. What renders the extravagance of a democracy less to be feared in America? Public expenditure under a democracy. Before we can affirm whether a democratic form of government is economical or not, we must establish a suitable standard of comparison. The question would be one of easy solution, if we were to attempt to draw a parallel between a democratic republic and an absolute monarchy. The public expenditure would be found to be more considerable under the former than under the latter. Such is the case with all free states compared to those which are not so. It is certain that despotism ruins individuals by preventing them from producing wealth, much more than by depriving them of the wealth which they have produced. It dries up the source of riches, whilst it usually respects acquired property. Freedom, on the contrary, engenders far more benefits than it destroys, and the nations which are favored by free institutions invariably find that their resources increase even more rapidly than their taxes. My present object is to compare free nations to each other, and to point out the influence of democracy upon the finances of a state. Communities, as well as organic bodies, are subject to certain fixed rules in their formation which they cannot evade. They are composed of certain elements which are common to them at all times and under all circumstances. The people may always be mentally divided into three distinct classes. The first of these classes consists of the wealthy, the second of those who are in easy circumstances, and the third is composed of those who have little or no property, and who subsist more especially by the work which they perform for the two superior orders. The proportion of the individuals who are included in these three divisions may vary according to the condition of society, but the divisions themselves can never be obliterated. It is evident that each of these three classes will exercise an influence peculiar to its own propensities upon the administration of the finances of the state. If the first of the three exclusively possesses the legislative power, it is probable that it will not be sparing of the public funds, because the taxes which are levied on a large fortune only tend to diminish the sum of superfluous enjoyment, and are, in point of fact, but little felt. If the second class has the power of making the laws, it will certainly not be lavish of taxes, because nothing is so onerous as a large impost which is levied upon a small income. The government of the middle classes appears to me to be the most economical, though perhaps not the most enlightened, and certainly not the most generous of free governments. But now let us suppose that the legislative authority is vested in the lowest orders. There are two striking reasons which show that the tendency of the expenditure will be to increase, not to diminish. As the great majority of those who create the laws are possessed of no property upon which taxes can be imposed, all the money which is spent for the community appears to be spent to their advantage, at no cost of their own, and those who are possessed of some little property readily find means of regulating the taxes, so that they are burdensome to the wealthy and profitable to the poor, although the rich are unable to take the same advantage when they are in possession of the government. 
in countries in which the poor should be exclusively invested with the power of making the laws no great economy of public expenditure ought to be expected that expenditure will always be considerable either because the taxes do not weigh upon those who levy them or because they are levied in such a manner as not to weigh upon those classes in other words the government of the democracy is the only one under which the power which lays on taxes escapes the payment of them it may be objected but the argument has no real weight that the true interest of the people is indissolubly connected with that of the wealthier portion of the community since it cannot but suffer by the severe measures to which it resorts but is not the true interest of kings to render their subjects happy and the true interest of nobles to admit recruits into their order on suitable grounds if remote advantages had power to prevail over the passions and exigencies of the moment no such thing as a tyrannical sovereign or an exclusive aristocracy could ever exist again it may be objected that the poor are never invested with the sole power of making the laws but i reply that wherever universal suffrage has been established the majority of the community unquestionably exercises the legislative authority and if it be proved that the poor always constitute the majority it may be added with perfect truth that in the countries in which they possess the elective franchise they possess the sole power of making laws but it is certain that in all the nations of the world the greater number has always consisted of those persons who hold no property or of those whose property is insufficient to exempt them from the necessity of working in order to procure an easy subsistence universal suffrage does therefore in point of fact invest the poor with a government of society the disastrous influence which popular authority may sometimes exercise upon the finances of a state was very clearly seen in some of the democratic republics of antiquity in which the public treasure was exhausted in order to relieve indigent citizens or to supply the games and theatrical amusements of the populace it is true that the representative system was then very imperfectly known and that at the present time the influence of popular passion is less felt in the conduct of public affairs but it may be believed that the delegate will in the end conform to the principles of his constituents and favor their propensities as much as their interests the extravagance of democracy is however less to be dreaded in proportion as the people acquires a share of property because on the one hand the contributions of the rich are then less needed and on the other it is more difficult to lay on taxes which do not affect the interests of the lower classes on this account universal suffrage would be less dangerous in france than in england because in the latter country the property on which taxes may be levied is vested in fewer hands america where the great majority of the citizens possess some fortune is in a still more favorable position than france there are still further causes which may increase the sum of public expenditure in democratic countries when the aristocracy governs the individuals who conduct the affairs of state are exempted by their own station in society from every kind of privation they are contented with their position power and renown are the objects for which they strive and as they are placed far above the obscure throng of citizens they do not always distinctly perceive how the well-being of the mass of the people ought to redound to their own honor they are not indeed callous to the sufferings of the poor but they cannot feel those miseries as acutely as if they were themselves partakers of them provided that the people appear to submit to its lot the rulers are satisfied and they demand nothing further from the government an aristocracy is more intent upon the means of maintaining its influence than upon the means of improving its condition when on the contrary the people is invested with a supreme authority the perpetual sense of their own miseries impels the rulers of society to seek for perpetual ameliorations a thousand different objects are subjected to improvement the most trivial details are sought out as susceptible of amendment and those changes which are accompanied with considerable expense are more especially advocated since the object is to render the condition of the poor more tolerable who cannot pay for themselves moreover all democratic communities are agitated by an ill-defined excitement and by a kind of feverish impatience that engender a multitude of innovations 
almost all of which are attended with expense. In monarchies and aristocracies, the natural taste which the rulers have for power and for renown is stimulated by the promptings of ambition, and they are frequently incited by these temptations to a very costly undertakings. In democracies, where the rulers labor under privations, they can only be courted by such means as improve their well-being, and these improvements cannot take place without a sacrifice of money. When a people begins to reflect upon its situation, it discovers a multitude of wants to which it had not been before subject, and to satisfy these exigencies, recourse must be had to the coffers of the state. Hence it arises that the public charges increase in proportion as civilization spreads, and that imposts are augmented as knowledge pervades the community. The last cause which frequently renders a democratic government dearer than any other is that a democracy does not always succeed in moderating its expenditure, because it does not understand the art of being economical. As the designs which it entertains are frequently changed, and the agents of those designs are still more frequently removed, its undertakings are often ill-conducted or left unfinished. In the former case, the state spends sums out of all proportion to the end which it proposes to accomplish. In the second, the expense itself is unprofitable. Tendencies of the American Democracy as Regards the Salaries of Public Officers in the democracies, those who establish high salaries have no chance of profiting by them. Tendency of the American democracy to increase the salaries of subordinate officers and to lower those of the more important functionaries. Reason of this. Comparative statement of the salaries of public officers in the United States and in France. There is a powerful reason which usually induces democracies to economize upon the salaries of public officers. As the number of citizens who dispense the remuneration is extremely large in democratic countries, so the number of persons who can hope to be benefited by the receipt of it is comparatively small. In aristocratic countries, on the contrary, the individuals who fix high salaries have almost always a vague hope of profiting by them. These appointments may be looked upon as a capital which they create for their own use, or at least as a resource for their children. It must, however, be allowed that a democratic state is most parsimonious towards its principal agents. In America, the secondary officers are much better paid, and the dignitaries of the administration much worse than they are elsewhere. These opposite effects result from the same cause— the people fixes the salaries of the public officers in both cases, and the scale of remuneration is determined by the consideration of its own wants. It is held to be fair that the servants of the public should be placed in the same easy circumstances as the public itself, but when the question turns upon the salaries of the great officers of state, this rule fails, and chance alone can guide the popular decision." The poor have no adequate conception of the wants which the higher classes of society may feel. The sum which is scanty to the rich appears enormous to the poor man, whose wants do not extend beyond the necessaries of life, and in his estimation the governor of a state, with his twelve or fifteen hundred dollars a year, is a very fortunate and enviable being. If you undertake to convince him that the representative of a great people ought to be able to maintain some show of splendor in the eyes of foreign nations, he will perhaps assent to your meaning, but when he reflects on his own humble dwelling, and on the hard-earned produce of his wearisome toil, he remembers all that he could do with the salary which you say is insufficient, and he is startled or almost frightened at the sight of such uncommon wealth. Besides, the secondary public officer is almost on a level with the people, whilst the others are raised above it. The former may therefore excite his interest, but the latter begins to arouse his envy. This is very clearly seen in the United States, where the salaries seem to decrease as the authority of those who receive them augments. Under the rule of an aristocracy, it frequently happens, on the contrary, that whilst the high officers are receiving munificent salaries, the inferior ones have not more than enough to procure the necessaries of life. The reason of this fact is easily discoverable, from causes very analogous to those which I have just alluded. 
If a democracy is unable to conceive the pleasures of the rich, or to witness them without envy, an aristocracy is slow to understand, or, to speak more correctly, is unacquainted with, the privations of the poor. The poor man is not, if we use the term aright, the fellow of the rich one, but he is a being of another species. An aristocracy is therefore apt to care but little for the fate of its subordinate agents, and their salaries are only raised when they refuse to perform their service for too scanty a remuneration. It is the parsimonious conduct of democracy towards its principal officers, which has countenanced a supposition of far more economical propensities than any which it really possesses. It is true that it scarcely allows the means of honorable subsistence to the individuals who conduct its affairs, but enormous sums are lavished to meet the exigencies or to facilitate the enjoyments of the people. The money raised by taxation may be better employed, but it is not saved. In general, democracy gives largely to the community, and very sparingly to those who govern it. The reverse is the case in aristocratic countries, where the money of the state is expended to the profit of the persons who are at the head of affairs. Difficulty of Distinguishing the Causes Which Contribute to the Economy of the American Government We are liable to frequent errors in the research of those facts which exercise a serious influence upon the fate of mankind, since nothing is more difficult than to appreciate their real value. One people is naturally inconsistent and enthusiastic, another is sober and calculating, and these characteristics originate in their physical constitution, or in remote causes with which we are unacquainted. These are nations which are fond of parade and the bustle of festivity, and which do not regret the costly gaieties of an hour. Others, on the contrary, are attached to more retiring pleasures, and seem almost ashamed of appearing to be pleased. In some countries the highest value is set upon the beauty of public edifices, in others the productions of art are treated with indifference, and everything which is unproductive is looked down upon with contempt. In some renown, in others money, is the ruling passion. Independently of the laws, all these causes concur to exercise a very powerful influence upon the conduct of the finances of the state. If the Americans never spend the money of the people in galas, it is not only because the imposition of taxes is under the control of the people, but because the people takes no delight in public rejoicings. If they repudiate all ornament from their architecture, and set no store on any but the more practical and homely advantages, it is not only because they live under democratic institutions, but because they are a commercial nation. The habits of private life are continued in public, and we ought carefully to distinguish that economy which depends upon their institutions from that which is the natural result of their manners and customs. Whether the expenditure of the United States can be compared to that of France Two points to be established in order to estimate the extent of the public charges, Fidelis at the national wealth and the rate of taxation. The wealth and the charges of France not accurately known. Why the wealth and charges of the Union cannot be accurately known. Researches of the author with a view to discover the amount of taxation in Pennsylvania. General symptoms which may serve to indicate the amount of the public charges in a given nation. Result of this investigation for the Union. Many attempts have recently been made in France to compare the public expenditure of that country with the expenditure of the United States. All these attempts have, however, been unattended by success, and a few words will suffice to show that they could not have had a satisfactory result. In order to estimate the amount of the public charges of a people, two preliminaries are indispensable. It is necessary, in the first place, to know the wealth of that people, and in the second, to learn what portion of that wealth is devoted to the expenditure of the state. To show the amount of taxation without showing the resources which are destined to meet the demand is to undertake a futile labor, for it is not the expenditure, but the relation of the expenditure to the revenue which it is desirable to know. The same rate of taxation which may be easily supported by a wealthy contributor will reduce a poor one to extreme misery. 
the wealth of nations is composed of several distinct elements, of which population is the first, real property the second, and personal property the third. The first of these three elements may be discovered without difficulty. Among civilized nations it is easy to obtain an accurate census of the inhabitants, but the two others cannot be determined with so much facility. It is difficult to take an exact amount of all the lands in a country which are under cultivation, with their natural or their acquired value, and it is still more impossible to estimate the entire personal property which is at the disposal of a nation, and which eludes the strictest analysis by the diversity and number of shapes under which it may occur. And indeed, we find that the most ancient civilized nations of Europe, including even those in which the administration is most central, have not succeeded as yet in determining the exact condition of their wealth. In America, the attempt has never been made, for how would such an investigation be possible in a country where society has not yet settled into habits of regularity and tranquility, where the national government is not assisted by a multiple of agents whose exertions it can command and direct to one sole end, and where statistics are not studied because no one is able to collect the necessary documents or to find time to peruse them. Thus the primary elements of the calculations which have been made in France cannot be obtained in the Union. The relative wealth of the two countries is unknown. The property of the former is not accurately determined, and no means exist of computing that of the latter. I consent, therefore, for the sake of discussion, to abandon this necessary term of the comparison, and I confine myself to a computation of the actual amount of taxation, without investigating the relation which subsists between the taxation and the revenue. But the reader will perceive that my task has not been facilitated by the limits which I here lay down for my researches. It cannot be doubted that the central administration of France, assisted by all the public officers who are at its disposal, might determine with exactitude the amount of the direct and indirect taxes levied upon its citizens. But this investigation, which no private individual can undertake, has not hitherto been completed by the French government, or at least its results have not been made public. We are acquainted with the sum total of the charges of the state. We know the amount of the departmental expenditure, but the expenses of the communal divisions have not been computed, and the amount of the public expenses of France is consequently unknown. If we now turn to America, we shall perceive that the difficulties are multiplied and enhanced. The Union publishes an exact return of the amount of its expenditure. The budgets of the four and twenty states furnish similar returns of their revenues, but the expenses incident to the affairs of the counties and the townships are unknown. The authority of the federal government cannot oblige the provincial governments to throw any light upon this point, and even if these governments were inclined to afford their simultaneous cooperation, it may be doubted whether they possess the means of procuring a satisfactory answer. Independently of the natural difficulties of the task, the political organization of the country would act as a hindrance to the success of their efforts. The county and town magistrates are not appointed by the authorities of the state, and they are not subjected to their control. It is, therefore, very allowable to suppose that, if the state were desirous of obtaining the returns which we require, its design would be counteracted by the neglect of those subordinate officers whom it would be obliged to employ. It is, in point of fact, useless to inquire what the Americans might do to forward this inquiry, since it is certain that they have hitherto done nothing at all. There does not exist a single individual at the present day, in America or in Europe, who can inform us what each citizen of the Union annually contributes to the public charges of the nation. Hence, we must conclude that it is no less difficult to compare the social expenditure than it is to estimate the relative wealth of France and America. I will even add that it would be dangerous to attempt this comparison, for when statistics are not based upon computations which are strictly accurate, they mislead instead of guiding aright. The mind is easily imposed upon by the false affectation of exactness, which prevails even in the misstatements of science, and it adopts with confidence errors which are dressed in the forms of mathematical truth. We abandon, therefore, our numerical investigation, with the hope of meeting with data of another kind. 
In the absence of positive documents, we may form an opinion as to the proportion which the taxation of a people bears to its real prosperity, by observing whether its external appearance is flourishing, whether, after having discharged the calls of the state, the poor man retains the means of subsistence, and the rich the means of enjoyment, and whether both classes are contented with their position, seeking, however, to ameliorate it by perpetual exertions, so that industry is never in want of capital, nor capital unemployed by industry. The observer who draws his inferences from these signs will undoubtedly be led to the conclusion that the American of the United States contributes a much smaller portion of his income to the state than the citizen of France, nor indeed can the result be otherwise. A portion of the French debt is the consequence of two successive invasions, and the Union has no similar calamity to fear. A nation placed upon the continent of Europe is obliged to maintain a large standing army. The isolated position of the Union enables it to have only 6,000 soldiers. The French have a fleet of 300 sail. The Americans have 52 vessels. How, then, can the inhabitants of the Union be called upon to contribute as largely as the inhabitants of France? No parallel can be drawn between the finances of two countries so differently situated. It is by examining what actually takes place in the Union, and not by comparing the Union with France, that we may discover whether the American government is really economical. On casting my eyes over the different republics which form the Confederation, I perceive that their governments lack perseverance in their undertakings, and that they exercise no steady control over the men whom they employ. Whence I naturally infer that they must often spend the money of the people to no purpose, or to consume more of it than is really necessary to their undertakings. Great efforts are made, in accordance with the democratic origin of society, to satisfy the exigencies of the lower orders, to open the career of power to their endeavors, and to diffuse knowledge and comfort amongst them. The poor are maintained, immense sums are annually devoted to public instruction, all services whatsoever are remunerated, and the most subordinate agents are liberally paid. If this kind of government appears to me to be useful and rational, I am nevertheless constrained to admit that it is expensive. Wherever the poor direct public affairs and dispose of the national resources, it appears certain that, as they profit by the expenditure of the state, they are apt to augment that expenditure. I conclude, therefore, without having resource to inaccurate computations, and without hazarding a comparison which might prove incorrect, that the democratic government of the Americans is not a cheap government, as is sometimes asserted, and I have no hesitation in predicting that, if the people of the United States is ever involved in serious difficulties, its taxation will speedily be increased to the rate of that which prevails in the greater part of the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Chapter 13, Part 3. Government of the Democracy in America. Corruptions and Vices of the Rulers in a Democracy, and Consequent Effects upon Public Morality. In aristocracies, rulers sometimes endeavor to corrupt the people. In democracies, rulers frequently show themselves to be corrupt. In the former, their vices are directly prejudicial to the morality of the people. In the latter, their indirect influence is still more pernicious. A distinction must be made, when the aristocratic and democratic principles mutually inveigh against each other, as tending to facilitate corruption. In aristocratic governments, the individuals who are placed at the head of affairs are rich men who are solely desirous of power. In democracies, statesmen are poor, and they have their fortunes to make. The consequence is that in aristocratic states, the rulers are rarely accessible to corruption, and have very little craving for money, whilst the reverse is the case in democratic nations. 
but in aristocracies, as those who are desirous of arriving at the head of affairs are possessed of considerable wealth, and as the number of persons by whose assistance they may rise is comparatively small, the government is, if I may use the expression, put up to a sort of auction. In democracies, on the contrary, those who are covetous of power are very seldom wealthy, and the number of citizens who can confer that power is extremely great. Perhaps in democracies the number of men who might be bought is by no means smaller, but buyers are rarely to be met with, and besides it would be necessary to buy so many persons at once that the attempt has rendered nugatory. Many of the men who have been in the administration in France during the last forty years have been accused of making their fortunes at the expense of the state or of its allies, a reproach which was rarely addressed to the public characters of the ancient monarchy. But in France the practice of bribing electors is almost unknown, whilst it is notoriously and publicly carried out in England. In the United States I have never heard a man accused of spending his wealth and corrupting the populace, but I have often heard the probity of public officers questioned, still more frequently have I heard their success attributed to low intrigues and immoral practices. If, then, the men who conduct the government of an aristocracy sometimes endeavor to corrupt the people, the heads of a democracy are themselves corrupt. In the former case, the morality of the people is directly assailed. In the latter, an indirect influence is exercised upon the people, which is still more to be dreaded. As the rulers of democratic nations are almost always exposed to the suspicion of dishonorable conduct, they in some measure lend the authority of the government to the base practices of which they are accused. They thus afford an example which must prove discouraging to the struggles of virtuous independence, and must foster the secret calculations of a vicious ambition. If it be asserted that evil passions are displayed in all ranks of society, that they ascend the throne by hereditary right, and that despicable characters are to be met with at the head of aristocratic nations, as well as in the sphere of a democracy, this objection has but little weight in my estimation. The corruption of men who have casually risen to power has a coarse and vulgar infection in it, which renders it contagious to the multitude. On the contrary, there is a kind of aristocratic refinement and air of grandeur in the depravity of the great, which frequently prevent it from spreading abroad. The people can never penetrate into the perplexing labyrinth of court intrigue, and it will always have difficulty in detecting the turpitude which lurks under elegant manners, refined tastes, and graceful language. But to pillage the public purse, and to vend the favors of the state, are arts which the meanest villain may comprehend, and hope to practice in his turn. In reality, it is far less prejudicial to witness the immorality of the great than to witness that immorality which leads to greatness. In a democracy, private citizens see a man of their own rank in life, who rises from that obscure position, and who becomes possessed of riches and of power in a few years. The spectacle excites their surprise and their envy, and they are led to inquire how the person who was yesterday their equal is today their ruler. To attribute his rise to his talents or his virtues is unpleasant, for it is tacitly to acknowledge that they are themselves less virtuous and less talented than he was. They are therefore led, and not unfrequently their conjecture is a correct one, to impute his success mainly to some one of his defects and an odious mixture is thus formed of the ideas of turpitude and power, unworthiness and success, utility and dishonor. Efforts of which democracy is capable The Union has only had one struggle hitherto for its existence, enthusiasm at the commencement of the war, indifference towards its close, Difficulty of establishing military conscription or impressment of seamen in America. Why a democratic people is less capable of sustained effort than another. I here warn the reader that I speak of a government which implicitly follows the real desires of a people, and not of a government which simply commands in its name. Nothing is so irresistible as a tyrannical power commanding in the name of the people, 
because whilst it exercises that moral influence which belongs to the decision of the majority, it acts at the same time with the promptitude and the tenacity of a single man. It is difficult to say what degree of exertion a democratic government may be capable of making a crisis in the history of the nation. But no great democratic republic has hitherto existed in the world. To style the oligarchy which ruled over France in 1793 by that name would be to offer an insult to the republican form of government. The United States affords the first example of the kind. The American Union has now subsisted for half a century, in the course of which time its existence has only once been attacked, namely during the War of Independence. At the commencement of that long war, various occurrences took place which betokened an extraordinary zeal for the service of the country. But as the contest was prolonged, symptoms of private egotism began to show themselves. No money was poured into the public treasury, few recruits could be raised to join the army, the people wished to acquire independence, but was very ill-disposed to undergo the privations by which alone it could be obtained. Tax laws, says Hamilton in The Federalist, number 12, have in vain been multiplied. New methods to enforce the collection have in vain been tried. The public expectation has been uniformly disappointed, and the treasuries of the states have remained empty. The popular system of administration, inherent in the nature of popular government, coinciding with the real scarcity of money and incident to a languid and multilated state of trade, has hitherto defeated every experiment for extensive collections, and has at length taught the different legislatures the folly of attempting them. The United States have not had any serious war to carry on ever since that period. In order, therefore, to appreciate the sacrifices which democratic nations may impose upon themselves, we must wait until the American people is obliged to put half its entire income at the disposal of the government, as was done by the English, or until it sends forth a twentieth part of its population to the field of battle, as was done by France. In America, the use of conscription is unknown, and men are induced to enlist by bounties, the notions and habits of the people of the United States are so opposed to compulsory enlistment that I do not imagine it can ever be sanctioned by the laws. What is termed the conscription in France is assuredly the heaviest tax upon the population of that country. Yet how could a great continental war be carried on without it? The Americans have not adopted the British impressment of seamen, and they have nothing which corresponds to the French system of maritime conscription. The navy, as well as the merchant service, is supplied by voluntary service. But it is not easy to conceive how a people can sustain a great maritime war without having recourse to one or the other of these two systems. Indeed, the Union, which has fought with some honor upon the seas, has never possessed a very numerous fleet, and the equipment of the small number of American vessels has always been excessively expensive. I have heard American statesmen confess that the Union will have great difficulty in maintaining its rank on the seas without adopting the system of impressment or of maritime conscription. But the difficulty is to induce the people, which exercises the supreme authority, to submit to impressment or any compulsory system. It is incontestable that in times of danger a free people displays far more energy than one which is not so. But I incline to believe that this is more especially the case in those free nations in which the democratic element preponderates. Democracy appears to me to be much better adapted for the peaceful conduct of society, or for an occasional effort of remarkable vigor, than for the hardy and prolonged endurance of the storms which beset the political existence of nations. The reason is very evident. It is enthusiasm which prompts men to expose themselves to dangers and privations, but they will not support them long without reflection. There is more calculation, even in the impulses of bravery, than is generally attributed to them, and although the first efforts are suggested by passion, perseverance is maintained by a distinct regard of the purpose in view. A portion of what we value is exposed in order to save the remainder. But it is this distinct perception of the future, founded upon a sound judgment and an enlightened experience, which is most frequently wanting in democracies. The populace is more apt to feel than to reason. 
and if its present sufferings are great, it is to be feared that the still greater sufferings attended upon defeat will be forgotten. Another cause tends to render the efforts of a democratic government less persevering than those of an aristocracy. Not only are the lower classes less awakened than the higher orders to the good or evil chances of the future, but they are liable to suffer far more acutely from present privations. The noble exposes his life indeed, but the chance of glory is equal to the chance of harm. If he sacrifices a large portion of his income to the state, he deprives himself for a time of the pleasures of affluence. But to the poor man death is embellished by no pomp or renown, and the imposts which are irksome to the rich are fatal to him. This relative impotence of democratic republics is perhaps the greatest obstacle to the foundation of a republic of this kind in Europe. In order that such a state should subsist in one country of the old world, it would be necessary that similar institutions should be introduced into all the other nations. I am of the opinion that a democratic government tends in the end to increase the real strength of society, but it can never combine upon a single point and at a given time so much power as an aristocracy or a monarchy. If a democratic country remained during a whole century subject to a republican government, it would probably at the end of that period be more populous and more prosperous than the neighboring despotic states. But it would have incurred the risk of being conquered much oftener than they would in that lapse of years. Self-control of the American democracy The American people acquiesces slowly, or frequently does not acquiesce, in what is beneficial to its interests. The faults of the American democracy are for the most part reparable. The difficulty which a democracy has in conquering the passions and in subduing the exigencies of the moment with a view to the future is conspicuous in the most trivial occurrences of the United States. The people which is surrounded by flatterers has great difficulty in surmounting its inclinations, and whenever it is solicited to undergo a privation or any kind of inconvenience, even to attain an end which is sanctioned by its own rational conviction, it almost always refuses to comply at first. The deference of the Americans to the laws has been very justly applauded, but it must be added that in America the legislation is made by the people and for the people. Consequently, in the United States, the law favors those classes which are most interested in evading it elsewhere. It may, therefore, be supposed that an offensive law, which should not be acknowledged to be one of immediate utility, would either not be enacted or would not be obeyed. In America, there is no law against fraudulent bankruptcies, not because they are few, but because there are a great number of bankruptcies. The dread of being prosecuted as a bankrupt acts with more intensity upon the mind of the majority of the people than the fear of being involved in losses or ruin by the failure of other parties, and a sort of guilty tolerance is extended by the public conscience to an offense which everyone condemns in his individual capacity. In the new states of the Southwest, the citizens generally take justice into their own hands, and murders are of very frequent occurrence. This arises from the rude manners and the ignorance of the inhabitants of those deserts, who do not perceive the utility of investing the law with adequate force, and who prefer duels to prosecutions. Someone observed to me one day, in Philadelphia, that almost all crimes in America are caused by the abuse of intoxicating liquors, which the lower classes can procure in great abundance from their excessive cheapness. How comes it, said I, our legislators, rejoined my informant, have frequently thought of this expedient, but the task of putting it in operation is a difficult one. A revolt might be apprehended, and the members who should vote for a law of this kind would be sure of losing their seats. Whence I am to infer, replied I, that the drinking population constitutes the majority in your country, and that temperance is somewhat unpopular. When these things are pointed out to the American statesmen, they content themselves with assuring you that time will operate the necessary change, and that the experience of evil will teach the people its true interests. This is frequently true, although a democracy is more liable to error than a monarch or a body of nobles. The chances of its regaining the right path when once it has acknowledged its mistake are greater also, because it is rarely embarrassed by internal interests 
which conflict with those of the majority, and resist the authority of reason. But a democracy can only obtain truth as the result of experience, and many nations may forfeit their existence whilst they are awaiting the consequences of their errors. The great privilege of the Americans does not simply consist in their being more enlightened than other nations, but in their being able to repair the faults they may commit. To which it must be added, that a democracy cannot derive substantial benefit from past experience, unless it be arrived at a certain pitch of knowledge and civilization. There are tribes and peoples whose education has been so vicious, and whose character presents so strange a mixture of passion, of ignorance, and of erroneous notions upon all subjects, that they are unable to discern the causes of their own wretchedness, and they fall a sacrifice to ills with which they are unacquainted. I have crossed vast tracts of country that were formerly inhabited by powerful Indian nations which are now extinct. I have myself passed some time in the midst of mutilated tribes, which witnessed the daily decline of their numerical strength, and the glory of their independence, and I have heard these Indians themselves anticipate the impending doom of their race. Every European can perceive means which would rescue these unfortunate beings from inevitable destruction. They alone are insensible to the expedient. They feel the woe which year after year heaps upon their heads, but they will perish to a man without accepting the remedy. It would be necessary to employ force to induce them to submit to the protection and the constraint of civilization. The incessant revolutions which have convulsed the South American provinces for the last quarter of a century have frequently been adverted to with astonishment, and expectations have been expressed that those nations would speedily return to their natural state. But can it be affirmed that the turmoil of revolution is not actually the most natural state of the South American Spaniards at the present time. In that country, society is plunged into difficulties from which all its efforts are insufficient to rescue it. The inhabitants of that fair portion of the Western Hemisphere seem obstinately bent on pursuing the work of inward havoc. If they fall into a momentary repose from the effects of exhaustion, that repose prepares them for a fresh state of frenzy. When I consider their condition, which alternates between misery and crime, I should be inclined to believe that despotism itself would be a benefit to them, if it were possible that the words despotism and benefit could ever be united in my mind. Conduct of Foreign Affairs by the American Democracy Direction given to the foreign policy of the United States by Washington and Jefferson Almost all the defects inherent in democratic institutions are brought to light in the conduct of foreign affairs. Their advantages are less perceptible. We have seen that the Federal Constitution entrusts the permanent direction of the external interests of the nation to the President and the Senate, which tends in some degree to detach the general foreign policy of the Union from the control of the people. It cannot, therefore, be asserted with truth that the external affairs of state are conducted by the democracy. The policy of America owes its rise to Washington, and after him to Jefferson, who established those principles which it observes at the present day. Washington said in the admirable letter which he addressed to his fellow citizens, and which may be looked upon as his political bequest to the country, quote, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is, in extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none or a very remote relation. Hence she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves, by artificial ties, in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or in the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. Our detached and distant situation invites and enables us to pursue a different course. If we remain one people, under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy material injury from external annoyance, when we may take such an attitude as will cause the neutrality we may at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected, 
when belligerent nations, under the impossibility of making acquisitions upon us, will not lightly hazard the giving us provocation, when we may choose peace or war, as our interests, guided by justice, shall counsel. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. So far, I mean, as we are now at liberty to do it. For let me not be understood as capable of patronizing infidelity to existing engagements. I hold the maxim no less applicable to public than to private affairs, that honesty is always the best policy. I repeat it. Therefore, let those engagements be observed in their genuine sense. But in my opinion, it is unnecessary, and would be unwise to extend them. Taking care always to keep ourselves by suitable establishments, in a respectable defensive posture, we may safely trust to temporary alliances for extraordinary emergencies. Unquote. In a previous part of the same letter, Washington makes the following admirable and just remark, quote, The nation which indulges towards another, an habitual hatred or an habitual fondness, is in some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. Unquote. The political conduct of Washington was always guided by these maxims. He succeeded in maintaining his country in a state of peace, whilst all the other nations of the globe were at war. And he laid it down as a fundamental doctrine, that the true interest of the Americans consisted in a perfect neutrality with regard to the internal dissensions of the European powers. Jefferson went still further, and he introduced a maxim into the policy of the Union, which affirms that, quote, the Americans ought never to solicit any privileges from foreign nations in order not to be obliged to grant similar privileges themselves. Unquote. These two principles, which were so plain and so just as to be adapted to the capacity of the populace, have greatly simplified the foreign policy of the United States. As the Union takes no part in the affairs of Europe, it has, properly speaking, no foreign interest to discuss since it has at present no powerful neighbors on the American continent. The country is as much removed from the passions of the old world by its position as by the line of policy which it has chosen, and it is neither called upon to repudiate nor to espouse the conflicting interests of Europe, whilst the dissensions of the new world are still concealed within the bosom of the future. The Union is free from all pre-existing obligations, and it is consequently enabled to profit by the experience of the old nations of Europe, without being obliged, as they are, to make the best of the past, and to adapt it to their present circumstances, or to accept that immense inheritance which they derive from their forefathers, an inheritance of glory mingled with calamities, and of alliances conflicting with national antipathies. The foreign policy of the United States is reduced by its very nature to await the chances of the future history of the nation, and for the present it consists more in abstaining from interference than in exerting its activity. It is therefore very difficult to ascertain, at present, what degree of sagacity the American democracy will display in the conduct of the foreign policy of the country, and upon this point its adversaries, as well as its advocates, must suspend their judgment. As for myself, I have no hesitation in avowing my conviction that it is most especially in the conduct of foreign relations that democratic governments appear to me to be decidedly inferior to governments carried on upon different principles. Experience, instruction, and habit may almost always succeed in creating a species of practical discretion in democracies, and that science of the daily occurrences of life which is called good sense. Good sense may suffice to direct the ordinary course of society, and amongst the people whose education has been provided for, the advantages of democratic liberty in the internal affairs of the country may more than compensate for the evils inherent in a democratic government. But such is not always the case in the mutual relations of foreign nations. 
Foreign politics demand scarcely any of those qualities which a democracy possesses, and they require, on the contrary, the perfect use of almost all those faculties in which it is deficient. Democracy is favorable to the increase of the internal resources of the state, it tends to diffuse a moderate independence, it promotes the growth of public spirit, and fortifies the respect which is entertained for law in all classes of society, and these are advantages which only exercise an indirect influence over the relations which one people bears to another. But a democracy is unable to regulate the details of an important undertaking, to persevere in a design, and to work out its execution in the presence of serious obstacles. It cannot combine its measures with secrecy, and it will not await their consequences with patience. These are qualities which more especially belong to an individual or to an aristocracy, and they are precisely the means by which an individual people attains to a predominant position. If, on the contrary, we observe the natural defects of aristocracy, we shall find that their influence is comparatively innoxious in the direction of the external affairs of a state. The capital fault of which aristocratic bodies may be accused is that they are more apt to contrive their own advantage than that of the mass of the people. In foreign politics, it is rare for the interests of the aristocracy to be in any way distinct from that of the people. The propensity which democracies have to obey the impulse of passion rather than the suggestions of prudence, and to abandon a mature design for the gratification of a momentary caprice, was very clearly seen in America on the breaking out of the French Revolution. It was then as evident to the simplest capacity, as it is at the present time, that the interest of the Americans forbade them to take any part in the contest which was about to deluge Europe of blood but which could by no means injure the welfare of their own country. Nevertheless, the sympathies of the people declared themselves with so much violence in behalf of France that nothing but the inflexible character of Washington and the immense popularity which he enjoyed could have prevented the Americans from declaring war against England. And even then, the exertions which the austere reason of that great man made to repress the generous but imprudent passions of his fellow citizens very nearly deprived him of the sole recompense which he had ever claimed, that of his country's love. The majority then reprobated the line of policy which he adopted, and which has since been unanimously approved by the nation. If the Constitution, in the favor of the public, had not entrusted the direction of the foreign affairs of the country to Washington, it is certain that the American nation would at that time have taken the very measures which it now condemns. Almost all the nations which have ever exercised a powerful influence upon the destinies of the world, by conceiving, following up, and executing vast designs, from the Romans to the English, have been governed by aristocratic institutions. Nor will this be a subject of wonder, when we recollect that nothing in the world has so absolute a fixity of purpose as an aristocracy. The mass of the people may be led astray by ignorance or passion, the mind of a king may be biased, and his perseverance in the designs may be shaken, besides which a king is not immortal, but an aristocratic body is too numerous to be led astray by the blandishments of intrigue, and yet not numerous enough to yield readily to the intoxicating influence of unreflecting passion. It has the energy of a firm and enlightened individual, added to the power which it derives from perpetuity. End of chapter 13, part 3「This is a Democracy in America, Volume 1, by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Chapter 14. Advantages American Society Derives from Democracy. Part 1. What the real advantages are which American society derives from the government of the democracy. Before I enter upon the subject of the present chapter, 
I am induced to remind the reader of what I have more than once adverted to in the course of this book. The political institutions of the United States appear to me to be one of the forms of government which a democracy may adopt, but I do not regard the American Constitution as the best, or as the only one, which a democratic people may establish. In showing the advantages which the Americans derive from the government of democracy, I am therefore very far from meaning, or from believing, that similar advantages can only be obtained from the same laws. General tendency of the laws under the rule of the American democracy, and habits of those who apply them. Defects of a democratic government easy to be discovered. Its advantages only to be discerned by long observation. Democracy in America often inexpert, but the general tendency of the laws advantageous. In the American democracy, public officers have no permanent interests distinct from those of the majority. Result of this state of things. The defects and the weaknesses of a democratic government may very readily be discovered. They are demonstrated by the most flagrant instances, whilst its beneficial influence is less perceptibly exercised. A single glance suffices to detect its evil consequences, but its good qualities can only be discerned by long observation. The laws of the American democracy are frequently defective or incomplete. They sometimes attack vested rights, or give a sanction to others which are dangerous to the community. But even if they were good, the frequent changes which they undergo would be an evil. How comes it, then, that the American republics prosper and maintain their position? In the consideration of laws, a distinction must be carefully observed between the end at which they aim and the means by which they are directed to that end, between their absolute and their relative excellence. If it be the intention of the legislator to favor the interests of the minority at the expense of the majority, and if the measures he takes are so combined as to accomplish the object he has in view with the least possible expense of time and exertion, the law may be well drawn up, although its purpose be bad, and the more efficacious it is, the greater is the mischief which it causes. Democratic laws generally tend to promote the welfare of the greatest possible number, for they emanate from the majority of the citizens, who are subject to error, but who cannot have an interest opposed to their own advantage. The laws of an aristocracy tend, on the contrary, to concentrate wealth and power in the hands of the minority, because an aristocracy, by its very nature, constitutes a minority. It may therefore be asserted, as a general proposition, that the purpose of a democracy in the conduct of its legislation is useful to a greater number of citizens than that of an aristocracy. This is, however, the sum total of its advantages. Aristocracies are infinitely more expert in the science of legislation than democracies ever can be. They are possessed of a self-control which protects them from the error of temporary excitement and they form lasting designs which they mature with the assistance of favorable opportunities. Aristocratic government proceeds with the dexterity of art. It understands how to make the collective force of all its laws converge at the same time to a given point. Such is not the case with democracies, whose laws are almost always ineffective or inopportune. The means of democracy are therefore more imperfect than those of aristocracy and the measures which it unwillingly adopts are frequently opposed to its own cause, but the object it has in view is more useful. Let us now imagine a community so organized by nature, or by its constitution, that it can support the transitory action of bad laws, and that it can await, without destruction, the general tendency of the legislation. We shall then be able to conceive that a democratic government, notwithstanding its defects, will be most fitted to conduce to the prosperity of this community. This is precisely what has occurred in the United States, and I repeat what I have before remarked, that the great advantage of the Americans consists in their being able to commit faults which they may afterward repair. An analogous observation may be made respecting public officers. It is easy to perceive that the American democracy frequently errs in the choice of the individuals to whom it entrusts the power of the administration, 
but it is more difficult to say why the state prospers under their rule. In the first place, it is to be remarked that if in a democratic state the governors have less honesty and less capacity than elsewhere, the governed, on the other hand, are more enlightened and more attentive to their interests. As the people in democracies is more incessantly vigilant in its affairs and more jealous of its rights, it prevents its representatives from abandoning that general line of conduct which its own interest prescribes. In the second place, it must be remembered that if the democratic magistrate is more apt to misuse his power, he possesses it for a shorter period of time. But there is yet another reason which is still more general and conclusive. It is no doubt of importance to the welfare of nations that they should be governed by men of talents and virtue, but it is perhaps still more important that the interests of those men should not differ from the interests of the community at large, for if such were the case, virtues of a high order might become useless, and talents might be turned to a bad account. I say that it is important that the interests of the persons in authority should not conflict with or oppose the interests of the community at large, but I do not insist upon their having the same interests as the whole population, because I am not aware that such a state of things ever existed in any country. No political form has hitherto been discovered which is equally favorable to the prosperity and the development of all the classes into which society is divided. These classes continue to form, as it were, a certain number of distinct nations in the same nation, and experience has shown that it is no less dangerous to place the fate of these classes exclusively in the hands of any one of them than it is to make one people the arbiter of the destiny of another. When the rich alone govern, the interest of the poor is always endangered, and when the poor make the laws, that of the rich incurs very serious risks. The advantage of democracy does not consist, therefore, as has sometimes been asserted, in favoring the prosperity of all, but simply in contributing to the well-being of the greatest possible number. The men who are entrusted with the direction of public affairs in the United States are frequently inferior, both in point of capacity and of morality, to those whom aristocratic institutions would raise to power but their interest is identified and confounded with that of the majority of their fellow citizens. They may frequently be faithless and frequently mistaken, but they will never systematically adopt a line of conduct opposed to the will of the majority, and it is impossible that they should give a dangerous or an exclusive tendency to the government. The maladministration of a democratic magistrate is a mere isolated fact, which only occurs during the short period for which he is elected. Corruption and incapacity do not act as common interests which may connect men permanently with one another. A corrupt or an incapable magistrate will not concert his measures with another magistrate simply because that individual is as corrupt and as incapable as himself, and these two men will never unite their endeavors to promote the corruption and inaptitude of their remote posterity. The ambition and the maneuvers of the one will serve, on the contrary, to unmask the other. The vices of a magistrate, in democratic states, are usually peculiar to his own person. But under aristocratic government, public men are swayed by the interest of their order, which, if it is sometimes confounded with the interests of the majority, is very frequently distinct from them. This interest is the common and lasting bond which unites them together, it induces them to coalesce, and to combine their efforts in order to attain an end which does not always ensure the greatest happiness of the greatest number, and it serves not only to connect the persons in authority, but to unite them to a considerable portion of the community, since a numerous body of citizens belongs to the aristocracy, without being invested with official functions. The aristocratic magistrate is therefore constantly supported by a portion of the community, as well as by the government of which he is a member. The common purpose which connects the interest of the magistrates in aristocracies with that of a portion of their contemporaries identifies it with that of future generations. Their influence belongs to the future as much as to the present. The aristocratic magistrate is urged at the same time toward the same point by the passions of the community, by his own, and I may almost add by those of his posterity. 
Is it, then, wonderful that he does not resist such repeated impulses? And indeed, aristocracies are often carried away by the spirit of their order without being corrupted by it, and they unconsciously fashion society to their own ends and prepare it for their own descendants. The English aristocracy is perhaps the most liberal which ever existed, and no body of men has ever uninterruptedly furnished so many honorable and enlightened individuals to the government of a country. It cannot, however, escape observation that in the legislation of England the good of the poor has been sacrificed to the advantage of the rich, and the rights of the majority to the privileges of the few. The consequence is that England, at the present day, combines the extremes of fortune in the bosom of her society, and her perils and calamities are almost equal to her power and her renown. In the United States, where the public officers have no interest to promote connected with their caste, the general and constant influence of the government is beneficial, although the individuals who conduct it are frequently unskillful and sometimes contemptible. There is indeed a secret tendency in democratic institutions to render the exertions of the citizens subservient to the prosperity of the community, notwithstanding their private vices and mistakes, whilst in aristocratic institutions there is a secret propensity which, notwithstanding the talents and virtues of those who conduct the government, leads them to contribute to the evils which oppress their fellow creatures. In aristocratic governments, public men may frequently do injuries which they do not intend, and in democratic states they produce advantages which they never thought of. Public Spirit in the United States Patriotism of Instinct Patriotism of Reflection Their Different Characteristics Nations Ought to Strive to Acquire the Second When the First Has Disappeared Efforts of the Americans to It Interest of the Individual Intimately Connected with that of the country. There is one sort of patriotic attachment which principally arises from that instinctive, disinterested, and undefinable feeling which connects the affections of man with his birthplace. This natural fondness is united to a taste for ancient customs and to a reverence for ancestral traditions of the past. Those who cherish it love their country as they love the mansions of their fathers. They enjoy the tranquillity which it affords them. They cling to the peaceful habits which they have contracted within its bosom. They are attached to the reminiscences which it awakes, and they are even pleased by the state of obedience in which they are placed. This patriotism is sometimes stimulated by religious enthusiasm, and then it is capable of making the most prodigious efforts. It is in itself a kind of religion. It does not reason but it acts from the impulse of faith and of sentiment. By some nations, the monarch has been regarded as a personification of the country, and the fervor of patriotism being converted into the fervor of loyalty, they took a sympathetic pride in his conquests and gloried in his power. At one time, under the ancient monarchy, the French felt a sort of satisfaction in the sense of their dependence upon the arbitrary pleasure of their king, and they were wont to say with pride, we are the subjects of the most powerful king in the world. But, like all instinctive passions, this kind of patriotism is more apt to prompt transient exertion than to supply the motives of continuous endeavor. It may save the state in critical circumstances, but it will not unfrequently allow the nation to decline in the midst of peace. Whilst the manner of a people are simple and its faith unshaken, whilst society is steadily based upon traditional institutions whose legitimacy has never been contested, this instinctive patriotism is wont to endure. But there is another species of attachment to a country which is more rational than the one we have been describing. It is perhaps less generous and less ardent, but it is more fruitful and more lasting. It is coeval with the spread of knowledge, it is nurtured by the laws, it grows by the exercise of civil rights, and, in the end, it is confounded with the personal interest of the citizen. A man comprehends the influence which the prosperity of his country has upon his own welfare. He is aware that the laws authorize him to contribute his assistance to that prosperity, and he labors to promote it as a portion of his interest in the first place, 
and as a portion of his right in the second. But epochs sometimes occur in the course of the existence of a nation, at which the ancient customs of a people are changed, public morality destroyed, religious belief disturbed, and the spell of tradition broken, whilst the diffusion of knowledge is yet imperfect, and the civil rights of the community are ill-secured or confined within very narrow limits. The country then assumes a dim and dubious shape in the eyes of the citizens. They no longer behold it in the soil which they inhabit, for that soil is to them a dull, inanimate clod, nor in the usages of their forefathers, which they have been taught to look upon as a debasing yoke, nor in religion, for of that they doubt, nor in the laws, which do not originate in their own authority, nor in the legislator, whom they fear and despise. The country is lost to their senses. They can neither discover it under their own, nor under borrowed features, and they entrench themselves within the dull precincts of a narrow egotism. They are emancipated from prejudice without having acknowledged the empire of reason. They are neither animated by the instinctive patriotism of monarchical subjects, nor by the thinking patriotism of republican citizens, but they have stopped halfway between the two, in the midst of confusion and of distress. In this predicament, to retreat is impossible, for a people cannot restore the vivacity of its earlier times, any more than a man can return to the innocence and the bloom of childhood. Such things may be regretted, but they cannot be renewed. The only thing, then, which remains to be done is to proceed, and to accelerate the union of private with public interests, since the period of disinterested patriotism is gone by forever. I am certainly very far from averring that, in order to obtain this result, the exercise of political rights should be immediately granted to all the members of the community. But I maintain that the most powerful, and perhaps the only, means of interesting men in the welfare of their country, which we still possess, is to make them partakers in the government. At the present time, civic zeal seems to me to be inseparable from the exercise of political rights, and I hold that the number of citizens will be found to augment or to decrease in Europe in proportion as those rights are extended. In the United States, the inhabitants were thrown but as yesterday upon the soil which they now occupy, and they brought neither customs nor traditions with them there. They meet each other for the first time with no previous acquaintance, in short, the instinctive love of their country can scarcely exist in their minds, but everyone takes as zealous an interest in the affairs of his township, his county, and of the whole state, as if they were his own, because everyone, in his sphere, takes an active part in the government of society. The lower orders in the United States are alive to the perception of the influence exercised by the general prosperity upon their own welfare, and simple as this observation is, it is one which is but too rarely made by the people. But in America, the people regards this prosperity as the result of its own exertions. The citizen looks upon the fortune of the public as his private interest, and he cooperates in its success, not so much from a sense of pride or of duty, as from what I shall venture to term cupidity. It is unnecessary to study the institutions and the history of the Americans in order to discover the truth of this remark, for their manners render it sufficiently evident. As the American participates in all that is done in his country, he thinks himself obliged to defend whatever may be censured, for it is not only his country which is attacked upon these occasions, but it is himself. The consequence is that his national pride resorts to a thousand artifices and to all the petty tricks of individual vanity. Nothing is more embarrassing in the ordinary intercourse of life than this irritable patriotism of the Americans. A stranger may be very well inclined to praise many of the institutions of their country, but he begs permission to blame some of the peculiarities which he observes, a permission which is, however, inexorably refused. America is, therefore, a free country in which lest anybody should be hurt by your remarks, you are not allowed to speak freely of private individuals, or of the state, or of the citizens, or of the authorities, or of public or of private undertakings, or, in short, of anything at all, except it be of the climate and the soil, 
and even then Americans will be found ready to defend either the one or the other, as if they had been contrived by the inhabitants of the country. In our times, option must be made between the patriotism of all and the government of a few. For the force and activity which the first confers are irreconcilable with the guarantees of tranquillity which the second furnishes. Notion of Rights in the United States No great people without a notion of rights. How the notion of rights can be given to people. Respect of rights in the United States. Whence it arises. After the idea of virtue, I know no higher principle than that of right, or, to speak more accurately, these two ideas are commingled in one. The idea of right is simply that of virtue introduced into the political world. It is the idea of right which enabled men to define anarchy and tyranny, and which taught them to remain independent without arrogance, as well as to obey without servility. The man who submits to violence is debased by his compliance, but when he obeys the mandate of one who possesses that right of authority which he acknowledges in a fellow creature, he rises in some measure above the person who delivers the command. There are no great men without virtue, and there are no great nations, it may almost be added that there would be no society, without the notion of rights. For what is the condition of a mass of rational and intelligent beings who are only united together by the bond of force? I am persuaded that the only means which we possess at the present time of inculcating the notion of rights, and of rendering it, as it were, palpable to the senses, is to invest all the members of the community with the peaceful exercise of certain rights. This is very clearly seen in children, who are men without the strength and the experience of manhood. When a child begins to move in the midst of the objects which surround him, he is instinctively led to turn everything which he can lay his hands upon to his own purposes. He has no notion of the property of others, but as he gradually learns the value of things, and begins to perceive that he may in his turn be deprived of his possessions, he becomes more circumspect, and he observes those rights in others which he wishes to have respected in himself. The principle which the child derives from the possession of his toys is taught to the man by the objects which he may call his own. In America, those complaints against property in general, which are so frequent in Europe, are never heard, because in America there are no paupers, and as everyone has property of his own to defend, everyone recognizes the principle upon which he holds it. The same thing occurs in the political world. In America, the lowest classes have conceived a very high notion of political rights, because they exercise those rights, and they refrain from attacking those of other people in order to ensure their own from attack. Whilst in Europe, the same classes sometimes recalcitrate even against the supreme power, the American submits without a murmur to the authority of the pettiest magistrate. This truth is exemplified by the most trivial details of national peculiarities. In France, very few pleasures are exclusively reserved for the higher classes. The poor are admitted wherever the rich are received, and they consequently behave with propriety, and respect whatever contributes to the enjoyments in which they themselves participate. In England, where wealth has a monopoly of amusement as well as of power, complaints are made that whenever the poor happen to steal into the enclosures which are reserved for the pleasures of the rich, they commit acts of wanton mischief. Can this be wondered at, since care has been taken that they should have nothing to lose? The government of democracy brings the notion of political rights to the level of the humblest citizens, just as the dissemination of wealth brings the notion of property within the reach of all the members of the community, and I confess that, to my mind, this is one of its greatest advantages. I do not assert that it is easy to teach men to exercise political rights, but I maintain that, when it is possible, the effects which result from it are highly important, and I add that, if there ever was a time at which such an attempt ought to be made, that time is our own. It is clear that the influence of religious belief is shaken, and that the notion of divine rights is declining. It is evident that public morality is vitiated, and the notion of moral rights is also disappearing. These are general symptoms of the substitution of argument for faith, 
and of calculation for the impulses of sentiment. If, in the midst of this general disruption, you do not succeed in connecting the notion of rights with that of personal interest, which is the only immutable point in the human heart, what means will you have of governing the world except by fear? When I am told that, since the laws are weak and the populace is wild, since passions are excited and the authority of virtue is paralyzed, no measures must be taken to increase the rights of the democracy, I reply that it is for these very reasons that some measures of the kind must be taken, and I am persuaded that governments are still more interested in taking them than society at large, because governments are liable to be destroyed and society cannot perish. I am not, however, inclined to exaggerate the example which America furnishes. In those states, the people are invested with political rights at a time when they could scarcely be abused, for the citizens were few in number and simple in their manners. As they have increased, the Americans have not augmented the power of the democracy, but they have, if I may use the expression, extended its dominions. It cannot be doubted that the moment at which political rights are granted to a people that had before been without them is a very critical, though it be a necessary one. A child may kill before he is aware of the value of life, and he may deprive another person of his property before he is aware that his own may be taken away from him. The lower orders, when first they are invested with political rights, stand, in relation to those rights, in the same position as the child does to the whole of nature, and the celebrated adage may then be applied to them, homo pure robustus. This truth may even be perceived in America. The states in which the citizens have enjoyed their rights longest are those in which they make the best use of them. It cannot be repeated too often that nothing is more fertile in prodigies than the art of being free, but there is nothing more arduous than the apprenticeship of liberty. Such is not the case with despotic institutions. Despotism often promises to make amends for a thousand previous ills. It supports the right, it protects the oppressed, and it maintains public order. The nation is lulled by the temporary prosperity which accrues to it, until it is aroused to a sense of its own misery. Liberty, on the contrary, is generally established in the midst of agitation. It is perfected by... This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joshua Christensen Chapter 14 Advantages American Society Derives from Democracy Part 2 Respect for the Law in the United States Respect of the Americans for the Law Parental affection which they entertain for it. Personal interest of everyone to increase the authority of the law. It is not always feasible to consult the whole people, either directly or indirectly, in the formation of the law, but it cannot be denied that, when such a measure is possible, the authority of the law is very much augmented. This popular origin, which impairs the excellence and the wisdom of legislation, contributes prodigiously to increase its power. There is an amazing strength in the expression of the determination of a whole people, and when it declares itself, the imagination of those who are most inclined to contest it is overawed by its authority. The truth of this fact is very well known by parties, and they consequently strive to make out a majority whenever they can. If they have not the greater number of voters on their side, they assert that the true majority abstained from voting, and if they are foiled even there, they have recourse to the body of those persons who had no votes to give. In the United States, except slaves, servants, and paupers in the receipt of relief from the townships, there is no class of persons who do not exercise the elective franchise, and who do not indirectly contribute to make the laws. Those who design to attack the laws must consequently either modify the opinion of the nation or trample upon its decision. A second reason, which is still more weighty, may be further adduced. 
In the United States, everyone is personally interested in enforcing the obedience of the whole community to the law. For as the minority may shortly rally the majority to its principles, it is interested in professing that respect for the decrees of the legislator which it may soon have occasion to claim for its own. However irksome an enactment may be, the citizen of the United States complies with it, not only because it is the work of the majority, but because it originates in his own authority, and he regards it as a contract to which he is himself a party. In the United States, then, that numerous and turbulent multitude does not exist which always looks upon the law as its natural enemy, and accordingly surveys it with fear and with distrust. It is impossible, on the other hand, not to perceive that all classes display the utmost reliance upon the legislation of their country, and that they are attached to it by a kind of parental affection. I am wrong, however, in saying all classes, for as in America the European scale of authority is inverted, the wealthy are there placed in a position analogous to that of the poor in the old world, and it is the opulent classes which frequently look upon the law with suspicion. I have already observed that the advantage of democracy is not, as has sometimes been asserted, that it protects the interests of the whole community, but simply that it protects those of the majority. In the United States, where the poor rule, the rich have always some reason to dread the abuses of their power. This natural anxiety of the rich may produce a sullen dissatisfaction, but society is not disturbed by it, for the same reason which induces the rich to withhold their confidence in the legislative authority makes them obey its mandates. Their wealth, which prevents them from making the law, prevents them from withstanding it. Amongst civilized nations, revolts are rarely excited, except by such persons as have nothing to lose by them, and if the laws of a democracy are not always worthy of respect, at least they always obtain it for those who usually infringe the laws have no excuse for not complying with the enactments they have themselves made, and by which they are themselves benefited, whilst the citizens whose interests might be promoted by the infraction of them are induced, by their character and their stations, to submit to the decisions of the legislature, whatever they may be. Besides which, the people in America obeys not the law only because it emanates from the popular authority, but because that authority may modify it, in any points which may prove vexatory. A law is observed because it is a self-imposed evil in the first place, and an evil of transient duration in the second. Activity which pervades all the branches of the body politic in the United States. Influence which it exercises upon society. More difficult to conceive the political activity which pervades the United States than the freedom and equality which reign there. The great activity which perpetually agitates the legislative bodies is only an episode to the general activity. Difficult for an American to confine himself to his own business. Political agitation extends to all social intercourse. Commercial activity of the Americans partly attributable to this cause. Indirect advantages which society derives from a democratic government. On passing from a country in which free institutions are established to one where they do not exist, the traveler is struck by the change. In the former, all is bustle and activity. In the latter, everything is calm and motionless. In the one, amelioration and progress are the general topics of inquiry. In the other, it seems as if the community only aspired to repose in the enjoyment of the advantages which it has acquired. Nevertheless, the country which exerts itself so strenuously to promote its welfare is generally more wealthy and more prosperous than that which appears to be so contented with its lot. And when we compare them together, we can scarcely conceive how so many new wants are daily felt in the former, whilst so few seem to occur in the latter. If this remark is applicable to those free countries in which monarchical and aristocratic institutions subsist, it is still more striking with regard to the democratic republics. In these states, it is not only a portion of the people which is busied with the amelioration of its social condition, but the whole community is engaged in the task, and it is not the exigencies and the convenience of a single class for which a provision is to be made, but the exigencies and the convenience of all ranks of life. 
it is not impossible to conceive the surpassing liberty which the Americans enjoy. Some idea may likewise be formed of the extreme equality which subsists among them. But the political activity which pervades the United States must be seen in order to be understood. No sooner do you set foot upon the American soil than you are stunned by a kind of tumult. A confused clamor is heard on every side, and a thousand simultaneous voices demand the immediate satisfaction of their social wants. Everything is in motion around you. Here, the people of one quarter of a town are met to decide upon the building of a church. There, the election of a representative is going on. A little further, the delegates of a district are posting to the town in order to consult upon some local improvements. Or, in another place, the laborers of a village quit their plows to deliberate upon the project of a road or a public school. Meetings are called for the sole purpose of declaring their disapprobation of the line of conduct pursued by the government. Whilst in other assemblies, the citizens salute the authorities of the day as the fathers of their country. Societies are formed which regard drunkenness as the principal cause of the evils under which the state labors, and which solemnly bind themselves to give a constant example of temperance. The great political agitation of the American legislative bodies, which is the only kind of excitement that attracts the attention of foreign countries, is a mere episode or a sort of continuation of that universal movement which originates in the lowest classes of the people and extends successively to all the ranks of society. It is impossible to spend more efforts in the pursuit of enjoyment. The cares of political life engross a most prominent place in the occupation of a citizen in the United States, and almost the only pleasure of which an American has any idea is to take a part in the government, and to discuss the part he has taken. This feeling pervades the most trifling habits of life, even the women frequently attend public meetings and listen to political harangues as a recreation after their household labors. Debating clubs are, to a certain extent, a substitute for theatrical entertainments. An American cannot converse, but he can discuss, and when he attempts to talk he falls into a dissertation. He speaks to you as if he was addressing a meeting, and if he should chance to warm in the course of the discussion, he will infallibly say, Gentlemen! to the person with whom he is conversing. In some countries, the inhabitants display a certain repugnance to avail themselves of the political privileges with which the law invests them. It would seem that they set too high a value upon their time to spend it on the interests of the community, and they prefer to withdraw within the exact limits of a wholesome egotism marked out by four sunk fences and a quick-set hedge. But if an American were condemned to confine his activity to his own affairs, he would be robbed of one half of his existence, he would feel an immense void in the life which he is accustomed to lead, and his wretchedness would be unbearable. I am persuaded that, if ever a despotic government is established in America, it will find it more difficult to surmount the habits which free institutions have engendered than to conquer the attachment of the citizens to freedom. This ceaseless agitation, which democratic government has introduced into the political world, influences all social intercourse. I am not sure that upon the whole this is not the greatest advantage of democracy, and I am much less inclined to applaud it for what it does than for what it causes to be done. It is incontestable that the people frequently conducts public business very ill, but it is impossible that the lower order should take a part in public business without extending the circle of their ideas, and without quitting the ordinary routine of their mental acquirements. The humblest individual who is called upon to cooperate in the government of society acquires a certain degree of self-respect, and as he possesses authority, he can command the services of minds much more enlightened than his own. He is canvassed by a multitude of applicants, who seek to deceive him in a thousand different ways, but who instruct him by their deceit. He takes a part in political undertakings which did not originate in his own conception, but which give him a taste for undertakings of the kind. New ameliorations are daily pointed out in the property which he holds in common with others, and this gives him the desire of improving that property which is more peculiarly his own. He is, perhaps, neither happier nor better than those who came before him, but he is better informed and more active. I have no doubt 
that the democratic institutions of the United States, joined to the physical constitution of the country, are the cause, not the direct, as is so often asserted, but the indirect cause, of the prodigious commercial activity of the inhabitants. It is not engendered by the laws, but the people learn how to promote it by the experience derived from legislation. When the opponents of democracy assert that a single individual performs the duties which he undertakes much better than the government of the community, it appears to me that they are perfectly right. The government of an individual, supposing an equality of instruction on either side, is more consistent, more persevering, and more accurate than that of a multitude, and it is much better qualified judiciously to discriminate the characters of the men it employs. If any deny what I advance, they have certainly never seen a democratic government, or have formed their opinion upon very partial evidence. It is true that even when local circumstances and the disposition of the people allow democratic institutions to subsist, they never display a regular and methodical system of government. Democratic liberty is far from accomplishing all the projects it undertakes with the skill of a droit despotism. It frequently abandons them before they have borne their fruits, or risks them when the consequences may prove dangerous. But in the end, it produces more than any absolute government, and if it do fewer things well, it does a great number of things. Under its sway, the transactions of the public administration are not nearly so important as what is done by private exertion. Democracy does not confer the most skillful kind of government upon the people, but it produces that which the most skillful governments are frequently unable to awaken, namely, an all-pervading and restless activity, a superabundant force, and an energy which is inseparable from it, and which may, under favorable circumstances, beget the most amazing benefits. These are the true advantages of democracy. In the present age, when the destinies of Christendom seem to be in suspense, some hasten to assail democracy as its foe whilst it is yet in its early growth, and others are ready with their vows of adoration for this new deity which is springing forth from chaos. But both parties are very imperfectly acquainted with the object of their hatred or of their desires. They strike in the dark and distribute their blows by mere chance. We must first understand what the purport of society and the aim of government is held to be. If it be your intention to confer a certain elevation upon the human mind, and to teach it to regard the things of this world with generous feelings, to inspire men with a scorn of mere temporal advantage, to give birth to living convictions, and to keep alive the spirit of honorable devotedness, if you hold it to be a good thing to refine the habits, to embellish the manners, to cultivate the arts of a nation, and to promote the love of poetry, of beauty, and of renown, if you would constitute a people not unfitted to act with power upon all other nations, nor unprepared for those high enterprises which, whatever be the result of its efforts, will leave a name forever famous in time, if you believe such to be the principal object of society, you must avoid the government of democracy, which would be a very uncertain guide to the end you have in view. But if you hold it to be expedient to divert the moral and intellectual activity of man to the production of comfort, and to the acquirement of the necessaries of life, if a clear understanding be more profitable to man than genius, if your object be not to stimulate the virtues of heroism, but to create habits of peace, if you had rather witness vices than crimes, and are content to meet with fewer noble deeds, provided offenses be diminished in the same proportion, if, instead of living in the midst of a brilliant state of society, you are contented to have prosperity around you, in short, you are of opinion that the principal object of a government is not to confer the greatest possible share of power and of glory upon the body of the nation, but to ensure the greatest degree of enjoyment and the least degree of misery to each of the individuals who compose it. If such be your desires, you can have no surer means of satisfying them than by equalizing the conditions of men and establishing democratic institutions. But if the time be past at which such a choice was possible, and if some superhuman power impel us towards one or the other of these two governments without consulting our wishes, let us at least endeavor to make the best of that which is allotted to us, and let us so inquire into its good and its evil propensities 